What's up, guys? It's yo boy Omnisensei back with a new Naruto What If series. Reborn in Naruto. Talented OC masters the wind. Becomes the legendary wind calamity. Part 2. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing to the channel. Like the video, share, and leave a comment. This really helps with the algorithm. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Also, I have set up a Patreon account, consider joining to support the channel, and for more exclusive content. This fanfic is a very, very long one guys for the next part leave a comment below. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Only a week was now left for fourth year's exams. Jenki followed the same procedure as last year and asked the students interested in participating in the graduation exam to meet him after class. Fujin thought, I guess it's time to finally become a ninja. There's not much that I can learn in the academy anymore. At best I could learn another element or a few more jinjutsu. If I don't attempt the exam this year, the teachers and maybe even Hiruzen could grow suspicious. And I definitely won't receive much help from them in the future. As for tanking the exam, I am not confident that I could fake my performance convincingly enough for someone who has decades of experience. Either way, I believe I am ready now. After the class, Fujin visited Jenki and confirmed his participation. Jenki smiled and wished him good luck. With just a week left for the exams, Fujin started to focus on the syllabus for written exams. The syllabus was actually quite surprising. He recalled back when Jenki started teaching this in the academy. He was teaching trigonometry. Fujin's first thoughts when he saw that was, Trigo. They're fucking nine-year-old kids. What's next? Differentiation and integration. As annoyed as he was by it, he was extremely surprised when Hana was able to solve them perfectly. He mentally screamed, how the fuck can nine-year-old kids learn Trigo so easily? He cited how much smarter the kids here were and continued with his studies. He also wanted to be perfectly prepared while going on missions. He stopped learning new seals and instead had his clones focus on making a few essential objects for him. He bought two ninja waist bags, two ninja leg pouches, and a couple of metallic wristbands. He then had his clones make storage seals on these items. The Fuinjutsu scroll in section D of the library expanded a bit on the storage seal. It explained ways to increase or decrease the size of the storage space, as well as manipulating its shape. It wasn't very difficult as it only increased or decreased the number of space symbols involved. So the seal itself was still very basic. However, this was very useful for Fujin. In the interior of the ninja waste bags, Fujin managed to draw seven storage seals. For ninja leg pouch, he was able to draw four seals. These had a lot less space as compared to the seals he made on scrolls, however, considering that their purpose was to enhance the capacity of the bags and pouches, it was very handy. For the leg pouch, two seals could store six kunai each, and other two seals could store 24 shurikens each. He then created various triggers to refill the pouch from weapons in the storage seals. This way, his weapon supply would be much larger. For the waste bag, the seals could store a lot more but he hadn't yet decided how to fill them all. He did have some ideas like a first aid kit, ninja ropes, scrolls, seals that stored elements, more weapons, explosion tags, soldier pills, ration bars and so on. For the wristbands, he made one small seal on each of them. When he wears the wristbands, these seals will be directly under his palms. The seals created a cuboidal storage seal which was around 15 cm by 15 cm by 100 cm. Both these seals were made to store swords. This way, he could quickly access his swords whenever he wanted to. Other than this seal, he planned on drawing three more seals on each wristband. For the seals on the opposite side to the current one, Fujin planned on buying huge sturdy shields and storing them there. If he ever gets in an awkward position where he can't defend himself with a rock shield, he'll depend on this shield to provide cover to himself. However, since he wasn't sure about the size of shield he'd buy, he didn't draw that seal. Other than these two, he planned on inscribing two more storage seals on the wristband, but for now he didn't have any idea what to store in there. So he left it for the future. On the day before the exam, Fujin, under a disguise, bought a lot of weapons. 
He bought 96 shurikens and 24 kunais to fill both the leg pouches. He also bought 12 explosion tags to attach them to 6 kunais in each of the pouches. In all it cost 65 care io. He bargained and got them for 55 care io under the false promise of buying again in the future. Next day, the final exam began. Since he intended to pass and wanted to be rank 1, he aced the written exam. He was sure that he'd score full. With the absence of Teru, Nobu and Yori, he also did the best in the shuriken throwing competition. In Tijutsu, he still ranked 2 behind Hoka. While in the Ninjutsu exam, he made sure to perform only as good as Hana. There wasn't any chakra control exercise in the exam. But Fujin wasn't very surprised as nearly everyone in his class had very good chakra control and could do both tree climbing and water walking, as Genki had held a lot of sessions on it this year. The exam also tested the students on the various basic skills that were taught in the previous year. Fujin again ensured that he'd be ranked near the top in this exam. After the results were out, Fujin ranked first, Hana ranked second and Hoka surprisingly ranked fifth. He had improved his written exam scores a lot to be able to get such a high rank. A week later, the graduation exam was conducted. Fujin noticed that there were students from three different batches. His own, his senior batch and the batch one year junior to him. 23 students from his class were participating. Unknown to Fujin, the exam was held by Nara Kisho. He looked at the list of students participating. There were 68 participants from the 5th year, 35 from the 4th year, and 8 from the 3rd year. He sighed thinking what a drag this exam would be and instructed to begin the exam. The first exam was a written test. Fujin looked at the paper expecting some more theory questions. However he was surprised when he read them. They weren't any theory questions, but instead scenarios were mentioned and the students had to write in what they would do. After reading all the scenarios, Fujin sighed, just basic ninja protocols, and confirming that the students are brainwashed. To think that I actually expected something good. He answered as any, ready to graduate, academy student would answer. The exam was an hour long. Once the hour was up, the papers were collected and sent to Nara Kisho. He had six academy teachers check the answers and decide whether the student is ready to graduate or not. It took half an hour to completely check them, and then they provided the results to Kisho. One of the teachers said, Sir, we've completed checking. Out of 111 students, 79 have provided satisfactory answers. Rest aren't ready yet. Kisho nodded and said, dismiss them. Those 32 students were asked to go back home and prepare well for the next year. Dujin was surprised by this, wow, they just asked the kids to leave. Won't that be demotivating? Or are they just trying to reduce the number of participants for the next exam? Fujin wasn't alone with those thoughts. One of the teachers, who taught a normal class, asked Kisho, Kisho Senpai, won't this demotivate the students? The ones who participated in the exam are among the brightest students in the academy. Kisho looked at the teacher. He was two years junior to Kisho in the academy, but he wasn't very talented and had barely become a Chunin during the war. Kisho shook his head and said, if they get demotivated by such a small failure, then there's no hope for them. They would be better off in the Genin Reserve Force, and we'll save the resources needed to raise someone more worthy to Chunin rank. The teacher wasn't very convinced with the answer, but didn't say anything as this wasn't the first time Kisho had supervised the graduation exam. After the written exams, the students were tested on various parameters like shurikens, stealth, camping, chakra control, etc. It was similar to the tests conducted for Fujin's class a week back. Since the tests for elite classes were already conducted, they weren't tested again, and their scores from a week back were carried forward. The academy teachers observed everyone's performance and failed another 15 students over these exams. On getting the reports, Kisho thought, wow. That's so convenient. Now the Tejutsu tournament will be so much simpler to conduct. Right before the Tejutsu tournament began, Hokage arrived to watch the exam. He was followed by a character that Fujin recognized very easily, Hada Kakashi. Fujin was very surprised to see him. He thought, why is Kakashi here? Hiruzen wouldn't force him to start training kids right now, would he? I really hope not. Canon timeline will be fucked up if Hiruzen assigns my squad to him. I am not sure how strong I'd be in another 6 to 7 years, so for now I really hope something doesn't change due to me. 
Next was a Tejutsu tournament between the 64 remaining students. Kisho arranged for a knockout tournament. So one student could fight for a maximum of six times. Fujin breezed through to the semifinals. In the semifinals, he had to fight with a Hayuga who was a year older than him. Fujin fought very hard against him, but was still at a lot of disadvantage. While he did get a few critical hits in with one strong punch on his right rib, another on his nose and a strong kick under his left rib, in the end, he still lost the fight. Fujin was initially a bit irritated at the loss, damn, how exactly do these guys train? I lost despite the amount of progress I made over the past couple of months. He then calmed himself and analyzed the fight better, on the other hand, it's probably reasonable. I'm guessing the elders from the Hyuga clan regularly spar with them. I, on the other hand, could only spar with my clone. Also, the Hyuga fighting style is entirely Tejutsu. I, on the other hand, was a lot more dependent on wind-propelling Jutsu, body flicker Jutsu and earth military movement Jutsu during my spars. Removing them does reduce my fighting ability considerably. Perhaps if ninjutsu and kinjutsu were allowed, I'd have won this fight. Not to mention, I didn't even use chakra to enhance my punches and kicks in the fight. He then watched the finals between Hoka and that guy. Due to the injuries he suffered against Fujin, he lost after struggling for a bit. However, having fought both of them, Fujin knew that even without those injuries, Hoka would have still won the match. Hoka ranked first, however Fujin wasn't worried much, my points in the normal exam were much higher than Hoka's. So this difference won't affect much, I should still rank first in my class. Fujin noticed that no one was eliminated in the Tejutsu tournament. For the next test, a few academy teachers brought the kids to a part of the training grounds. On reaching there, the students noticed a long white line drawn on the ground, and a bunch of obstacles placed ahead of it. Fujin thought, is this an obstacle race? However he soon shook his head denying that thought, no way, this is too simple. All the 64 students were made to stand behind the white line. Genki then appeared and announced, this will be the next phase of your exam. This is an obstacle race, and you have to run 500 meters straight to the white line that is drawn there. This announcement excited all the students. They thought, finally an easy exam. The ones who had taken the graduation exam previously thought, why wasn't this exam there the previous year? Fujin was confused by such an easy exam. However, he noticed that there was another man standing behind Jenki. And when Jenki finished his announcement, he looked at him and nodded. Fischl looked at the excited kids and chuckled, he thought, this should be fun. Sadly the kids don't know that the guy standing there is an experienced Jounin from the Kurama clan. He is Kurama Lumi. In the previous war, hundreds of enemies fell prey to him and his bag of tricks. Jenki then announced, on your mark, get set, go. However, while he was announcing, Kurama Lumi was making some hand signs. And when he heard go, he cast it as Jutsu, demonic illusion, heaven and earth reversal. As soon as he launched his Jutsu, all the 64 students were shaken. It was as if someone grabbed the ground and the sky and reversed them. The gravity felt upside down. Most of the students were incredibly frightened and tightly hugged the ground underneath them. There were only four exceptions. A young girl from the third year, who was from the Ichiha clan. She activated her Sharingan as soon as she felt the changes. Two students from the fifth year, who were from the Kurama clan and aware of this jutsu. And Fujin, who kept an eye on Illumi and saw him performing the hand signs. He also felt someone trying to influence his nervous system, which let him know that it was a Jinjutsu. He was planning to disrupt the Jinjutsu, however when he noticed that others were being affected too, he didn't disrupt it so as to not attract any attention. Even though Fujin noticed the Jinjutsu, he was extremely impressed at the guy's ability to cast a Jinjutsu on 64 students at the same time. Kurama Lumi smirked looking at the reactions of all the students. He had used rank B Jinjutsu on them. He had used this Jinjutsu many times to disrupt his enemies enough for his allies to kill them in the Third Great Ninja War. Fisho observed the students attentively. He thought, this test will test the willpower of the students. If they don't complete the race, then there's no way I'll pass them. While all the students were struggling, Fujin was trying to find his balance. He thought quickly about what this test is about. He quickly figured out that there were three possibilities which were, either they are testing our ability to break the Jinjutsu, or test our willpower or perhaps our capability to react in an unexpected situation. 
Either way, this is just a Jinjutsu. I should just look downwards and try to move along. If others break the Jinjutsu, I'll do so too. With those thoughts, he took his first step. Apart from him, only the two students from the Kurama clan were moving. Soon a few others took their first step. The girl from the Achiha clan resisted the Jinjutsu, and after 15 seconds, was able to break through it. She then ran the obstacle race with absolute ease. Fujin sensed someone moving along at a very rapid speed, and observed the girl. He was incredibly surprised, Sharingan. At this young age. He continued his race. After the first few steps, he tried jogging along the race. The other students too slowly managed to get a hang of the conditions, and increased their speed. Fujin ranked fourth in the test. In all, only 41 students passed. Of the remaining 23, a few fell unconscious, and many didn't dare to take even a single step. Fisho dismissed them and asked them to leave. Immediately after the test, the ninjutsu test was started. Kisho's thoughts were, the previous Jinjutsu would have shaken these kids. So they won't be at their full potential while performing the ninjutsu. Which is how it should be as they won't get normal conditions to perform ninjutsu in a real fight. Six academy teachers observed one student each. To improve the effect of the previous test, Kisho arranged the tests in such a manner that the ones who completed the previous test last, had to attempt the ninjutsu exam first. The requirement to pass the ninjutsu exam was pretty lax. Just the three basic ninjutsu and any one other ninjutsu. Though the kids in the start struggled a bit, they didn't have any issue in completing the minimum requirements. What surprised Fujin though, is that 16 students displayed fire release, one jutsu, and another seven displayed fire release, two jutsu. Fujin's thoughts were, land of fire indeed. Most probably all of them have fire affinity. Also seeing how everyone has practiced it, I guess most of Kanoha's jounins with fire affinity, can use the most advanced form of this jutsu. Considering that, I guess all the other villages should have their own counters for this jutsu. But since they are still asking the kids to focus on this jutsu, I suppose it still is very useful. Apart from it, the majority of the kids displayed the jutsus their clan specialized in. When Fujin's turn came. He performed the three basic ninjutsu. Then performed wind clone jutsu and created eight clones. He then showed his wind explosion jutsu and finally displayed great breakthrough jutsu. Of course he only displayed one-fourth of their power, used hand signs and performed them a bit slowly. While not too outstanding, he still outperformed his classmates. What surprised Fujin the most is the performance of the Achiha girl. She announced that she'll first perform fire release, three jutsu. Fujin became very interested when she announced it as he wasn't aware of what this stage of the jutsu could do. Right after she announced it, two academy teachers stepped forwards and held a metallic string between their hands. Fujin was a bit puzzled, isn't this the same thing they did for fire release, two jutsu? Just that instead of one teacher, two stepped up. After making the hand signs, she raised both her arms and pointed her index and middle finger out. Heat rays were released from both her fingers from both hands, and in a few seconds, they cut both the metallic strings. Fujin thought, that's it. It's the same as fire release, two jutsu. Just that in that, they could release the heat ray through only one hand. There's basically no increase in the power of the jutsu, just the quantity. Still very weak for a rank C jutsu. Strange. Does the jutsu suddenly get much stronger in the later stages? She continued her test by displaying fireball jutsu and fire dragon jutsu. Her performance was very good. In Fujin's opinion, in terms of ninjutsu, her performance was only second to a student from the Hada clan from the fifth year. After the exam was over, the teachers began tallying the score. Narakisho passed this work to his subordinates. His job was over when he decided to pass these 41 students. Kisho then reported to Hiruzen, Lord Hokage, all these 41 kids have passed my exam. Overall there is one from the third year, nine from the fourth year, and 31 from the fifth year they should make splendid shinobi. Combined with the 94 that passed from the senior most batch, this year's results have been very good for us. Hiruzen nodded and said some kind words to the Nara shinobi. After tallying the scores, they were displayed for all the students to see. Fujin was still ranked first in his class. He was followed by Hana and then Hoka, whose rank increased due to superior performance in the graduation exam. After that, all the 41 students were gathered before Hiruzen. 
Hirazin smiled and began giving another speech on the will of fire. Only this time, he was much more passionate, spoke with more fervor, and his speech was more intense than any of his earlier speeches. Even Fujin was a bit dumbfounded on how someone can brainwash little kids so openly, with such vigor, and be extremely proud about it. However as the speech ended, Fujin smirked internally thinking, will of fire, will of fire, will of fire. Let me now see how much will of fire you actually have. Ha 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 after the speech, Hirazin said, Haddock Ray, Suzuki Fujin, Ichihamiko stepped forward. All the three kids stepped forward and stood in front of Hirazin. He said, all three of you have worked very hard and performed splendidly. Speak, what reward would you like for your performance? As soon as he said that, Haddock Ray stepped forward. It was seen as rude by many, including Fujin and Miko. Well Fujin didn't mind it, Miko did pout. However, Ray's next words made everyone understand why he stepped so hurriedly. He said, Lord Hokage, my mother is very sick and the doctors we visited couldn't cure her. Could you please arrange a good medical ninja to treat her? While everyone now understood why he was so restless, it did pop another question in their mind. Fujin's thoughts were, isn't he from the Haddock clan? Sure Sakumo is long dead, but their condition shouldn't be that desperate, should it? Also, shouldn't they have enough money to arrange it anyways? Unless it requires someone like Tsunade to deal with it, then I can understand. But even then, I don't think Hiruzen can call Tsunade back anyways. Kakashi too was visibly confused. Only a few teachers and Hiruzen knew the truth. Hiruzen thought, sigh, the Haddock clan has really deteriorated after Sakumo's death. Sadly Kakashi hasn't paid much attention to the clan. This kid suddenly began performing really well this year, and hence I had looked into his background. His father died in the Third Ninja War, and his mother was only a civilian who wasn't even from the Haddock clan. Therefore she hasn't been paid any attention by the clan. She fell sick half year back, and became the motivation for this lad to work hard. Though I do want Kakashi to lead a squad of genins, this was my main purpose to bring him here today. For him to take reins of the Haddock clan and bring it back to prosperity. Hiruzen nodded and said, I'll arrange the best medics to treat your mother. He then smiled and said, keep training hard. Ensure that the will of fire in you burns brighter than ever. Haddock excitedly said yes, and promised to keep training hard. Kakashi observed the young kid and decided, I need to take a proper look at what's going on in the clan. Hiruzen secretly paid attention to Kakashi's reaction, and was very satisfied with it. He could see the Haddock clan making a comeback soon. After having Hokage's word to treat his mother, Rei stepped back. Miko then stepped forward and said, Lord Hokage, I don't want any reward. This surprised everyone. Even Hiruzen was surprised, but he hid it and calmly analyzed, is this a way the Ichiha are retaliating for their constant monitoring? He then tried to convince her a couple of times, but she declined to get any reward. Hiruzen sighed and looked over at Fujin and thought, the Ichiha matter makes me feel my age. Well at least he should have a reasonable request. This day should end properly. Fujin on the other hand was dumbfounded by both his fellow toppers. He thought, what the fuck? One begs for his mother's life, and the other refuses to accept any reward. Why do they want to make my life harder? He then calmed himself and muttered to himself, sigh whatever. It doesn't matter. The Tao of shamelessness must live on. He steeled himself and stepped forward. He put up a smile and an excited expression while thinking, this is it. For this moment I carried two swords in person for five whole months. He then said, Lord Hokage. For my reward, I want two swords made entirely of chakra metal. He then looked at the Hokage with excited and hopeful expression, while hoping that somehow his eyes sparkled like an anime. Majority of the students weren't aware of chakra metal. However almost every teacher knew it. And they were absolutely shocked by the request. Genki, who was standing close by, had his jaw dropped after hearing what Fujin said. If Fujin had seen him, he would be sure that he could fit an egg in Genki's mouth. Kakashi's eyebrows twitched at request. He thought, talk about extravagant. Even my father's blade wasn't entirely made of chakra metal. The one who was shocked the most however, was Hiruzen. Despite wearing the Hokage's hat and having excellent control over his emotions, Fujin could still see his shock. Of course he totally ignored it. He thought, whether Hiruzen is happy, or so shocked that he dies of a heart attack is none of my business. Hmm, wait if he dies right now, then it'd be very bad. But, 
Yeah, I don't think just this much shock would be enough to kill this old freak. He did live through three brutal wars without even taking a single major injury. Pirazin's mind went totally blank for a second. He then thought, made entirely of chakra metal. Even the ones they sell in Kanoha only have around 15% chakra metal. Rest is made of other common materials. The last time someone made a sword entirely of chakra metal was when Sensei commissioned to cast that sword. And it cost well over a hundred million Ryo to make that sword. Of course, this kid is probably not aware of that fact, and I could fool him, but that's still worth tens of millions of Ryo. He then looked at Jenki to see if he knew what's going on, however he was clearly shocked too. In fact, he didn't even notice the Hokage looking at him. Here is in thought, now what to do? I can't directly say no. That would be too demotivating. Also it won't look good for me to deny him. If I do, I'm 100% sure that Danzo will spread rumors saying that the Hokage lies to academy students. Hiruzen thought hard for another few seconds and came up with a reasonable excuse. Seeing that Hiruzen was ready to talk, Kakashi noticed and chuckled internally, it took Lord Hokage 13 seconds to answer. That kid sure is something. Hiruzen finally sighed and said, sadly I can't give you what you want because no one makes swords made entirely of chakra metal. Fujin wasn't aware of the fact that chakra blades weren't entirely made of chakra metal, and thought that Hiruzen is just making an excuse. He showed a dejected expression and said, a couple of tanto made of chakra metal then. Bakashi's eyebrows twitched again at Fujin's new request. He did struggle to keep his laughter in after seeing Hiruzen's expression. Genki, on the other hand, was even more shocked. Hiruzen replied again, sadly, even they aren't made entirely of chakra metal. Fujin was almost pissed at hearing that reply. But he calmed himself and thought about what Hiruzen had said. A few words stuck in his mind, aren't made entirely of chakra metal. It then clicked him, wait, in my previous world, didn't such production involve a lot of alloys, or other materials? Even gold jewelry wasn't 100% gold. Is that what he is referring to? He then asked, Lord Hokage, what do you mean by aren't made entirely of chakra metal? Do they only put a little bit of chakra metal and then something else in the sword? Hiruzen nodded nervously, not liking where the conversation was headed to. Fujin then excitedly began saying, Lord Hokage, then. However, he was cut by Hiruzen. He asked, Fujin, can you tell me why exactly do you want a sword made of chakra metal? While asking this question, he was desperately thinking, I need to change topic fast. Can't let him continue talking about this. Fujin, upset at being cut, said, I was told that they assist in chakra flow. I like using swords, and want to be better at it by using chakra flow. Hiruzen narrowed his eyes and asked, how do you know about chakra flow? Fujin did get a hint that Hiruzen was aiming to change the topic, however he wasn't much concerned. He could always innocently get back to the topic. Hiruzen might be a hundred times better at negotiating, however being a ten-year-old kid had a lot of advantages. He answered without any hesitation, Michi Sensei Hiruzen, then looked over begrudgingly at Michi who was at the sides. He thought, that's it, I'm assigning him a weak genin squad, and will make him do nothing apart from deer rank missions for half a year. We have pretty much recovered from our losses, so loss of one Chunin won't be felt. He then explained very kindly to Fujin, you don't need swords made of chakra metal to use chakra flow. You can use them on normal swords too, however they break if you do. Fujin thought, yeah, I know. Get to the point. Hiruzen continued, there are actually special swords that are made to aid chakra flow. In the land of iron, many samurai use those swords. As for chakra metal, it's a bit problematic and could get you in trouble. Fujin naturally knew that. Having swords worth tens of million Raya would put a target on his back. Which is why he was planning on leaving them with Hiruzen. He thought, that's a valid concern. Though I'm sure that it isn't the main reason for him to not give me chakra blades. But this new info does intrigue me. Why didn't any of the weapon shops have it? He left that question for later and asked, is it possible to make those swords to assist wind chakra flow? For the first time today, Fujin asked a question genuinely. However it still put Hiruzen on edge. He thought, yeah, it can. They would have to use wind nature chakra metal for it though. And it'll still take the cost to millions. Hiruzen replied, yes it is, but it's better for you to not get it yet. How about this, when you are ready, I'll help you get in touch with the right people to make a sword like that. 
Fujin dejectedly thought, I am sure I could get in touch with them myself pretty soon. However he still nodded. Hiruzen was finally happy that he saved millions of Ryo. He was going to talk, but Fujin spoke again, he asked Lord Hokage, you said the sword that you'll give me is used by samurai, right? Hiruzen nodded while really hoping that there were no more extravagant requests. Fujin continued, then could you have someone teach me samurai saber techniques? Please Hiruzen thought about it. For one, he was happy that the request didn't involve tens of millions of Ryo. Secondly, he had noticed Fujin's interest in swords. He thought, having a swordmaster sensor who specializes in wind release can be a very useful asset. Though we can't teach samurai saber techniques liberally, teaching it to a few kids is acceptable. He nodded and said, alright, I'll assign you a teacher for it. Fujin then politely thanked him and stepped backwards while secretly thinking, being an innocent little kid has a lot of advantages. Though I don't think I can ever beat Hiruzen again in negotiations. That old monkey has the experience of negotiating after three great ninja wars, and the ones he negotiated with were a hundred times more unreasonable than me. Looking at Fujin stepping back, Hiruzen released a sigh of relief. He then congratulated everyone and left quickly. While leaving, he decided that this would be the last year he'd give out rewards to the topper. After Hiruzen left, many teachers awkwardly stared at Fujin. However he just ignored them and pretended to not notice any of their stares. After Hiruzen left, all the respective class teachers handed the headbands to their students and praised them for graduating early. They were asked to visit the academy after three days. On getting the headband, Fujin put it on. His first words after that moment were, wow, I really am a ninja now. Fujin sat down in a meditative posture in his living room. He cleared his mind and began planning. He thought, the academy is finally over. Though I had to graduate two years early, it ain't much of an issue. The only major event that will happen anytime soon is the Ichiha massacre. But right now I am not really strong enough to even think about interfering in it. While I do have two years, at best, I'll only be a Chuanan officially by then. He thought for a bit more and decided, alright, I'll ignore the event. It shouldn't affect me in any way. Secondly, my strength. Right now, though experience is lacking, it won't be wrong to say that despite not having many rank C jutsus in my arsenal, my ninjutsu is probably barely at Chunin level. The three months of daily sparring helped me iron out many issues in my ninjutsu. My chakra reserves have increased rapidly too. I can now make three shadow clones that satisfy the requirements mentioned in the scroll. Which means that my chakra level is well into the Chunin level. As for Tejutsu, hum it's a bit confusing. I'm confident that I'm stronger than most who took part in the Chunin exam in Naruto. But I still lost to that Hayuga. If I assume that he and Hoka are already at Chunin level in terms of Tejutsu, then it'll mean that I am probably at that level too. Worst case, I'm probably at the peak of Genin rank in terms of Tejutsu. I really need a better Tejutsu style. Only good thing is that my physique is very good for my age. My Kinjutsu should be sorted when I learn Samurai Saber techniques. So it'll be a lot more lethal than my Tejutsu, but Kinjutsu has its own weaknesses. Holding two swords would mean that I can't make any hand signs. And techniques like Rasengan and Wind Explosion that need hands can't be used. But I guess getting a mid-range slash might compensate for it to some degree. Anyways, I should think about it more after I learn Samurai Saber techniques. My capabilities as a sensor have grown too. My chakra field can now extend over 750 meters, and I can do pretty much everything expected from a sensor, though I will need a few years to master all those tricks. My current fighting ability is majorly based around Tendenjutsu body flicker, wind propelling, earth military movement, shadow clone, wind clone, great breakthrough, wind explosion, gale surge, rock shield and projectile control jutsus. Apart from that, it is heavily dependent on swords, kunais and shurikens, enhanced with chakra flow. I also know Rasengan, but I haven't trained to use it in combat yet. Though I do have good ideas of using it, for the time being, I can't risk anyone knowing that I know it. So overall, if I am willing to use everything I have to its fullest potential, then I think I'll be a Chunin level, though just barely. I'll probably be able to beat the likes of Iruka and Mizuki, but against someone stronger like Jenki or even Michi, my only option would be to run away. 
speaking of escaping, with my wind and shadow clones, along with body flicker jutsu and earth military movement jutsu, and my ability to hide my chakra, escaping from an elite chunin, might actually be possible. Unless it is someone specialized in tracking, it shouldn't be an issue. In fact, if anyone asked me what my best skill right now is, my answer would definitely be the art of escaping. As for what to do next, I need to go through section 100 of the library. I have to learn the rank C wind release jutsus. If any rank C earth release jutsu is handy, then I need to learn it too. Apart from that, I will need to learn one rank C jutsu and complete the current few jutsu scroll, and move on to the next one. He concluded, hmm, that much should be enough. After that I could work on improving the jutsus I know. There's still medical ninjutsu that I'd like to learn, but. Sigh, I have my plate full. I'll check it sometime later. Satisfied with his immediate plans, he decided to start making long-term plans. He thought, now that I have spent almost half a decade here, I have a much better idea about this world. At the rate my physique and chakra has been growing, I'm positive that I'll reach down in level. And if the section A of the library has good jutsus, then becoming an elite jounin shouldn't be an issue too. But, how do I step beyond elite jounin and be as strong as cages? He thought long and hard about this. After half an hour, he concluded, probably the easiest way I have is to learn sage mode. The second way is learning the eight inner gates. However, I'll have to create a very good relationship with Guy for him to teach me that. Not to mention, I'm not sure if merely hard work will be enough to learn it. The third way would be to somehow get the impure world resurrection jutsu and create my own army of rank A and rank S dead ninjas. The fourth way would be to get in master flying thunder god jutsu. The fifth way would be to invent my own rank A and higher jutsus. Combined with high speed, enhanced strength and swordplay, it might be enough to reach that level. Another option could be to become a Jinchuriki. However, that will put Akatsuki on my ass, not something I think I want. Though if I'm strong enough, I could still take that risk. Getting a few strong summons would help too. After concluding, he sighed thinking, even the easiest way is crazy difficult to achieve. I really wonder if I'd be able to reach that level. However, just then, Fujin was struck with a crazy idea. He thought, that's right. I can explore that option. However, can that really be done? He analyzed for a few minutes and thought, I can't say for sure. But, if I am able to pull it off, I will get the means to become incredibly strong. Not to mention, I know exactly when I'll have the right opportunity to get the resources needed for it. He thought a bit more to analyze everything he could and decided, alright, I should definitely work towards achieving that. If it works, then entering cage level won't be an issue. Even if it doesn't, the work done for it won't exactly be a waste. The idea lifted his spirits. With not much time left in the day, he decided to have his dinner and meditate before going to bed. The next couple of days were very hectic for Hiruzen. Grouping the fresh genins and assigning them their sensei, involved a lot of paperwork and analysis. A lot of discussion had to be done with the academy teachers, as well as with the decided sensei. He first started by forming teams of three. He thought, in all 135 students became genin this year. Over 200 from 60 or failed, and they will be added to the genin reserve forces. As for the ones that passed this year, the 94 from the 60 year don't have much hope. We had already graduated the talented people from their year earlier. Even if just a quarter of them became Chuanin, then that will be enough. So I will just assign Chuanins to guide them. As for the 41 who graduated early, all have good potential. They all should at least become Chuanin, and around half have the potential to become a special Jounin. So I'll have to arrange 14 Jounin Sensei for them. Even though Kanoha's numbers have almost recovered, we are still weaker than before the Third Great Ninja War, when it comes to high-end power. So we need to train all 41 of them with the intention of raising them to Jounin rank. Even if not everyone becomes a special Jounins, becoming an elite Chuanin will be sufficient. As for becoming Jounin, it's hard to say. I'm confident that Ichihamiko will become a Jounin, just like Senju Teru from the previous year. Just like him, she has the potential to become an elite Jounin. But I can't comment on the others. Sigh, I hope that we get at least 10 to 12 Jounin from this batch. The Kyubi attack killed a lot of our Jounins. He then called the academy teachers to begin forming the teams, and got busy with the required paperwork. 
After the academy teachers prepared a rough draft, however there were a few disagreements like every year. They approached the Hokage to discuss it. Hirazan said, so which are the top teams you formed? Genki replied immediately, according to their performance, Haddock Rei, Ichihamiko, Suzuki Fujin, Hayuga Hoka and Hayuga Hana, show the highest potential. However, Rei's performance was high due to his conditions back home. Now that his mother has been treated, we can't be sure if he'll train with the same gusto. And the two Hayuga can't be on the same team. So I propose forming a team of Ichihamiko, Suzuki Fujin and Hayuga Hoka. However, soon another teacher, who was the class teacher to Haddock Ray spoke, I disagree. In a mere half year, Ray has made huge progress. In fact, his talent can be considered even above Miko. He should be placed within the top squad. I suggest making a squad consisting of Miko, Ray and Fujin. Another teacher commented, actually, Fujin is just a civilian orphan. His future won't be as smooth as the children from shinobi clans. Even his great breakthrough jutsu was provided to him by Genki. So I think that a squad of Rei, Miko and Hoka, might be more optimal. Genki rebutted him, I disagree. Even though Fujin is just a civilian with no background, his performance has been the most consistent in my class. He deserves to be on that squad. Not to mention, he is also a sensor and has wind affinity. Being a sensor, he'll complement the Byakugan. And his wind release jutsus would assist Miko's fire release jutsus and make them more lethal. Also, both him and Hoka kind of have a rivalry into jutsu. So their teamwork would be much better. He secretly thought, not to mention that they are so aloof that they barely had any other friendships. So I have no idea whether they can cooperate with others. The previous teacher was about to rebuke him again, but. However, he was cut by Hirazan, alright that's enough. I have decided. The squad will be made of Miko, Fujin and Hoka. Rei's class teacher was visibly upset over this. He was about to speak, when Hirazan said, their Jounin sensei will be Senju Rinjiro. The teachers were confused by this revelation. One asked, but Lord Hokage, we hadn't selected him to be a sensei, had we? Hirazan shook his head and said, no. This change was due to Fujin requesting guidance on samurai saber techniques. Rinjiro had trained under a samurai. Also he is an expert in fighting against Sharingan and uses water and earth jutsus. So it'll provide Miko an opportunity to understand how she can be countered and would help her develop more. And Hoka could learn water release jutsus from him. And his tajutsu is strong enough to handle Hoka's obsession with it. He then looked at Rei's class teacher and said, Sadly Haddock Rei doesn't practice his clan's kenjutsu, or else I'd have put him on the squad instead of Hoka. Everyone was satisfied with this explanation. They moved on to the remaining students. It took over 13 hours for them to form all the squads and decide their sensei. Once that was done, Hirazan sent an Anbu to deliver the news to all the ones selected to be a sensei. If they had any issues, they could approach him the next day. The next day, many approached Hirazan to meet him. At noon, Rinjiro visited him. On entering, he greeted Hirazan and said, Old man, I didn't agree to become a sensei to snorty little brats. Besides, I have already raised one genin squad. Rinjiro was a bit close to him while growing up. Which is why Hirazan didn't mind his words. Hirazan looked at Rinjiro. He was dressed casually and hence Hirazan could see all the scars on his face and arms that he had gotten over his career. Hirazan sighed and said, You've been doing missions almost non-stop since the end of the war. This assignment is for a couple of reasons. One, for you to get some rest. And secondly, as one of those genins wants to learn the samurai saber techniques. Rinjiro looked skeptically at Hirazan and asked, You do know that I can't teach it lightly to anyone. So, is there any reason for me to teach it to him? Hirazan sighed and said, he ranked first in his class. And asked for this as his reward. Rinjiro asked, A, hey, what reward? Hirazan replied, it's an initiative I took to encourage the students and get them to train harder. Hearing that, Rinjiro nodded. He knew the shortage of ninjas that Kanoha faced. He sighed and said, couldn't you get him to ask for anything else? Hirazan didn't reply, but his sweat dropped thinking about what the something else was that Fujin had asked for. After discussing a bit more and getting to know a bit more about the students, Rinjiro left. He wasn't surprised by the fact that his squad was the one with highest potential. After all, he has been an elite Jounin for over a decade. 
Later that day, Fujin went to buy new clothes at a shop that sold clothes to ninjas. He bought a completely black attire. He noticed that the cloth used for these clothes was a lot sturdier. The shopkeeper said that it is harder to cut, has some resistances to fire and lightning, and is harder to get wet or dusty. He put one on and checked himself in the mirror. His whole attire, i.e., boots, trousers and shirt were completely black. It suited his fair skin tone, black eyes and black spiky hair well. He thought, I guess I should get a black mask sometime, maybe then I could play hiding in shadow, haha. <laughs> he looked at himself again. He wasn't bulky, but his muscles were properly toned. There was barely any trace of any fat on his body. He was around 4 feet, 9 inches tall. He thought, alright, it fits properly, and also looks good. He bought three sets of the attire. He also bought a pair of gloves with metal plates on the backhand. He also inscribed a hard seal in the interior of the glove. While it didn't do much, Fujin felt that there was no harm in even slightly increasing its defenses. He did wish that he could take the metal plates out, inscribe them with hard seal instead of the whole glove, and then put it back. But he knew that he wouldn't be able to put the metal plate back in properly. Next day, at 7.30 a.m., the graduated students reported to the academy. The classroom used wasn't the regular classroom that Fujin went to. 42 students were present here. The teachers took attendance, and then gave a scroll to each of the students. Jenki called his students one by one and gave it to them. The class teachers of other students did the same. When Fujin's turn came, he noticed that Jenki was incredibly happy. He wasn't sure why, but since he didn't particularly care, he went back. Jenki was happy because Hiruzen had allowed him to take the Jounin exam. After distributing it to everyone, a teacher announced, the storage scroll provided to you has a first aid kit, 24 shurikens, 6 kunais, 12 senbin needles, 1 ninja rope, and 100 meters long ninja wire. He then smiled and said, this is the final gift from the academy to you. Congratulations on graduating. We will now announce your genin squads. When Fujin's squad was announced, he sighed and thought, an aloof guy who doesn't care about anything apart from Tejutsu, and a stuck-up brat who probably thinks herself to be as talented as Madara. Fuck our teamwork. Sigh, makes me wonder if I should have graduated last year. Teru was the only one matured enough. He analyzed a bit more, anyways, it ain't exactly bad. Tejutsu spars with Hoka have always been very helpful. And Miko should give me a bit of practice against the Sharingan. Granted that she ain't nowhere near Abito or Madara, but neither am I. He then looked at Miko and thought, also, since she'll die after around two more years, it'll mean that I won't be restricted in this squad for very long. Now then, I wonder who my Jounin sensei will be. I really hope that it ain't Kakashi. Also what of my rewards? Jenki didn't talk about it, and Hiruzen didn't call me to meet him. After the Jenin squads were announced, the teacher said that the Jounin sensei would come and pick them up from the class, and then they all left. While they were leaving, Fujin had a thought and sighed, Naruto and his gang should start the academy next year. And I won't be here. What's with me meeting so few canon characters? Soon Jounin started entering the class and called out for their teams. A couple of minutes after the academy teachers left, a tall muscular guy entered and announced, Team 3, come with me. Fujin, Hoka and Miko followed him. Rinjiro moved to the terrace of the academy. A few seconds later, all three genins arrived. When he reached there, Fujin observed his new sensei. He was around 6 feet 6 inches tall, very muscular, looked middle-aged, and had three scars on his face, one going right across his right eye, but his eye was fine. His hair was black and very long, a bit similar to Madara's. He held two swords on his waist. From the symbol on his clothes, Fujin understood that he was from the Senju clan. Actually, there was another thing that allowed Fujin to know that he was from the Senju clan. He had massive amounts of chakra. For obvious reasons, Fujin never tried to sense Hiruzen's chakra, so this was the highest chakra level he had measured so far. It was around seven times that of Genki. When Fujin tried to measure his chakra, Rinjiro noticed. He looked at Fujin and stared at him. Fujin merely smiled. Rinjiro thought, so this is the kid who wants to learn the samurai saber techniques, and the kid who asked for swords made of chakra metal. Not bad, he seems to be a good enough sensor. And even after I stared at him, he merely smiled back. I wonder if that makes him foolish, brave or just shameless. 
He then looked at his remaining two genins and thought, the Hyuga has the same stoic face as their whole clan, and just looking at the Ichiha's face, showed how much pride she has in her. He sighed thinking, this is gonna take a while. Rinjiro said, I am Senju Rinjiro. I'll be your Jounin sensei. Let's start by getting to know each other. So just tell me something about yourself. Miko asked, what should we tell? On the other hand, Fujin remembered the tell me about yourself question that used to be asked in interviews in his previous life. Rinjiro replied, tell me about your likes, dislikes, dreams, hobbies and similar stuff. Fujin then replied, I am Suzuki Fujin. I like swords and cool jutsus. My hobby is to train and read shinobi history and wars. I dislike the carnage that wars cause. And my dream is to become a strong ninja in the future, so that I could bring peace to the world. Rinjiro stared at Fujin and was very impressed with his dream. Of course, if he knew Fujin's real thoughts, he might have vomited blood. After looking at an impressed Rinjiro, Fujin thought, yup, that's exactly what Kanoha higher-ups would like to hear. I couldn't care less about world peace, but saying that is what will get me in the good books of these guys, and could provide me with the opportunity to learn Flying Thunder God Jutsu, and also make Hiruzen protect me in case Danzo tries to recruit me. Either way, it's not like I can do anything about world peace right now. So why not just say it, he. Rinjiro then looked at Miko. She said, I am Ichiha Miko. I like cats. I dislike anyone treating me like a small child. My hobby is practicing ninjutsu and playing with cats. And my dream is to be the strongest Ichiha ever. Fujin looked at her and chuckled internally thinking, well you've got two years to surpass Madara. Rip Rinjiro nodded and looked towards Hoka. He said, I am Hayuga Hoka. I like to jutsu. I dislike studying. My hobby is to spar with others, and my dream is to be the strongest Jutsu user. Rinjiro nodded and said, well congratulations on graduating early. But that doesn't mean that you are Konoha Shinobi. You guys will be on probation for three months. And after that I'll decide whether you're ready to be a ninja or not. This announcement had mixed reactions from the three genins. Fujin wondered, eh? No test. After thinking for a bit, he realized ah, they are probably still recovering. That's why there's a probation period instead of a test to check whether we are ready or not. However, the other two kids didn't take the announcement lightly. Miko impatiently asked, but why? Didn't we pass the graduation exam? Oka took her point further and said, yeah, I even defeated everyone in the Tajutsu tournament. Rinjiro replied, graduation exam is the bare minimum you require to be a ninja. Your attitude, temperament, courage and values matter more. And I'll be the one to judge that. Miko and Hoka were still unsatisfied and wanted to complain more, but Rinjiro didn't give them a chance and announced, we'll meet tomorrow in training ground 17 at 6 am. I'll check your skills tomorrow. Be on time, I hate tardiness. After saying that, he flickered away. When he left, Fujin thought, he didn't say a single thing about himself other than his name. Heck, I think even Kakashi talked more with his team. After he left, Miko huffed and started to leave without saying anything. Hoka, on the other hand, said goodbye to Fujin and was planning to leave too. Fujin sighed and said, Oye, wait a minute. This got both their attention. Hoka looked at him without saying anything, whereas Miko annoyingly asked, what? Fujin replied, tomorrow we'll most probably have to fight against Sensei as a team. So we need to understand each other's strengths and weaknesses. And we also need to plan how to fight together. Hoka agreed with that and nodded. However Miko replied smugly, you two don't need to worry about it. I'll beat him by myself tomorrow. Fujin gave her a deadpan look, which irritated her, and she asked, what? You don't think that I can beat him? Fujin resisted his urge to facip him and replied, do tell how you plan on defeating a Jounin by yourself. She smirked and replied, I'll catch him off guard and use fire dragon jutsu on him. Fujin said, he is from the Senju clan, who specializes in earth and water release jutsus. Assuming that you somehow catch him off guard, he'll still be able to defend. This reply caught her by surprise. She thought a bit and then smirked again and replied, I know Sharingan Jinjutsu. As soon as he looks in my eyes, I'll put him under a Jinjutsu. Fujin mentally scoffed, as if he will fall for something so basic. But I'm tired of dealing with her. He said, alright, we'll call that plan A and we will start with it. Now let's discuss plan B. Miko replied, why do we need a plan B? 
Fujin replied, well he knows that you have the Sharingan. So what if he never looks into your eyes because he knows that your eyes are so awesome? It'll be stupid if we just stand there doing nothing right. Worse, he may think that you are just a little kid, this finally got her attention. Seeing that Fujin was relieved and thought, finally. So I have to either praise her or say someone will think that she's a little brat or both to get her on board. She then asked, so what should we do if plan A fails? Fujin replied, first, let's talk about what each one of us can do. I'll start. I'm a sensor and can sense in a 500 meters radius around me. I'm good at tojutsu and with swords. And I know wind release jutsus, the ones you saw in the exam. I can also perform shadow clone and body flicker jutsu. What about you guys? Miko then replied, I am good at tojutsu too, and can use the Ichiha tojutsu style. My Sharingan allows me to see chakra and use Jinjutsu. I am very good with shurikens. Other than the basic jutsus, I can perform a few fire release jutsus. You saw them in the exam. And I can do body flicker too. In fact, I was taught it by the very best. Fujin was surprised at that information and thought, did Shisui teach her this jutsu? Hoka then replied, I am a master at the gentle fist style. I can close enemies' chakra points, and my eyes can see up to 800 meters away. Apart from it, I know fish spit jutsu and rock shield jutsu. Fujin nodded and advised, if you can, then learn body flicker jutsu. If all three of us can use it, then it'll be very helpful and we could use a lot of tactics. Hoka groaned a bit and said, but I don't want to learn more ninjutsu. Fujin replied, well it's just a movement jutsu. You can move at incredibly fast speed. It'll help make your tojutsu way more lethal. Just imagine your normal jab, then imagine you appearing out of nowhere and performing that jab on the enemy. As Fujin expected, that got Hoka interested and he agreed to learn it. Fujin then talked a bit about tactics that they could use. He said, we need to decide who'll fight Sensei up close, and who'll perform support attacks from a distance. I. However Hoka cut him off and said, I want to fight up close. Fujin was about to nod when Miko said, no I want to fight up close. Hoka rebuked her and then they started arguing. Fujin sighed thinking, kids. He then stopped them both and said, among all of us, Hoka was ranked 1 in the Tejutsu tournament. So he'll engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Sensei. Miko was about to talk, but Fujin continued, but he can't handle Sensei all by himself. So you and I will assist him from time to time. Also both of us have mid-range jutsus, so it'll be a waste if we can't use them. Oka, wanting to engage in hand to hand combat, quickly supported Fujin and Miko had to begrudgingly agree. Fujin thought, I planned on discussing a lot more, like the fire-wind combination, and even wanted to ask Hoka to learn more advanced water-release jutsus, as they work well with wind-release as well. Sadly, I was too impatient. It'll take a lot of time before they are ready to listen to those tactics. Kinda makes me wish that Rinjiro beats both of them up tomorrow to make them a little less stuck up. But I'm afraid that if he does that, then he'll beat me up too. And without using Earth military movement jutsu and wind propelling jutsu, it'll be hard to dodge for long. So I, I wonder when I can use these jutsus publicly. It's very uncomfortable to fake hand signs, limit their power, and not use half of the jutsus I know. Sadly it's necessary. I hope I reach the Jounin level soon, as after that, there won't be much worries about Danzo trying to recruit me. It'll be too late to attempt to brainwash me at that stage. Fujin had also planned to ask them to grab a bite together at Ichiraku. However he had enough for today, soon they said goodbyes and left. Fujin went over to the library. Now that he had become a genin, he was allowed to access the section 100 of the library. However, that's not what he was here for. Becoming a ninja allowed him to see a certain book. He went to the librarian and showed his card and asked, can I see the bingo book? She was surprised by a 10-year-old kid asking her that question. However since he was a ninja, she nodded and asked, would you like to see the smaller one or the bigger one? Now it was Fujin's turn to be surprised. He asked, what's the difference? She replied, well the smaller one only has names, bounty, affiliation and some basic information, whereas the bigger one has more in-depth information. Hearing that, Fujin asked her to show the bigger one. She nodded and brought it to Fujin. When Fujin saw the book, he was shocked. His first thought was, it's freaking huge. He opened to see it. 
Apparently, every page covered the data of only one ninja. And the book had 2,197 pages. After analyzing, Fujin thought, well it makes sense, considering that there are over 100 king ninjas in this world. He then mentally thanked the ones who made such a good index. Everything was arranged properly according to the village, and alphabetically as per their names. There were also lists that arranged the ninjas as per their rank in their village, and in the descending order of their bounties. After searching for a couple of minutes, he found the name he was looking for Senju Rinjiro. He began turning the page, but while doing that, a thought occurred to him, it's funny that I thought my biggest advantage in this world would be information. But considering how vast this world is, I don't think I have the information on even 1% of the ninjas. Heck, apart from Tsunade, I didn't even know any living Senju. Anyways, this data is very detailed. I am surprised that we can read it for free, but it makes sense I suppose. This data is compiled by the ones who make the bingo book, and since it's already out in the open, why not just let all your ninjas read it for free? He opened the page and began reading, and he was very surprised by what he read. His bounty was 45 million Ryo. It was even higher than Asuma's during Shippuden and was put on him by Karigakur. He thought, not bad at all. I guess Hiruzen did appoint someone very competent as my sensei. He read further. The information that Fujin obtained was, Senju Rinjiro, rank A, 39 years old. He became Genin at 8, Chuanin at 10, Jounin at 16, and Elite Jounin at 28. He specializes in water and earth release ninjutsu, but can use jutsu of other elements too. He's an excellent swordsman who was trained in the way of swords by a samurai. He fought in both the second and third great ninja wars. In the third war, he had served as Orochimaru's deputy on the Kiri front. Later on, when Orochimaru had to join a different battlefield, he became Kanoha's commander on the Kiri front. Due to his skill with the sword, his proficiency in water release Jutsus and his summon, a sloth, he was very effective against Kiri ninjas. He killed 13 Kiri Jounins and over 50 Kiri Chuanins over the course of the war. His biggest accomplishment was killing one of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist in that war. Though his army was defeated by a surprise offensive launched by Kiri, he managed to retreat with a majority of his army, and kept Kiri at bay, until Kanoha's yellow flash reinforced him, and pushed Kiri back to the seas. After reading that, Fujin thought damn fuck. He's strong. Not Sanin level, but very close. Anyways, it says that he was trained by a samurai, so I guess his guide here is an arranged for me. I do wonder what that summon is though. It's the first time I'm hearing of a sloth. Ain't that a deadly sin. But that sounds a bit too overpowered and not something from this world. Well whatever, I'll look into it later. He then looked into the data of the ninja he knew from Naruto. He sighed in relief, confirming that it was very similar to what he knew. He also got a better understanding of the shinobi world. He thought, Kanoha is way stronger than what was shown in Naruto. Fathers of Shikaku, Inoichi and Shibi are still alive and leading their clans. Each of them is an elite jounin and are very close to rank S. Though I guess that their strengths will decrease over time due to their age. In all, Kanoha has just three rank S ninjas now. But Jiraiya is barely in the village, and Tsunade can barely even fight. However, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, the bingo book has no mention of Danzo. Also, it's quite possible that Fugaku is hiding his Manjikyu. Same with Shisui. I'm not sure how many gates Guy can open, but he might be able to forcibly rise to compete with rank S ninja if needed. Also, it's quite surprising to see Kaharu and Hamura are rank A ninjas. I don't recall them ever fighting in Naruto. In all there are 22 elite Jounins from Kanoha mentioned in the bingo book. And it's quite possible that there are a few more who haven't been mentioned here, like Danzo and others from Root. There are also a few more rank A ninjas who haven't yet become an elite jounin like Kakashi and Guy. He then sighed, I didn't think there would be so many elite jounins in Kanoha. And despite this Hiruzen chose to sacrifice his Ashi. Makes me wonder how bad Kanoha's losses were in the lower ranks due to the war. As for the other villages, Kumo and Iwa are pretty strong too, though not as strong as Kanoha at least when it comes to cage level and elite jounin level combat strength. Kiri is actually quite impressive too, or would have been if so many of their top rank ninjas weren't labeled as rouge ninjas. I guess Abito has pretty much wrecked Kiri. Suna, on the other hand, is doing really bad. Their cage is easily the weakest out of all five cages. 
Though they have two more rank S ninjas, both are retired and very old. And their number of rank A ninjas is pitifully low. He closed the book and thought, well that should be enough information for now. I'll get more as and when there's a need to. He handed the bingo book back to the librarian and went back home. Next day, at 6 a.m., all the members of Team 3 gathered in the training ground 17. It was a small open area in the center of a mini forest. Rinjiro was the last one to arrive. On seeing his gen and squad already there, he wished them good morning and said, as I said yesterday, before I begin training you three, I like to see what you can do. So we'll have a spar, you three versus me. He paused for a few seconds and said, we begin now. As soon as he said that, he jumped forward with the intention to punch. It caught all the three gen and Miko jumped backwards hurriedly, and Hoka jumped to his left. Fujin, on the other hand, just flickered away. Rinjiro's punch landed on the ground where the three genins were standing initially, and the ground cracked, causing a lot of dust to rise, which hit him. Rinjiro thought, not bad. I only intended to punch the ground in front of them, but I didn't think that all three would react so quickly. Especially Fujin, did he use body flicker jutsu without any hand signs. As soon as he used body flicker, Fujin thought, damn. He attacked so suddenly that I flickered away by reflex. He then saw the dust rising up and covering Rinjiro, and so did Hoka and Miko. Fujin immediately started sensing him, Miko activated her Sharingan, and Hoka activated his Byakugan. On sensing Rinjiro, Fujin thought, well now that I've shown it, I can't hide it anymore. So might as well spam it. Still I didn't think hiding my power would be so difficult. I really need to be more careful, in case he pulls a few more stunts like that. I hope I can protect the rest of my secrets for at least another year or two. While Fujin was thinking that, both Hoka and Miko ran towards Rinjiro to engage him in combat. Rinjiro just stood there, waiting for them to begin their assault. Hoka was the first one to reach him, however, Miko launched a few shurikens on Rinjiro. Rinjiro dodged them and then engaged Hoka in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He was able to counter his gentle fist style very easily. When Miko joined in, he suppressed both of them with ease. However, he soon frowned. He tried to sense, but he couldn't sense Fujin at all. Taking the opportunity provided by his teammates, Fujin had disappeared from his sight and hit his chakra. Though Rinjiro couldn't sense Fujin, Fujin closely monitored their fight, waiting for an opportunity to butt in. He soon found one when Rinjiro punched Hoka. Fujin threw a shuriken with all his power. However, Rinjiro smirked and thought, a fake opening. Always works against brats. He moved a step back to avoid the shuriken, however, the shuriken curved towards him. That surprised Rinjiro. He was about to dodge again, when he felt no, something is weird. So instead of dodging, he just caught the shuriken right out of its trajectory. However, as soon as he caught it, he sensed two small chakra signatures behind him. He turned to see two wind spheres heading at him. He took a step to dodge, however, at the same time Miko launched fireball jutsu in the direction he was planning to dodge. Seeing that, he adjusted his direction and dodged both the jutsus, and created distance from his students. Seeing that, Hoka rushed forward to engage him in close combat. While Hoka was rushing towards him, Rinjiro thought, not bad at all. This doesn't seem planned, and their teamwork still needs a lot of work, but they are able to take advantage of the opportunities created by each other. Not to mention that I felt wind on that shuriken, which means that Fujin used projectile control jutsu on the shuriken. And instead of pressing forward on a hopeless assault, he took the advantage of that fireball to disappear again. He engaged in another round of combat with Hoka and Miko. Fujin, who was secretly observing the combat, thought an elite Jounin indeed. That opening was a bait to understand my location. Not to mention, he grabbed the shuriken out of thin air. Though, I wonder what he'd have done if I had infused that shuriken with wind chakra. Anyways, I wonder if I can fool him using a shadow clone. Fujin kept hiding, and made a shadow clone. After a minute, it looked like both Hoka and Miko were about to lose. So the clone interrupted Renjiro by launching two wind explosion jutsu on him. He followed it up with shurikens. Renjiro dodged everything and moved towards Fujin to engage him in close combat. However the clone flickered and moved behind Miko and Hoka. Seeing Rinjiro approaching, Hoka began moving forward to engage him. However, Fujin sensed a huge chakra built up by Miko and shouted, Hoka, move aside. 
That shout alarmed Hoka, and he turned to see that Miko was weaving hand signs and had gathered almost all of her chakra. He quickly got out of her way and created distance by running to his left. Miko, actually, was very frustrated by this fight. Poor girl had been trying to use Sharingan Jinjutsu on her sensei since the start of the fight, but not once did he look in her eyes. Due to her frustration, she launched Fire Dragon Jutsu and nearly poured all her chakra in it. Fujin's clone sensed that and used Great Breakthrough Jutsu. He timed his Jutsu just after Miko launched hers and tried to limit the range of his Jutsu to just cover her Fire Dragon. The result increased the power and the size of the dragon. Not wanting to take that Jutsu hat on, Rinjiro flickered away. The power of this Jutsu really surprised Hoka and Miko. Especially Miko, who was awestruck by it. Fujin was still keeping an eye on Rinjiro. He noticed that Rinjiro had flickered without using any hand signs, and had flickered just enough distance to barely dodge the Jutsus. He thought, sigh, that's the first time he has used an Injutsu. Anyways, it seems like this fight is pretty much over. Hoka has taken quite a beating. So has Miko and she is out of chakra too. Only I am still fine. Sadly there's not much me and my clone can do. Not having a good long range jutsu sucks though. Despite being perfectly hidden, there's not much I can do. Right then, Fujin suddenly used body flicker jutsu purely with his instincts. However, right when his feet left the ground, a hand came out of the ground and caught his right leg. This caused him to fall forward at a very rapid speed. Luckily for him, he managed to put his arms forward, ensuring that his face didn't get badly damaged. Soon, another hand clutched the back of his neck and pinned him to the ground. He realized that it was Rinjiro's chakra signature and thought, what the fuck? I didn't sense him at all. He soon got his clone's memories. His clone had been dispelled, and Hoka and Miko had been defeated. He thought, a clone. But when? On thinking a bit he realized, was it when the dust provided him cover? But I had almost immediately begun sensing him, was that fraction of a second enough for him to make a clone and hide it or his main body? And why didn't I sense him? I should be able to sense anyone sensing me. Heck, even if someone merely looks at me, I sense that too. Rinjiro thought, he was able to see an attack coming. No, that doesn't seem right, my chakra control was perfect. It seems like he decided to move purely on his instincts. He then took his hand off Fujin's neck and said, that's enough. Follow me. Fujin followed Renjiro to where Hoka and Miko were. Both were lying on the ground. He thought, poor kids. They really got beat up. Both their faces are swollen. And there are bruises even on their limbs. Renjiro, who had beaten up these two and dispelled Fujin's clone, dispelled himself. Fujin then looked at Renjiro and thought, did he beat these two up to curb their arrogance? Well whatever, I hope they think more now. After getting his clone's memories, Rinjiro looked at Fujin in a new light and thought, very good. He was successfully able to hide from my clone not only once, but twice. If not for the fact that his clone had only half his chakra, my clone might not have been able to identify him as a clone. He has a very good mincet. Unfortunately, he doesn't have any good long-range jutsu. Which meant that him hiding such a long distance away was disadvantageous to him as well. Also, he gave up a bit too quickly after I caught him. Something I should correct, though I suppose it did save him from receiving a beating. A shame really, though he doesn't seem as arrogant as the other two, some beating would have been good for his development. Luckily for Fujin, he was totally oblivious of Rinjiro's plans and thoughts. He then looked at Hoka and Miko and thought, but that still makes him much better than these two. Sigh, which Jenin engages a Jounin in a head-on confrontation. But other than that, their skills are very good. Hoka is very good at Tejutsu, and he is very fast too. And Miko's fire release Jutsus were quite strong for a Jenin. I'm still surprised by the combo attack of Fujin and her. While Rinjiro was engaged in those thoughts, both Hoka and Miko got up. Though they still were groaning and looking at their sensei with a lot of complaints. Miko also looked begrudgingly at Fujin, who seemed to be in a much better condition. Rinjiro of course ignored those looks and said, you have 10 minutes. Sit here quietly and think about our little spar. I'll ask you some questions after 10 minutes, and I expect you to answer them. Fujin sat down and began to analyze the fight. Hoka and Miko did that too, however they were still looking at Rinjiro angrily. All three Jenins began analyzing and had the same first thought, an elite Jounin is incredibly strong. 
while Fujin had to take some effort to dig up information on Rinjiro, Hoka and Miko got it very easily from their parents. Rinjiro's exploits were common knowledge among the shinobi who fought in the Third Great Ninja War. That it made them a bit more respectful of Rinjiro. After the 10 minutes were up, Rinjiro asked, the first question for you, when did I make a clone? Fujin raised his hand and replied, most probably when you punched the ground and raised a dust cover. Miko, who was thinking hard, replied, yes, I don't think there was any other opportunity for you to make a clone. Fujin could sense anger in her voice due to being beaten up. Hoka was still confused though. He asked, but sensei, why couldn't my Byakugan see you? Rinjiro replied, there are ways to hide even from the Byakugan. Take this as a lesson that just because you don't see it, doesn't mean you can relax and put your guard down. Hoka nodded with a conflicting expression. Knowing that the pride of his clan wasn't foolproof was a big blow to him. Dujin then asked, but sensei, how were you able to approach me from underground and still hide your chakra? Also, how did you keep a track of where I was, without letting me sense you back? Rinjiro replied, there are ways to hide from a sensor. Also tricks to sneak up on a sensor. Just because you don't sense anyone, doesn't mean that you should completely drop your guard. Miko was the next one to ask a question. She asked, Sensei, how did you fight me without even once looking into my eyes? Rinjiro smirked and said, the Achiha clan has been using Sharingans for hundreds of years. There are many ways to combat your Sharingan too. The one I showed you was just the most basic one. The answers made all the three genins fall into a deep thought. Fujin especially was very worried. He thought, does that mean if someone was spying on me, I wouldn't even have an idea. This thought worried him. However he calmed down on thinking, well he is an elite Jounin, capable of leading a whole battlefront. Surely Kanoha won't send an elite Jounin to spy on a nobody. I should still be safe. Rinjiro cut the thoughts of his students and said, now all three of you will think and tell me why you lost. And tell me how you could have performed better. Hoka, you first, followed by Miko and then Fujin. Hoka thought for a bit and said, you countered my gentle fist, and I couldn't land even one hit on you. Also my Byakugan couldn't see your clone. And you were also a lot faster than me or anyone else. Rinjiro then looked at Miko who replied, your Tejutsu is much stronger than ours. And you were always able to dodge all of our attacks, no matter how thorough we were. Also you knew exactly how to counter each one of us. He then looked over to Fujin who said, our teamwork wasn't proper. We barely ever even spoke to each other. I saw Hoka and Miko tag team against you, but they weren't in sync with each other. And I, despite being hidden, couldn't help much from such a long distance. And we didn't have any plans to defeat you. Not to mention Fujin paused for a few moments and continued, you were just too strong for us to handle. Rinjiro nodded and thought, decent. Hoka's tactical thinking would have to be developed more, but the other two are much better. He then said, alright, this is it for today. You can go home and heal yourself. We will meet here tomorrow at 5 a.m. You have one assignment for tomorrow. Write down your daily routine and bring it tomorrow. And Fujin, stay here. Hoka, Miko, you two can leave. On getting the permission to leave, they said goodbyes and left. Fujin did have to suppress his urge to laugh as they both were walking very weirdly. Though that urge went away very quickly as he had a horrifying thought, wait. I was the only one not beaten up. So he didn't make me wait for. He quickly got rid of that thought, no way. He's a reputed commander from a great ninja war, he won't be so petty. He screamed internally, where the fuck are those human rights activists? Also, why the fuck didn't that old monkey make laws to prevent child abuse, despite warming the hokage seat for decades? Fujin kept seeing his teammates walk away in a weird manner, while desperately hoping that his thoughts won't ever come true. In training ground 17, Fujin and his new sensei were alone. Rinjiro asked, why didn't you use swords during the spar? Fujin replied, cause I don't have any. I checked the prices, and even the cheapest one costs 12 care io. Sadly I can't afford them. The answer was within Rinjiro's expectations. He nodded and said, I'll be teaching you how to wield swords from now onwards. Don't worry about the swords, I have a few you can use. We will first test your skills and also the size of the sword that'll suit you. After that, the third Hokage will order two custom-made samurai swords for you. Fujin nodded and thanked him. Rinjiro took out a scroll, laid it on the ground and rolled it open. Fujin noticed that it was a storage scroll. 
and looking at the number of storage seals, he probably was the one who made it. Rinjiro made a hand sign, and twelve swords appeared on the scroll. Fujin picked up two, which were very similar in size to the ones he already used and said, Sensei, the ones I used in the academy were of this size. Rinjiro replied, alright, we'll start with these then. Let's have another spar. I wanna see how good your sword skills are. Fujin and Renjiro then spar to compare their sword skills. While sparring, both had different thoughts. Fujin was happy that his sensei wasn't the same monster he was earlier. Renjiro on the other hand had mixed feelings about Fujin's swordsmanship. He thought, this kid's basics are extremely solid. Especially considering that he has only trained with swords for less than a year. However, apart from the basics, he has nothing at all. There's no style to his wordplay. It's just a simple straightforward attack and defense. While he has been attacking and defending well, it's only due to him leveraging his speed and strength. If I were to increase my speed and strength to match his, he most probably won't even last 5 seconds. The spar continued for a few minutes more before Rinjiro halted it. He concluded, he's like an unpolished jade. Not having any other styles means that he doesn't have any bad habits. While in the long run it may be disadvantageous, but for practicing just one style, this would be very convenient. Of course, since he hasn't practiced any styles yet, I can't say how fast or slow he will be at learning the samurai saber techniques. Renjiro then suddenly increased his speed to match Fujin's, and skillfully hit both his swords consecutively to create an opening, and then placed the tip of his sword very close to Fujin's throat. He said, alright that's enough. I'll teach you some new forms. He then displayed a few forms for Fujin, and asked him to copy and practice them. The training continued for three hours, after which Rinjiro dismissed Fujin. After dismissing Fujin, Rinjiro reported to Hiruzen. On entering his office, Hiruzen asked him, so how were the kids? Rinjiro replied, very promising old man. They are much stronger than an average genin. Hoka is already a Chunin level in terms of Tejutsu. And Miko is the same in terms of ninjutsu, though her chakra reserves need to increase. Fujin's ninjutsu isn't bad either. Though his ninjutsu was weaker than Miko's, he was more skillful with them. And his chakra reserves are higher than hers. The most surprising thing is that his tactical thinking is already on par with someone who has gone through many missions. And, even though they didn't actively strategize, they were smart enough to take advantage of the openings provided by their other teammates. Even if I had conducted a test, they would have easily passed it to become genins. Here is a nodded and thought, just as their results indicate. Though Fujin's tactical prowess is surprising to hear. I guess that is why he was able to easily rank first in the written exams. He then asked, what about Fujin's sword skills? Rinjiro shook his head and said, I can't say yet. His basics are good, but whether he can learn further or not depends on his talent and the effort he puts in. Hiruzen replied, all right. I'll leave it to you and dismissed him. Next day, Fujin got up at 4.20 am and thought, I thought waking up at 5 am was too early. Now this guy asks us to gather there at 5 am. Not to mention, that training ground is over 15 fucking kilometers from my home. Sigh, whatever. I guess I'll get a good morning run at least. Not sure if his training will be as intense as my morning workouts, so I could increase the pressure applied by the seal on my body during that run. Fujin reached the training grounds just before 5 am, and saw that both his teammates were already there. He wished them good morning and waited for Rinjiro. Rinjiro appeared right at 5 am and said, morning, the kids wished him back. Rinjiro began by saying, from today onwards, we'll meet here daily at 5 am. Our mornings will begin with rigorous physical training. He then looked at Miko and said, Fujin's and Hoka's physiques are very well developed. However Miko, you don't have any seals on your body to help build your physical strength, do you? Miko shook her head. Renjiro said, today, you'll ask your parents to get that seal for you. And get the seal before this week ends. Miko nodded and said, yes and say he then looked at Hoka and Fujin and asked, how much maximum pressure can your seals apply? Hoka replied, maximum, it can apply 125 kilograms weight. Fujin replied, mine can apply a maximum weight of 250 kilograms. Hoka looked at Fujin with a bit of jealousy as his seal was better. Rinjiro then asked, alright, and how much percent of the pressure do you two use? 
Hoka replied, 30%, and Fujin replied, 13.5%. On hearing Hoka's reply, Fujin sighed internally, no wonder he can keep up so easily with me. Whereas Hoka's mood cheered up as he thought, even though his seal is better, I apply more pressure on my body. Miko, on the other hand, was upset and annoyed thinking, no wonder these two move so fast. Why didn't anyone ever tell me about this method to get stronger? Rinjiro thought, really impressive. It seems that I can make their physical training more rigorous than I had planned. He said, alright, let's begin with our training. And Team 3 began their first training session under their new sensei. Everyone was very enthusiastic. Getting personally trained by an elite Jounin would be really helpful. No matter what their dreams were, becoming an elite Jounin would be the minimum requirement for them to reach. Only after that could they think of making their dreams a reality. In the first 30 minutes, all three were very energetic. In the next 30 minutes, their enthusiasm died down. After one hour, Miko could barely keep up with the training. Even an aloof Hoka could clearly notice that she was trying her hardest to hold back her tears. Hoka could still keep up and was the only one looking forward to the next three hours. Fujin could keep up too, but he had a very bad feeling. After two hours, Fujin was badly regretting the decision he made in the morning. He thought, which fucking demon put the thoughts of turning up the pressure of the seal, to fucking 25% for the morning run to this training ground. When the training finally ended at 9am, Hoka and Fujin dropped to the ground. They could barely even move any muscle. Miko had already dropped unconscious some time earlier. Neither Fujin nor Hoka were aware when exactly, but Rinjiro picked her up and laid her under a tree. Fujin would have screamed for child protection laws, but he was too tired to even think about it. He noticed that Miko got up a few minutes after the training ended, and that felt very fishy for some reason. Looking at that sight, Rinjiro chuckled internally. He said, no need to overreact so much. It was merely a light morning workout. Now get up and move under that tree. They both barely got up and wobbled somehow to those trees and sat there, while resting their backs on the trunk of the tree. Rinjiro then tossed a couple of ration bars and a water bottle to all three and said, you can rest here for the next hour. Eat those ration bars and hydrate yourself, preferably after half an hour. I'll meet you here again at 10. He then flickered away. As soon as he left, both Fujin and Hoka slid down and began sleeping. This pissed Miko who said loudly, wake up you two, we can't sleep all day. That woke the two of them up. Hoka dismissively replied, we didn't sleep for over an hour during the workout. Fujin continued in the same tone, yeah, wake us up after 30 to 40 minutes. And they both went back to sleep. Miko was very annoyed and made some noise, but both were too tired to respond to her antics and just ignored her. After around half an hour, Miko woke them both up. As soon as they woke up, they ate the ration bars and emptied the water bottle. The short nap brought their energy levels up, but didn't do much to stop the muscle ache all over the body. Gujin sighed and said, I think every single muscle in my body is aching. Hoka replied, yeah, same here. I don't think it's gonna stop anytime soon. Fujin replied, especially if this has to be done every morning. That sentence scared both Hoka and Miko. Miko asked, no way, right? Unlike you two, I didn't even last the whole workout. How will we do this daily? Fujin chuckled internally and thought, poor girl. She is totally freaked out. Ha ha ha. Still, this sensei. I was upset at not getting a chance to meet Guy, and hence not having any opportunity to learn from him. But with this, I don't think it was such a bad thing to not meet him. As insane as this workout was, Guy, probably, still beats this by a long distance. Otherwise there's no way he'd learn the eight inner gates all the way to the eighth gate. Hoka tried to console Miko and said, don't worry. I have been doing such physical workouts for years. After some time, our body will get used to it. And the results will be worth it. That calmed Miko down a bit. However, Fujin thought, now that I think about it, this is a good opportunity to curb her Ichiha pride a bit. He countered Hoka by saying, I don't think that will be the case with Rinjiro Sensei. If we get anywhere near being comfortable with this workout, he'll probably change it. Even if that isn't the case, he could just make us increase the pressure on our body. That again freaked Miko out. She quickly asked, but can't we fool Sensei by lying about how much pressure we have applied? Hoka commented, yeah, we can. There's no way for others to check it. 
However, Fujin countered again, even if he can't check it, he'll understand by how tired we are after the workout. So though we could fake the pressure, I don't think we can fool an elite Jown in about how difficult the workout is. On being countered again, Hoka wondered what Fujin was up to. He thought, I'm going out of my way to make her feel better, but Fujin is making her more and more scared. He thought for a bit, but couldn't think of anything and let it go, whatever, I don't care. Still though, for a physical workout to push me to this extent. I need to get stronger. Miko tried to think of more ways out, but couldn't think of anything. She had one thought which she was planning to ask her teammates, can we ask Sensei to decrease the difficulty of the workout? However, her pride didn't allow her to say that. She decided, fine. I'll just work harder and improve my physique. I'm the only one to graduate from my class, which shows how much better I am as compared to others. There's no way a single routine will stop me from achieving my dream. Fujin didn't see the look of determination on both his teammates. His body was still very sore to pay much attention to them. However, another person did. Renjiro was hiding nearby and watching his young students. Looking at the determined looks of Hoka and Miko, he smiled thinking excellent. With this determination, their power will increase very rapidly. Sadly, Fujin isn't looking that determined. He thought a bit and concluded, well, just because there's no determined look on him doesn't mean that he's discouraged. Though he did speak about future challenges, it didn't seem like he wanted to back away. Anyways, I should get a better idea after a few more sessions. If he isn't determined, then I have a few ways to make him determined. If Fujin knew his sensei's plans for him, he would have shuddered. When just five minutes of break was left, Fujin and Hoka got up and began stretching. Miko copied them. They weren't sure which crazy session awaited them, and decided to loosen up their muscles. Rinjiro soon appeared in front of them and said, before we begin with the next session, let's talk about your routines first. Rinjiro then discussed everyone's routine one by one. He planned to train them from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. and from 10 a.m. to noon. For Fujin, there'd be additional three hours of training from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. He modified everyone's routines to fit his own training plans. He also recommended everyone their diets. And that involved a lot of ration bars. Rinjiro recommended them to eat one at 4.15 a.m., two at 9.30 a.m., and another one or two during lunch. He explained that ration bars were created for ninjas who'd be on very long missions away from Kanoha. So they have absolutely everything necessary that a ninja must consume. Apart from that, food items rich in proteins were recommended by him. Fujin groaned a bit at his schedule. He thought, no freaking way. Since when did Jown and Sensei begin spending so much time to train their genins? Heck, apart from Kakashi teaching Sasu Chidori and Guy teaching Lee, I don't think any of the remaining ten were taught anything significant at all by their Sensei. With him practically taking my whole day, I won't have any time to keep practicing few ninjutsu or learn any new ninjutsu. I am not sure if the trade-off is worth it. He thought a bit more and sighed, I don't really have a say here, I really hope that the trade-off is worth it. Rinjiro began the next training session. Considering how tired his students were, Rinjiro decided to let them have it easy. The session focused on teamwork and team formations. Nothing fancy, just the application of what they were taught in the academy. At noon, Rinjiro stopped the training and gathered everyone. He then said, Fujin, for today, we'll skip your sword practice. I have another assignment for you. All three of you will visit the library and decide what you guys want to learn over the next year. We will discuss it tomorrow. And don't forget, we'll have daily training sessions here at 5 a.m. Fujin, Hoka and Miko nodded and thanked him. Hoka and Miko left for their home, whereas Fujin went over to Yakiniku Q for lunch. Fujin did train hard over the past five years. However, nothing came close to what he went through today. Despite the pain, he was actually looking forward to how much stronger this training would make him. After lunch, he went over to the library. He entered the section 100 of the library and began searching for wind release jutsus. He also wanted to look at rank C earth release jutsus, but he thought that old freak can sneak up without me even sensing. And given that he has given us this task, I wouldn't be surprised if he is keeping an eye here. I'll just check the rest sometime later. What surprised him was that the number of rank C wind release jutsus exceeded the number of rank D and rank E wind release jutsus. On going through all of them, he made a list. 
The list of rank C wind release jutsus was Gale Palm Jutsu Great Breakthrough Jutsu Spinning Shield of Wind Jutsu Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu Wind Dragon Jutsu Wind Cutter Jutsu Faithful Wind Blade Jutsu Wind Instantaneous Body Jutsu Air Current Wild Dance Jutsu He had already learned Great Breakthrough Jutsu. So he read the scrolls of the remaining jutsus to get a better understanding of them. After reading, he concluded so Gale Palm Jutsu is basically just a more advanced form of Gale Surge Jutsu. It does provide 360 degrees coverage, but its power is still lacking. Not to mention, Spinning Shield of Wind Jutsu is a much better defensive jutsu. Not only does it defend, but it also reflects back all attacks made on it. Wind Instantaneous Body Jutsu is similar to Body Flicker Jutsu. The body moves along with a gale of wind. It's an escape jutsu. And the user can move over a kilometer. Wind Cutter Jutsu and Faithful Wind Blade Jutsu are offense-oriented jutsus. Wind Cutter basically just uses wind to cut through the enemies. And Faithful Wind Blade needs a sword or kunai or any blade as a base. Using that, it creates a 10 feet long blade of wind. Since it is made of wind, it is almost weightless, and is very sharp and difficult to block. I guess the jutsu that Baki used was a more advanced form of this jutsu. Air Current Wild Dance Jutsu is a battlefield control jutsu, and can be used to restrict enemies. Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu and Wind Dragon Jutsu sound incredibly fun. The wind sphere has to be made, and then the caster has to make a wolf or a dragon from that sphere. But both jutsus take different routes ahead. In Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu, I can make more wolves as I get stronger. Whereas, in Wind Dragon Jutsu, the dragon can shoot out Wind Explosion Jutsu. He began analyzing, once again, these jutsus are very interesting. Most of these jutsus aren't restricted by their ranks, and can perform even as good as in rank S jutsu, if the caster is strong enough, and has mastered these jutsus to their limits. In fact, spinning shield of wind jutsu, wind gale wolf jutsu and wind dragon jutsu, are classified as rank CS, depending on how strong their user is. At rank C, spinning shield of wind can only deflect weapons back, but as it is made stronger, it can reflect low-level ninjutsu back, and at its peak, it is said to be able to reflect even rank A jutsus back. For Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu, it's about the number of wolves that can be formed. At rank C, only one can be formed. But at rank S, the caster can make hundreds of these wolves. Something that'll be incredibly useful against an army. For Wind Dragon Jutsu, it's about the size of the dragon, and the number of wind explosion jutsus it can spit out. According to the scroll, someone with large amounts of chakra and excellent chakra control could make a dragon that is over a kilometer long and can shoot out hundreds of wind explosion jutsus. Even though the other jutsus aren't stated to be able to reach such a level, I can imagine them to be much stronger. For instance, for faithful wind blade jutsu, the size of the wind blade could be extended even further. Or it could be made much sharper. Similarly, Wind Instantaneous Body Jutsu could probably be used to move tens of kilometers away. He then calmed himself and thought, the only issue is, why haven't I heard about anyone using these jutsus? Even if these jutsus have that potential, if no one can reach it, then there must be some issue. He analyzed for a few minutes and concluded, I guess using my memories about Naruto is very unreliable. Also, it is very likely that Wind Affinity Ninjas in Kanoha do practice these jutsus, just that I'm not aware of them. Not surprising. But I do want to know if there was even one character in the past who used these jutsus to their full potential. He noticed, I lost my focus. Let me first decide which jutsus to learn. After analyzing, he decided, I will learn Spinning Shield of Wind Jutsu, Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu, Wind Dragon Jutsu, Faithful Wind Blade Jutsu and Wind Instantaneous Body Jutsu. I don't need the battlefield control that Air Current Wild Dance Jutsu provides currently. And for defense, Escaping into the Ground and Spinning Shield of Wind Jutsu are better options than Gale Palm Jutsu. Wind Cutter Jutsu could have been useful, but I have another idea. While analyzing the jutsus, Fujin noticed two peculiarities. His thoughts were, wouldn't Faithful Wind Blade Jutsu be a better option than Chakra Flow? It makes me wonder if instead of sending a slash of chakra, I could use this to send a slash of wind in Samurai Saber techniques. Also, can this be used in conjunction with Chakra Flow? The others are Wind Dragon Jutsu and Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu. The starting point of both of these jutsus is the same. 
So can I create wolves that shoot out wind explosion jutsu, or can I create multiple dragons? These ideas intrigued him a lot. He decided to experiment with them when he was strong enough to do so. After deciding the jutsus to learn, Fujin thought, alright, decision made. Now I'll dig up this entire library to see if anyone ever used these jutsus to their limits or not. He got up to keep the scrolls back. On getting up he noticed, A, hey, Miko's here. I didn't even notice. He then tried to sense and noticed, oh, Hoka is here too. And he is in section D. Both Hoka and Miko had arrived in the library sometime after Fujin. Unlike Fujin, they had guidance from their ninja parents. As they were talented enough, they were also guided by their respective clan elders. So they hadn't visited the village's library before, as all their jutsus were directly taught to them. However, this time, respecting Rinjiro's wishes, the elders allowed these kids to go and research in the village library. Of course, they would discuss Miko and Hoka's plans with them before they talked to Rinjiro. Hoka was reading the scroll on body flicker jutsu in section D. He thought, sigh, the library is full of ninjutsu. I tried reading scrolls on tojutsu, but they suck. Nothing comes close to our gentle fist style. Sigh, I don't want to waste my time on ninjutsu. I'll just tell sensei that I will learn body flicker jutsu. It was very cool when Fujin just blitzed everywhere. Also, if my enemy knows this jutsu, I won't be able to even touch him. Though father would probably still yell on me. Can't they get that I want to focus only on tojutsu? Miko, on the other hand, had directly arrived in section 100 and began looking for more fire release jutsus. She thought, why did my father make me search through jutsus here? Couldn't they just teach me stronger jutsus? However, while searching, she found something that surprised her. She thought, fire release, 4. Why is this jutsu in section 100? Shouldn't it be a rank B jutsu and fire release, 5 jutsu be a rank A jutsu? She took the scroll and began reading it. On reading it, she was very satisfied, she thought finally. This jutsu finally has some power behind it. The fire release, 4 jutsu was similar to fire release, 2 jutsu. Point two fingers and release a heat ray. However, in this stage the power was much higher. It was comparable to using a very hot kunai. Miko thought, with this, I could compete with Hoka and Fujin in close combat. Getting hit by this will be very painful, and it'll be very hard to dodge in close range. Though I don't like to admit it, both of them are much stronger than me physically. And Hoka's gentle fist style is difficult to counter despite having Sharingan. With this jutsu, I could become as strong as them in close combat, and I am already superior to them in ranged combat. She then looked for other jutsus. And decided to learn flame sphere jutsu and fireproof jutsu thinking, I don't have any defensive jutsus. So these might be a bit useful. Fujin ignored his teammates and began his search with the Kazakiages. He wasn't aware much about the Kazakiages. He thought, the syllabus didn't focus much on the past Kazakiages. In fact, they didn't talk about which jutsus were used by any foreign cage. I do recall Gara, his father and the third Kazakiage. However, not much was shown. Gara manipulated sand, Rasa manipulated gold, and his predecessor manipulated iron. And all their combat was based around that. I hope the first and second aren't the same. Also it is improbable for third and fourth Kazakiages to not know anything else. It took him a while to gather all the data on the three Kazakiages. He had already read about Rasa in the bingo book. Sadly, the bingo book didn't maintain information on the dead. After almost two hours of going through various scrolls and trying to summarize it, Fujin understood I see. So the first Kazakiage was a user of magnet release Keke Genkai. He was the one who created Sun Agakur. And unlike Hashirama, he did it with an iron fist. Many tribes and clans in the vicinity were forced to join in or evacuate. It seems like he wanted to keep the position of Kazakiage within his clan, as he had announced his second son as his successor. Sadly for him, Tabarama killed all three of his sons in a clash in the first war. And later on, he was killed by the second Tsuchikage's dust release in the same war. Not having anyone strong enough in the clan, they had to appoint a student of the first Kazakiage as the second Kazakiage. And at the same time, they began raising the first Kazakiage's grandson for the third Kazakiage's position. Though all the Kazakiages have been an expert at wind release, it was the second one who was a true master of the wind. It seems that the legends from these scrolls came from him. 
In order to defend an important location, he had created a wind dragon so huge that its tail couldn't be seen at all. He could also create hundreds of wolves to attack enemy armies. He could fly, and had clashed with the second Tsuchikage a few times. And it seems like all the Danzo's vacuum jutsus came from the second Kazakiage too. However, towards the end of the first war, Tabarama killed the second Kazakiage. Though, despite that, they didn't surrender and retreated back into their deserts, where no one dared to march on them. So, how exactly did Kanoha get these jutsus? It's very unlikely for Kanoha and Suna to both have these jutsus. So either Suna or, more likely, Kanoha stole it from the other. Fujin thought a bit and reached three conclusions, well either Tabarama had an Ichiha keep an eye on him and copy his jutsus, or, Tabarama used impure world resurrection to get those jutsus from him. Or Suna was asked to hand these jutsus over after their disastrous loss in the second war. Hmm, knowing Tabarama, I'd say it is very likely that he employed both the first two ways, and Hiruzen took the opportunity provided in the second war to show that Kanoha has acquired these jutsus in a proper manner. Of course, I can't be sure that this is what happened. Either way, it does seem that the potential of these wind release jutsus is very real. Still, the first great ninja war was so brutal. At the end of the war, every village had to elect their third cage. Only Tabarama and the second Rakage were alive, but they were killed during the peace talks, when the Gold and Silver Brothers revolted. Probably that's why the next wars weren't that intense. No cage died in the Second Great Ninja War, and the Third Rakage was the only cage to die in the Third Great Ninja War. I guess they did learn some form of constraint. Makes me wonder if the First War is the reason why Hiruzen talks so much about peace, and why Inoki chose to just watch and be known as the fence-sitter, instead of being more proactive. Unvalidating the potential of the Jutsus, Fujin decided to read one scroll up entirely to understand how the Jutsu should be learned. After analyzing, he decided I'll start with Faithful Wind Blade Jutsu. It should assist in my Samurai Saber Techniques training with Rinjiro. Though, I'll need to confirm it with him first. Miko and Hoka had already left the library when Fujin was searching for information on the Kazakiages. When Hoka reached home, his father asked, so what have you decided to learn? Hoka put up a very serious face and said, father, I have decided to learn Body Flicker Jutsu. And then he paused. His father kept waiting to hear his son's further plans, but Hoka didn't speak. He asked, and. Hoka showed a confused expression and asked, and what? He impatiently asked, what would you learn in addition to body flicker jutsu? Hoka again put up a very serious face and said, I'll learn more to jutsu. This statement finally broke his father's stoic expression and got Hoka a punch right on his head. He then dragged his son to his clan's library to pick out more jutsus for him. A similar scenario took place at Miko's home. Her parents were happy with her choice to learn fire release for jutsu. But for the rest, her mother told her, those two jutsus don't provide much defense. Flame Sphere will at best help you defend against one attack, and Fireproof Jutsus will only make you immune to Fire Release Jutsus. Actually, Fire Element doesn't provide a good defense. Why don't you learn Earth or Water Release Jutsus for defense? Miko thought about what her parents said and agreed. She said, alright, but I also want to learn Flame Sphere and Fireproof. Knowing their daughter's talent, her parents agreed. They then went to the Ichiha library to pick more jutsus. The next day again began with a brutal morning workout. At 10 AM, Rinjiro asked, so what have you guys decided to learn? Miko, wanting to talk first, quickly said, Sensei, I've decided to learn fire release, four jutsu, flame sphere jutsu, fireproof jutsu, earth military movement jutsu and hiding like a mole jutsu. Rinjiro nodded and asked, why? Miko said, I already know fire release, three jutsu, so fire release, four is the next step. It'll also be a very strong option in close combat. Earth military movement jutsu and hiding like a mole jutsu are to evade an enemy attack, and once I'm underground, it'll be a strong defense too. And if I have jumped and can't reach the ground, then I'll use flame sphere jutsu to defend. And fireproof jutsu would help me become immune to fire release jutsus. On hearing her reason, Fujin thought, he, she memorized the whole thing. Still hiding like a mole jutsu. I should learn that one. I hope that jutsu has some way to breathe underground. 
though I did develop a few ways to ensure cracks in the surface to allow some flow of air underground, it is not very reliable. Rinjiro too noticed the memorized answer and sighed internally, they still assisted her in the decision. Though this plan should be good enough. He then said, that should be good enough. However, you will train to be able to perform fire release, for jutsu without any hand signs. Miko was confused, without any hand signs. How and why? Rinjiro replied, do you think that your enemies will wait for you to perform your hand signs when you are in a close combat? As to how, don't worry. I'll teach you. Miko was very intrigued by it and nodded excitedly. He then looked over to Fujin. Fujin said, I've decided to learn spinning shield of wind jutsu, wind gale wolf jutsu, wind dragon jutsu, faithful wind blade jutsu, and wind instantaneous body jutsu. This surprised Rinjiro a bit. He thought, that's surprising. He wants to learn 5 rank C wind release jutsu. I did have plans to suggest a couple of jutsus in case he chose only one or two. I suppose this will be good too. I'll just teach those to him sometime later. Though Rinjiro hit it soon, Fujin did notice him getting surprised. He sighed internally, I would have preferred to train in them in secret, but he barely allows me any free time to do that. So if I only mentioned one or two, then there's a chance that I might be stuck with only those for some time. Rinjiro then nodded and asked, why? Fujin replied, spinning shield of wind jutsu will help me defend from frontal assaults and even counterattack. Gale wolf and wind dragon jutsu will allow me to attack from a distance and control the battlefield. And I could attack from both land and the sky with them. Wind instantaneous body jutsu is an escape jutsu. As for faithful wind blade, I think that it'll complement samurai saber techniques well, so I plan to start with it. Rinjiro thought, very good, considering that he didn't have anyone to guide him. Two jutsus very long range, one defensive, one close range and one escape jutsus, and he already has two usable mid-range jutsus. He then commented, good thinking. But, later on, you'll also have to learn your second element. Wind is good for offense, but not very good for defense. Also, don't learn faithful wind blade jutsu right now. Well it will complement samurai saber techniques, but that's only after you've mastered it. Right now it'll become an obstacle instead. Start with wind dragon jutsu. Fujin nodded and asked, why should wind dragon jutsu be learned first? Wouldn't it be easier to learn wind gale wolf jutsu first, and then learn wind dragon jutsu? Rinjiro was impressed with the question. He answered, I have some plans for your wind dragon jutsu. So don't worry about it. As for the learning order, once you learn Wind Dragon Jutsu, it'll be much easier to learn Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu. Fujin nodded while thinking, yeah, but that doesn't make learning Wind Dragon Jutsu any easier. Rinjiro then looked at Hoka. Hoka said, I've decided to learn Body Flicker Jutsu, Stone Shuriken Jutsu, Rock Thorn Bed Jutsu, Rock Thorn Launch Jutsu and Water Shuriken Jutsu. Both Fujin and Miko noticed the sorrowful tone of Hoka. Rinjiro thought, I know you don't like ninjutsu, but is there a need to look at me like I owe you a million ryo? He ignored that and thought about the jutsus, just like us, the Hayugas focus on earth and water elements too. The gentle fist style has both the sturdiness of earth and the flexibility of water. So even if they don't have those affinities, they are still trained in those elements. Luckily for him, he does have the earth affinity. Still, he chose only one rank C jutsu. All others are rank D, I guess I need to take it slow with this kid. Rinjiro asked once again, why? Hoka replied the answer that his father had made him memorize, body flicker is to increase my speed. My gentle fist style is restricted by range. So I can use body flicker to force the enemy into close combat. And if an enemy stays barely outside my range, then I can engage him with stone shuriken jutsu. If the fight is on water, then I can engage him with water shuriken jutsu. Rockthorn bed jutsu is to stop the enemies from running away, and rockthorn launch jutsu is in case the enemy jumps to avoid the rockthorns. Rinjiro nodded and thought, the usual Hayuga tactic of using rockthorn bed jutsu for the reverse purpose. Though I'll have to make him learn more rank sea earth and water release jutsus. Rinjiro then looked at all three of his students and said, I'll now explain to you why I made you go through this exercise. But first, tell me, which rank jutsu would you guys like to use? Miko replied immediately, I'd like to learn and use rank S jutsu. She then looked at Rinjiro with hopeful eyes. Rinjiro chuckled internally and looked at the other two kids. 
Fujin was in thought, and Hoka appeared tense. Hoka, while sweating, said, Ra. Rank D Jujutsus are enough for me. Miko glared at Hoka for saying that. Rinjiro then looked at Fujin and asked, Fujin. Fujin looked at his sensei and said, I'd like to use rank A or S Jutsus too. But I'm not sure of how much chakra they would need. If just using one rank S Jutsu completely drains my chakra, then it's kinda pointless, isn't it? Rinjiro smiled on hearing that answer, perfect. This kid's analytical ability is very good. Rinjiro said, you are right. This exercise is for you guys to find the Jutsus most suited for you. No matter what rank ninja you become in the future, the Jutsus you'll use the most are rank C Jutsus. The reason is that the Jutsus that are rank B and above, drain a lot of chakra, and affect your ability to fight for long. He waited a few moments for the genins to understand. He continued, so, in the future, how good of a ninja you become will depend on how good you are at using the rank C Jutsus you have. He then looked at Miko and said, it isn't about the number of rank C Jutsus you know, but about how good you are at using them. He then looked at Fujin and said, Fujin, use your great breakthrough Jutsu on those trees. Fujin nodded, made the hand signs, and released his great breakthrough Jutsu. The Jutsu created a lot of winds, causing the branches to shake wildly, and a lot of leaves and twigs to fall down. The winds left deep cuts in most trees. After a minute, the winds died down. Fujin thought, alright, that's about 25% of my full power with this jutsu. Rinjiro said, good, now watch this. Rinjiro then made one hand sign, and then used great breakthrough jutsu himself. The power behind his jutsu was easily over 10 times of what Fujin had done. The winds went through a few trees. Three trees were uprooted. And even though the jutsu wasn't directed at them, Fujin, Hoka and Miko all felt those winds and had to hold on to the ground. Hoka and Miko were very shocked by what they saw. Whereas Fujin had only one thought, isn't this illegal deforestation? Someone call the cops and the media. Old man, Hashirama is no longer alive to just create more trees out of thin air. Miko asked enthusiastically, but how? Why is your jutsu so much stronger than Fujin's? Rinjiro replied, because I have mastered this jutsu to a greater degree than Fujin. Fujin rebuked internally, incorrect old man, you still had to use one hand sign. You just charge the jutsu with way more chakra than I did or can. Though I guess you were more efficient in chakra use. Rinjiro continued, and this wasn't my full power. Nor have I completely mastered this jutsu. Had it been Lord Hokage, then he could have leveled this whole forest with just this jutsu. Miko, Fujin and Hoka were very surprised and excited at that information. Or at least the other two were. Fujin sighed internally thinking, Hiruzen is a lot scarier here than in Naruto. I really wonder if Orochimaru will really be able to kill him or not. Satisfied with his students' reactions, Rinjiro said, So this is why, you need to focus on learning and mastering the proper rank C Jutsus. In the future, these Jutsus are what you'll be using the most. Of course, it doesn't mean that you should not learn higher rank Jutsus. The additional power they provide is very useful. However, if you don't have a good set of rank C Jutsus mastered, then you won't ever be able to become truly strong. Miko and Fujin nodded, but Hoka still looked a bit reluctant. Rinjiro looked at Hoka and said, Hoka, no matter how good you become at Tijutsu, you'll never become a strong ninja without mastering a few good rank C Jutsus. Hoka looked down and softly murmured, even without ninjutsu I can still become a very strong ninja. Rinjiro sighed and said, all right, we will have one spar between Fujin and you right now. Miko pouted as she wasn't involved in the spar. Rinjiro made Hoka and Fujin take their positions. While they were heading towards their position, Rinjiro secretly whispered to Fujin. Hoka and Fujin were facing each other, and were 10 meters apart. Rinjiro announced, you can use everything you know in this spar. Ninjutsu, Jinjutsu, Tijutsu and Kinjutsu are all allowed. But don't hurt each other fatally. Both kids nodded. Rinjiro announced, fight. As soon as he said that, Hoka activated his Byakugan and rushed forward as fast as he could to engage Fujin in close combat. However, Fujin just flickered away. On gaining sufficient distance, he prepared one wind explosion jutsu in each hand. On seeing that, Hoka stopped and quickly started using hand signs for rock shield jutsu. Fujin recognized the hand signs and threw one wind sphere on Hoka. That put a lot of pressure on Hoka, but he managed to create the rock shield in time. 
The wind sphere hit the rock shield and exploded, creating a lot of winds. Seeing that his jutsu worked, Hoka sighed in relief and put his guard down for a moment. That turned out to be a mistake, as Hoka's Byakugan saw wind sphere heading towards him from the left. He tried to jump away quickly, but the wind sphere exploded near him. The explosion created more winds, which hit Hoka while he was in the air. The winds threw him off course, causing him to fall badly. Hoka quickly got on his feet, only to see one more wind sphere headed straight towards him. This time, he didn't jump and instead tried running away. However, more and more wind spheres kept heading towards him. For the next 15 seconds, Hoka just kept dodging. The winds created by the explosion had created small scratches all over his body, and his clothes were in a very bad shape. Finally Hoka adjusted himself and began dodging the wind spheres properly. He used his Byakugan to see the wind spheres as soon as they were launched and dodged in the right directions. Fujin thought, excellent. The rate at which I'm creating the wind spheres is just one-fifth of what I'm truly capable of, while their power is one-third of their max power. Still he's struggling so badly. Oh well, time to end this farce I guess. Fujin halved the number of wind spheres he was throwing. This allowed Hoka to close the distance between him and Fujin. He thought, finally. He slowed down. Time to finish him with my gentle fist. When the distance between the two was just 10 meters, Fujin began moving backwards. Hoka thought, it'll be annoying if he creates the distance again and increased his speed. However, Fujin quickly made a few hand signs. Seeing Fujin making hand signs, Hoka tried to increase his speed further, however, he quickly realized and panicked. He quickly tried making hand signs for rock shield jutsu, but it was too late. Fujin, who was merely a few meters ahead of him, blew strong wind straight at him. The resultant winds blew Hoka back with force. Rinjiro, who was planning to jump in, noticed, I see. Fujin put a very low amount of chakra in the jutsu. And it seems like he also made it very mild. Had he used as much force as he displayed earlier, that jutsu could have maimed Hoka. The winds blew Hoka around 50 meters back. Though Fujin tried to limit its power, Hoka still got dragged along the ground, causing him a lot of scratches which bled. After the wind subsided, Fujin picked up a small pebble nearby and threw it at Hoka. As Fujin had expected, Hoka still got up and wanted to fight more. He noticed the pebble heading towards him and stepped aside. He was about to rush towards Fujin again, however, the pebble suddenly took a hard turn and headed straight at him. Hoka couldn't react, and the pebble hit him straight on his chest. It didn't cause any damage to Hoka, but Rinjiro announced, that's enough. Winner is Fujin. On hearing that, Hoka dropped to his knees dejectedly. Though he didn't want to admit it, he knew that if Fujin had used a shuriken instead of a pebble, he'd have been injured very badly. This loss hit him hard. Fujin expected it, and so did Rinjiro. During the four years of his academy, Hoka had never lost a fight to any of his classmates. In his second graduation exam, he even beat his seniors. However, this time he was defeated, and he never even had a chance. Looking at Hoka's crestfallen expression, Rinjiro sighed, well I expected this result, I didn't think it'd be so bad. He didn't even have a chance. He then looked at Fujin and thought, this kid though. Even though I asked him to maintain distance while fighting, I didn't expect him to do this well. He controlled the flow of the whole battle, and had Hoka moving exactly how he wanted. He even threw a sphere on Hoka's defense on purpose, just to get his guard down. There's a lot more to this kid than we thought. He, it makes me very interested in his future. Perhaps in the next great war, he might be an important figure. He then looked at Hoka and said, so, do you understand now why ninjutsu is important? Hoka looked up at his sensei. Rinjiro continued, your opponent used two rank D and one rank C jutsu. One was a movement jutsu and the other two were mid-range jutsu. Well you only used one defensive rank E jutsu. You specialize into jutsu, but you didn't even get a chance to engage your enemy into jutsu. Hoka nodded sadly. Rinjiro then put up a kind smile and said reassuringly, I know that you like to jutsu a lot. And I support your enthusiasm for it. But you need to know ninjutsu too in order to be able to use your tojutsu effectively. There hasn't been any ninja who has become strong by only focusing on tojutsu and neglecting everything else. While he was saying that, he secretly thought, though there was one ninja who could challenge what I said. Might die, he killed four swordsmen of the mist, and forced the remaining three to run away. 
Just like Minato was credited for our victory against Iwa, Dai can be credited for our victory over Kiri. They never dared to ever fight us again after that incident. Though, I would still stand by what I said to Hoka. Despite Dai being as strong as he was, he still struggled at completing normal missions. Not knowing any good Jinjutsu or Ninjutsu and just depending on Tijutsu is a bad idea. His son, despite preferring Tijutsu and mostly using it, does know a decent amount of Ninjutsu. But if his Tijutsu keeps advancing at the same rate, he might make what I said invalid. Hoka nodded his head and said with determination, yes and say. I will work hard on my ninjutsu too. Rinjiro kept his kind smile and sighed in relief internally, finally, I got another kid on the right track. I have to admit. The old man's tactics in handling kids are the best. No wonder he was able to train three sanins. Anyways, my team is finally set. He then looked at all three of his students and said, I hope all of you have realized the importance of rank C Jutsus by now. Fujin, Hoka and Miko nodded. Rinjiro continued, in terms of ninjutsu, your next focus will be on learning and mastering rank C Jutsus. Until I say otherwise, none of you will attempt to learn a rank B or higher jutsu. He then advised the kids more and ended the day by saying, this will be your today's assignment. Fujin, you and Miko will take Hoka to the village hospital and see that his wounds are tended to. And Fujin, meet me here at 2 p.m. He then flickered away. On the way to the hospital, Hoka was walking in an awkward manner. The morning training followed by getting several cuts took its toll. Seeing him wobble, Fujin said, sorry about that. Hoka replied, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Miko said, yeah, it's just a few cuts. Stop wobbling and walk faster. Hoka, however, replied with his usual stoic face, perhaps if I slept for over two hours during the morning workout, I might have been able to walk properly. Hearing that, Fujin chuckled, while Miko became very embarrassed. Fujin and Miko accompanied Hoka in the hospital. Hoka was asked to go to a ward. First a civilian doctor arrived and cleaned all his wounds up. Five minutes after the doctor left, a medical ninja arrived and healed all the cuts on him and advised him to take rest for the remaining day. Fujin observed the entire process and then looked at Miko with a hint of jealousy. He sighed thinking, if only I had the Sharingan. I'd have just copied mystical palm jutsu and been done with it. They then said farewell to each other and left. In the afternoon, Fujin visited the training grounds where Rinjiro trained him in the basics of samurai saber techniques. Next day again began with the same workout. At 10 a.m., Rinjiro said, Today, we will begin learning new jutsus. Hoka, you'll begin with rockthorn bed jutsu. Fujin, you'll start with wind dragon jutsu and Miko, you'll start with fire release, for jutsu. The kids nodded. Rinjiro then made a hand sign and prepared three shadow clones. Each of the shadow clones took a scroll from the main body and then took one genin. Hoka stayed at the same place, whereas Fujin and Miko were moved to a different location in the training ground. The clones then gave the scroll to the genins and asked them to read and start attempting the jutsu. As the kids began to learn them, the clone constantly kept a watch and gave tips and advice when they felt the need to. The training under Rinjiro continued in this manner. The morning workout remained the same. Whereas, in the 10 a.m. to noon session, Rinjiro alternated between training them in team formations and ninjutsu training. In the afternoons, Rinjiro trained Fujin with a sword. And from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., Fujin trained by himself. He either practiced the jutsu he was learning or fought against his shadow clones. Fujin found the training under Rinjiro to be very helpful. Even though Fujin was already able to perform a few jutsus without hand signs, getting tips from Rinjiro on the same helped him optimize it even further. Learning new jutsu became much easier too due to the tips Rinjiro gave. He learned the Wind Dragon Jutsu in a week, Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu in two days, Spinning Shield of Wind Jutsu in nine days, and Wind Instantaneous Body Jutsu in three days. The Rank C Jutsu provided some challenge for Fujin. Wind Dragon and Spinning Shield of Wind was difficult to learn. Wind Gale Wolf Jutsu however, was very easy to learn after having learned Wind Dragon Jutsu. Wind Instantaneous Body Jutsu too was very similar to Body Flicker Jutsu. Only, instead of depending on their own force, the user had to create a gust of wind and use it to move. Its range was larger than body flicker jutsu. Fujin was instantly able to move 300 meters away with the aid of this jutsu. 
Another advantage was that it didn't leave any traces behind for the enemy to track. While right now, Fujin could escape better by spamming body flicker jutsu, he was sure that once he mastered this jutsu, it'll be much better at escaping than body flicker jutsu. His sword skills too had improved drastically. He and Rinjiro decided on the length of the swords Fujin should get. It was 57 centimeters. After three weeks as a genin, Fujin received the two samurai swords he was promised. He was called to the Hokage's office along with Rinjiro and given the swords. Fujin did note the fact that Hiruzen took every opportunity he could in order to make the kids more loyal to Konoha. In the training grounds, he held the two swords. Even though he wasn't an expert in swords, he clearly felt that these two were much better in quality. On that day, Rinjiro began teaching Fujin chakra flow. Fujin, who already knew it, calmed himself and acted like it was the first time he was seeing it. He thought, I am not sure I can hide my skill from him. I guess I should just not do what I know and follow his instructions to the T. Luckily for Fujin, Rinjiro's methods to create chakra flow was much different from what he had tried. It was also much more suitable. So he just honestly tried that method. Due to the method being different, he struggled initially. However, once he got a hang of it, the remaining phase was extremely easy for him. In merely three days, he managed to flow his chakra through his new swords. He noticed, wow, this is so easy with this sword. Rinjiro on the other hand, was very shocked. He thought, the hell. He learned chakra flow in merely three days. Even assuming that he trained at home, he couldn't have trained for more than 15 hours. He tried to make sense of it, did he already know it? He tried analyzing, and concluded no, his struggle initially was very real. It's just that after he managed to do it a little bit, the rest became very easy for him. It's as if it was second nature to him. His analysis shocked him even further. He finally chuckled and thought, Master Mifune, it seems like I have picked up a student more talented than anyone in the land of iron. With that thought, he began laughing loudly, ha 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 that laugh did attract Fujin's attention. He thought, did he notice? No, that shouldn't be it. I guess it's my talent. Sigh, there was no other choice. Still, he doesn't need to laugh like a retard. Rinjiro noticed Fujin looking at him with a concerned look, as if he was wondering whether his sensei needed some medical attention. He said, don't worry about it kid. I just recalled an old geezer who was bragging about the talents in his village. Anyways, now that you have learned chakra flow, we'll work towards mastering it. The intensity of the training too will increase a lot. Fujin nodded. From that day onwards, Rinjiro became much more enthusiastic in teaching the samurai saber techniques to Fujin. That also meant that the training became much tougher. It almost became half as intense as the morning workout. Miko and Hoka too made a lot of progress. Miko learned all her jutsus within the first two weeks, whereas Hoka needed a month to learn his. Learning body flicker made Hoka a much better ninja. By the end of the month, Miko finally managed to get through the entire morning workout. As soon as she did that, Rinjiro asked her to start activating the training seal to 1% of its maximum capacity. Poor girl's joy at completing the workout quickly turned to horror. He had increased the pressure on Hoka's and Fujin's bodies too, by making them increase the pressure of their seals to 32% and 15% respectively. Apart from the personal improvements, the squad had also improved as a team. Within the first week, all the basic four-man and three-man formations were drilled into the trio. After that, Rinjiro began working on their teamwork and combination attacks. A lot of exercises and spars were conducted to improve teamwork. For combination attacks, Fujin and Miko were made to combine Wind Dragon and Fire Dragon Jutsus. It took a few days to learn, but the result was excellent. The Fire Dragon was enhanced by the Wind Dragon, nearly doubling its size. Its power was around four times the power of both the Jutsus individually. The dragon could shoot wind explosion Jutsu from its mouth, however, instead of normal winds, it was made of incredibly hot winds. On their first experiment, they nearly caused a forest fire. Luckily Rinjiro was closely monitoring this training, and quickly used waterfall Jutsu to douse the fire. Seeing that Fujin thought, isn't this very similar to Scorch style? I guess, only the power is lacking. Fujin looked at Renjiro and asked, Sensei, is it possible for only one ninja to perform this combination jutsu? And I mean without using clones. Miko was very intrigued by this question and paid attention. 
Rinjiro answered, yes, it is possible. You have to use both the nature transformations at the same time and release them together. One way to do it is by doing hand signs for fire dragon jutsu with one hand, and for wind dragon jutsu with the other. But don't worry about it for now. This is too advanced. You can't do it right now. This answer surprised Fujin. He quickly asked, but sensei, wouldn't using two elements at the same time be a keke genkai? How can anyone do that without having the bloodline? Renjiro answered, this ain't keke genkai. It's merely using two elements to complement each other. For example, the Yuki clan has ice release keke genkai. Ice release is a combination of water and wind. However, if you combine wind and water dragons, all you get is a water dragon that cuts very sharply. There is no sign whatsoever of any ice forming. Combination jutsus merely enhance each other, whereas Keke Genkai bring a qualitative change to create something very different. On hearing that answer, Fujin fell into his thoughts, I see. So it's possible to combine jutsus in this manner. I didn't know it was possible. This does open up more options for me. I guess I need to start training other elements too. Wind works great with both fire and water. I wonder if it's possible to make it work along with lightning too. Sadly, I don't think there's a lot of scope in using the wind element with earth. I wonder when I'll be ready to learn this though. Would showing off all my cards make him teach it to me? Though, not having hidden cards in a world as dangerous as this will suck. He asked, Sensei, when do you think I'll be ready for this? If I learn a second element now, would I be able to do this combination jutsu by myself? Rinjiro shook his head and said, don't think about this right now. Think about this only after you become a Jounin. Your skills in chakra control, chakra molding will need to improve a lot before you begin practicing this. The amount of chakra you have will also need to be much higher. So as I said earlier, for the time being, you'll only be mastering rank C Jutsus. Fujin nodded dejectedly. Miko too hung her head in disappointment on hearing this. One day, when the 10 a.m. session began, Rinjiro said, I have taught you one combination jutsu. And you can see how strong it is. I want you guys to think about more jutsus you can use in combination with each other. It doesn't have to be as strong as fire wind dragon jutsu, but it should increase your capabilities in some way. So think about it, but don't experiment. I'll meet you guys at 11, he then flickered away, without giving anyone a chance to say anything. Hoka said, so what do we do? Bujin, who had already thought a few over the past couple of weeks said, well let's just think about it. And then discuss to see if everyone is fine with the idea. Miko said, alright, after around 15 minutes, Miko said Hoka, can your water element mix with my fire element? Hoka asked in a confused manner, but how, won't my water douse your fire? Miko smirked and said, no it won't. Dish spit jutsu is the only one you have that can generate a small stream of water, and it is very weak compared to my jutsus. So my fire jutsu will evaporate all your water and create a lot of steam. Hoka fell into a thought after hearing it. Fujin was quite surprised with this suggestion. He thought, I didn't expect this brat to come up with something like this. He said, yeah, it'll generate a lot of steam, but can either of you control it? Both shook their heads. Fujin replied, in that case, that can only be used to create a cover and hide ourselves. Miko sighed dejectedly and began thinking again. After a couple of minutes, Fujin said, I have one idea. We can create a double-layered defense. My spinning shield of wind jutsu can stop and reflect all thrown weapons and some weaker ninjutsu. However, if the enemy uses strong ninjutsu, it'll be breached. So my idea is to create a shield of wind, and right after that, Hoka will create a rock shield behind the shield to cover us further. Hoka thought and nodded, yes, that could work. However Miko groaned and said, hey, don't leave me out. Fujin chuckled and said, actually I have one more idea. Hoka, can you use your rock shield jutsu? Hoka was confused and asked, but didn't sensei tell us to not test anything? Fujin replied, he said that to prevent us from causing an accident. Just using rock shield jutsu will be fine. Also, quickly move behind a few meters after using the jutsu. Hoka nodded and got up. He performed the jutsu and quickly jumped back. Fujin thought, not fast enough. He then said, alright, do it again. Only this time, I'll throw a small pebble on you. Dodge that by moving backwards. Hoka made the hand signs and slammed his hands on the ground. 
Fujin waited for the jutsu to be completed. As soon as it was completed, he threw the pebble on Hoka. Hoka quickly dodged back. Fujin nodded and said, alright, that's fast enough. Miko asked, so what's the big idea? Fujin replied, I'm thinking that both of us should learn this jutsu too. If we do, then as soon as Hoka uses the jutsu and jumps back, one of us can create another rock shield behind his and repeat the same. This way a multi-tiered defense can be made on the fly. Another idea is, if all three of us can channel our chakra in the same rock shield, then will the shield become sturdier or will it become larger? If that works, then it'll be very useful too. Both Hoka and Miko nodded and agreed. They began brainstorming once again and came up with a few more ideas. At 11 am, Rinjiro reappeared. He asked, so, what did you guys think of? Fujin started, we came up with an idea of a multi-tiered defense. The basic idea is for me to use spinning shield of wind jutsu and hoka, to use the rock shield jutsu, to create the rock shield behind my shield of wind. And we can create more tiers by having hoka move back as soon as he creates the jutsu, and then Miko could create another rock shield and repeat the same. Rinjiro was actually surprised by this idea and asked, what exactly are you planning to defend from? Miko and Hoka looked at Fujin, who replied, I'm a very strong jutsu. Renjiro rebuked him saying, if an enemy uses a jutsu so strong that you need to do this, then you are out of your league and need to retreat. Also it's never a good idea to have everyone in the squad defending. Also, rock shield jutsu isn't the strongest defensive jutsu. There are many more which can do a much better job. For now, the combination of spinning shield of wind jutsu and one rock shield jutsu is enough. However, if you and Miko want to learn rock shield jutsu, go for it. It's quite handy in combat. Fujin nodded and sighed internally, I guess too much defense isn't a good thing after all. He said, another idea we came up with is for Hoka to use stone shuriken jutsu, and for me to control them using projectile control jutsu. Rinjiro nodded and said, that should work. Anything else? This time Miko answered, Sensei, I came up with the idea of Fujin throwing his wind explosion jutsu within my fireball jutsu. So the range of the explosion of my fireball will be extended considerably. The winds caused by wind explosion jutsu's explosion will make the flames of fireball go in all the directions randomly. Rinjiro nodded again and said, that's a good idea. However, Fujin, you will have to make your wind explosion jutsu much stronger if you want to help Miko pull this off. Fujin nodded and said, yes sensei. Hoka suddenly said, sensei, I too came up with an idea. My idea is to throw stone shurikens within Fujin's great breakthrough jutsu and Miko's fireball jutsu. That way, more chaos can be created and the enemy will have to be careful of the stone shurikens within those jutsus too. Rinjiro replied, I see. I won't recommend throwing your stone shurikens within the fireball jutsu. If the enemy dodges the fireball, then your jutsu will be dodged too. And if the fireball jutsu hits the enemy, then it'll do sufficient damage by itself anyways. Hoka nodded. Seeing that none of the kids were speaking, Rinjiro asked, any more ideas? All the kids shook their heads. Rinjiro replied, all right, that's sufficient for now. Begin practicing these combination jutsus. Fujin, make a shadow clone, and have it practice the combination of stone shuriken jutsu and projectile control jutsu with Hoka. You and Miko will practice together. The genins dispersed according to the instructions of their sensei. Rinjiro too made a couple of shadow clones to keep a watch on them. Hoka and Fujin's clone weren't going to be an issue, however Fujin and Miko were sure to start a few fires. He had no doubts regarding that. Hoka and Fujin's shadow clone moved to a different spot. The clone moved to different trees and marked a large X on them. They looked at each other and nodded. Both made the hand signs. Hoka launched his stone shurikens towards the various XS Fujin had marked, and the clone tried to control those shurikens to hit the marks. However, the first problem, which Fujin knew, occurred. Hoka looked at Fujin and said, so you really can control only nine shurikens? Fujin nodded and said, yeah, just as I had said. And because these are stone shurikens and not as well made as a normal shuriken, controlling it is slightly more difficult. Anyways, let's try the second approach. Hoka nodded and launched stone shuriken jutsu again. This time, Fujin used projectile control jutsu to manipulate all the shurikens. He used it to change the direction of the shurikens towards the left. 
Oka observed, this time all the shurikens changed direction. However, only three hit the mark, unlike 16 last time. Fujin nodded and replied, yeah, if I try to control all the shurikens, I can only move them in one direction. So there's not much control on any one shuriken. In fact, it also messes up the aim you have taken. Suddenly Rinjiro's clone flickered behind Fujin and Hoka. One month of constant exposure to Rinjiro suddenly flickering behind them had made them accustomed to it. Rinjiro asked, so, which approach are you going to use, and in which scenario? Hoka, you answer first. Hoka began thinking. After a couple of minutes he said, the first approach will be more useful if the number of enemies is less. The enemy will first have to dodge my initial aim, and then worry about the shuriken's Fujin controls. The second method will be more useful when we are facing a lot of enemies. Sudden change in direction of all shurikens can result in a few casualties. Also, even if the enemy avoids it, they'll need to pay more attention to it, giving us more time. Rinjiro nodded and looked at Fujin. Fujin replied, same answer. Just that, I should try and improve my control even further. In the first scenario, the result will probably be satisfactory. However, the second scenario still has a lot of scope for improvement. For instance, if, after I change direction of the shurikens, if I can then take control of a few shurikens to manipulate them even further, then I am sure I'll get some hits in, and it won't be all just luck-based. Rinjiro said, good, so keep practicing. Over at Miko and Fujin, they too had begun their practice. Their practice was very straightforward. Miko launched fireball jutsu, and Fujin threw two wind spheres at them from the rear. The wind sphere distorted the flames a bit, but it wasn't an issue. However, before the fireball exploded, the wind spheres left the fireball from the front. The fireball exploded as it normally did. The wind spheres however exploded with a lot more force due to the air being heated up and caused a small heat wave. Miko spoke in an annoying manner, hey, your jutsu speed was too fast. Fujin countered, yours was too slow. This earned him a glare from the little girl. Fujin shrugged and said, let's try again. This time Fujin matched the timing properly and both the jutsus exploded at the same time when the wind spheres were still in the fireball. The result was a bit surprising. Miko said, the power of the explosion decreased. Fujin nodded and added, but its range increased. And the increase is totally random. In some directions, the flames extended twice more than usual, whereas in some directions, the range of flames was seven times as high as usual. Suddenly, a jet of water was launched to douse the fires caused by the explosion. Rinjiro's clone looked at them and said, we are changing the location. Follow me. Fujin and Miko ran behind the clone. On the way, the clone asked, so, what are your thoughts on this jutsu? Fujin replied, unpredictable. The enemy won't be able to guess the direction of the flames. If he gets careless, he'll end up with a few burns. Even if he is lucky or skilled enough to dodge them all, he'll be put under a lot of pressure. Miko agreed, yes. Once he gets burned, we can dominate him. Renjiro asked, any scope for improvement? Fujin and Miko began thinking. After a few seconds, Fujin replied, I am wondering whether the explosion's direction can be controlled. I think that the position of the wind spheres within the fireball is what controls the direction of the explosion. For example, if the wind spheres are to the front of the fireball, then maybe the flames move more in the forward direction. If I know the direction in which the enemy will dodge, I can place the wind spheres in an appropriate position so that the flames move to his new location. While Fujin was talking, Rinjiro stopped moving. They had arrived on a riverbank. Rinjiro thought, as expected. He replied, good. However, don't forget that even your wind explosion jutsu by itself is very random. So you won't be able to control the direction by yourself. He then looked at Miko and said, if you two want to improve this combination further, then it'll depend on how well you can analyze the explosion with your Sharingans, Miko. Miko nodded, yes sensei. I'll improve it to its limits. Rinjiro nodded and looked at the river. Fujin and Miko followed his line of sight. Rinjiro said, all your explosions must happen over that river. No more fires. Both nodded awkwardly and continued their training. Exactly one month had passed since Rinjiro had begun training his genins. After the morning workout and some rest, Rinjiro announced, today, we'll do our first mission as a team. The squad reacted as soon as they heard that. Hoka said loudly, finally. 
Miko too excitedly said, yes. Now I'll show what an Ichiha can do. Sensei, what'll be our first mission? Will we fight with any enemy villages? Like Kumo or Iwa? Hoka quickly followed up, yes sensei, what will our mission be? I want to use my Tejutsu to show how strong Konoha is to our enemies. Fujin looked at them and saw, whoa. Their eyes really are sparkling I need to learn how to do that. Fujin just maintained an excited expression, but didn't say anything. His teammates' reactions made him feel very awkward. He thought, if only they knew what our first mission will be. I wonder if all the adults have an unspoken truce to not mention this to any kid. Is it because they don't want to discourage anyone, or is it just the age-old human behavior I had to go through this, so I want you to go through it too? A, probably the second case. Just looking at Renjiro's smug face says it all. Renjiro thought, ah, it never gets old. Seeing fresh genin so enthusiastic about their first mission. Now, I wonder if that cat has gone missing again or not. He said, the mission will be given by Lord Hokage. So wait till we reach there to know which mission you'll be doing. They began moving towards the Hokage's office. Hoka and Miko ran at a lot faster pace than usual. On the way, Fujin thought, I didn't think we'd need to wait one whole month before taking our first mission. Such intense training for a whole month. I guess my timing of transmigration was really lucky. Having missed the third war in Kurama's attack, and growing at a time when Konoha is lacking in manpower. I hope that training under Rinjiro continues for a long time. Though it doesn't leave me with much free time, it has been very helpful in increasing my strength. The team arrived at the Hokage building, and had to wait a few minutes to enter the Hokage's office. On entering the office, everyone respectfully greeted Hirazan, Lord Hokage. Hirazan, like always, had multiple stacks of papers on his table. He looked at Team 3 and said, Oh, so you guys are finally doing your first mission. He stared at Renjiro while saying that. However, Renjiro just shrugged and ignored the stare. Here is inside internally thinking, he messed up all the protocols. No missions for his squad for a whole month. The only other instance like this was when Arachimaru didn't make his squad do any missions at all for six months. Well, at least he agreed to take a few rank D missions unlike my student. He then looked at his assistant and asked, so which missions do we have? His assistant pulled a paper out and handed it to him. Hirazan looked at it and said, Lady Saigo wants a squad to weed a garden. This will be your mission. He then smiled kindly and said, do the job properly. Ensure that she gives us good feedback and make Kanoha proud. Hirazan's words shocked Miko and Hoka. Hoka was muttering softly, we had a god dot dot retien. Miko too muttered something similar. Fujin was shocked too. However, it was for a different reason. He really admired Hirazan now. He thought, damn he said that with such a straight face and with such a kind smile. Screw Danzo, this old man here is the real evil incarnate. It's no wonder that despite being so scheming and commanding such a strong force, Danzo never could do anything to Hirazan. Poor guy never even had a chance. It almost makes me pity him. Rinjiro saw his genin's reactions and chuckled. He thought, it's a pity that the cat isn't missing right now. He grabbed the paper, saw the address and said, follow me. The Jennings followed him, however, this time Miko and Hoka were moving very slowly. On reaching the estate, Rinjiro asked the guard to call Lady Saigo. Fujin observed the estate. It was huge. Miko and Hoka didn't have much of a reaction as their clan estates were even larger. In a couple of minutes, a lady arrived. She was around 40 to 45 years old, 5 feet 9 inches tall, had long blonde hair, looked very mature, and carried herself in a proper manner. She greeted them, welcome Lord Rinjiro. It's a great honor to have you here. Rinjiro nodded and handed her the paper. She then looked at the kids and said, so these strong ninjas will complete my missions. I am very fortunate to get ninjas as capable as you. Miko and Hoka cheered up a bit on hearing the praise. However, Fujin could clearly understand that she was teasing them. He sighed internally, there is no need for this mission to be given to ninjas. The only reason why she did that is for her own amusement. Sigh, these rich old ladies need to get a better hobby. She said, follow me, I'll take you to the garden. Team Rinjiro followed her. They went behind the huge mansion. And soon, the three genins were shocked. Lady Saigo kindly said, this is the garden you have to weed. Fujin was speechless. He thought, garden. How the fuck is this a garden? 
Who the fuck has a garden that is more than an acre in area? Hoka muttered, this is a garden. Miko almost lashed out and yelled, how the hell is this a garden? This is. However, she was held in place by Rinjiro. Lady Saigo suddenly showed a sad face and said, I actually wanted it to be at least five acres. Sadly, that much land wasn't available in Kanoha. It, once again, left the genin speechless. Miko was pissed even further. Rinjiro just chuckled and said, that's enough talk. Get to work. The genins began walking forward. Miko softly asked Fujin, hey, can we use fire wind dragon jutsu? Hoka perked up on hearing that. Fujin, too, was very intrigued by that idea. Though he'd definitely not act upon it. However, Rinjiro heard that and announced loudly, no using any elemental ninjutsu. No using any tools. And increase the pressure of your training seals, Miko by 1%, Fujin by 2.5%, and Hoka by 5%. Miko hung her head and walked forward. Fujin said, let's divide the garden into three parts and clear each. Hoka and Miko reluctantly nodded and got to work. Their muscles still ached from the morning workout. And they still had more work to do under higher pressure. While they were working, Lady Saiho returned to the mansion. She entered a balcony that faced the garden, and asked her servants to arrange a chair, an umbrella and a few snacks for her and Rinjiro. She sat there monitoring the kids doing the work. That pissed the genins even more. Fujin muttered under his breath, first that Hiruzen and now this lady. The Tao of Shamelessness is very 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 strong in this world. Weeding the garden continued. Fujin got done with his part in an hour and half. He then returned to where Rinjiro was. While he was returning, both Hoka and Miko looked at him with angry gazes. He thought, should I help them out? After a few seconds he dismissed that thought, nope, there's no need to. He just ignored them and left the garden. He found a clean spot and sat down. Unfortunately for Fujin, Rinjiro flickered behind him and said, until they are done, run around this estate. I want at least one round per minute. That nearly triggered him, what the fuck. It ain't my fault that I did the work faster. Luckily, he held it in, put his head down and began running. Each round was over a kilometer long. After 15 minutes, Hoka joined him. Miko worked for another half an hour. Both Fujin and Hoka were sure that she was delaying on purpose, and sent her a few glares. When she was done, Fujin and Hoka stopped after completing that round and glared at Miko. Miko smirked thinking, serves you right for finishing before me. That smirk pissed Hoka, but Fujin just sighed and said, who would have thought that the mighty Achiha would need 2 hours and 15 minutes, to merely weed a garden. Hoka quickly nodded and agreed, yes, this was so unexpected. Is this what she meant by I'll show what an Achiha can do? That jibe made Miko go red with anger and embarrassment. She was about to reply angrily when Rinjiro stopped her. Lady Saigo stepped forward and said, thank you for clearing the weeds in my garden young ninjas. You guys did an amazing job. This earned her a glare from all the three genins, but she maintained her smile. She then handed Renjiro a paper, and they left her estate. They returned to the Hokage building. Renjiro led his genins to a room on the first floor. He handed the paper to an employee there. The employee checked the paper, stamped and filed it. He then gave Renjiro a white packet and they left the room. Renjiro then led them to another room. There were a few more employees working here. One of them was a Chuanin, while the others were just normal civilians. Rinjiro said, remember this room. In the future, if you ever want to take any missions, you can come here and ask the Chuanin who is in charge here. He will assign you your mission depending on your preference, past performance and ranks. The Genins nodded. They then moved to the ground floor. Rinjiro said, that's it for today. From now onwards, we'll be doing one mission every week. The remaining training continues as usual. Fujin, on the mission day, you won't have training in samurai saber techniques. Fujin nodded. Rinjiro then took out the white packet he had received earlier. He said, this is the reward for our mission. We'll be splitting it 40-20-20-20. 40% for me, and 20% for each one of you. When you do missions with others in the future, remember that this is how the rewards are usually split. The leader gets more than the other squad members. The Genins nodded, but all three had the same thought, but you didn't do any work at all sensei. However no one spoke it out loud. After splitting the rewards, the squad dispersed. On his way to Akiniku-Q, Fujin thought, hmm, 10 care reward for a 2 hours job. 
If I had made clones and worked with them instead of my teammates, I'd have finished faster. Not bad, but not as fast as earning money by selling scrolls. Either way, getting 2 care IO per week would be much better than the 1 care IO per month they provided me earlier. Though it won't be enough to allow me to make as big a purchase as I did earlier. I wonder if I should do a lot of rank D missions in a day or two sometime later to show that I've earned money via legitimate means. Or, should I come clean with my ability to create storage scrolls? He thought for a bit and decided, no, right now Rinjiro barely gives me any free time. If I say that I'll study Fuenjutsu in the evening, then that'll be considered suspicious or stupid. I should leave it till my training under Rinjiro is completed, or the training time is decreased. He is an elite Jounin after all. I don't think Kanoha can allow him to train three Jenins for very long. While thinking, he had already reached the restaurant. He went in and made the order. While waiting for the food to be delivered, he thought this world is pretty dangerous. While initially I was just being cautious, I'm now glad that I was so cautious and kept most of my abilities hidden. Even ignoring the crazy strong abilities so many here have, just the mere shamelessness of these people is alarming. Here is in saying what he said with a straight face, Rinjiro taking 40% of the reward, today's client sitting on the balcony to enjoy the misery of little kids. The Tao of shamelessness is crazy strong in this world. Their skins are thicker than the Hokage monuments. The same will also apply to the enemies. Sigh, I hope Abito and Nagato play according to the script. If they don't, then it'll be chaos. The meal arrived. Fujin picked up the meat with tongs and laid it on the charcoal brazier. Waiting for the meat to roast, he thought, well, no point in worrying about these things. There is nothing I can do about it anyways. Let's just hope for the best. Concluding his thoughts, he turned his focus on his lunch. The next day, after the morning workout, Rinjiro had another discussion with his team. He said, you have made good progress over the last month. So I'll now tell you how to progress further. The Genins nodded and listened attentively. Rinjiro looked at Miko and said, the Juts as you know currently are sufficient enough. So you don't need to learn any more ninjutsu. Just focus on mastering the ones you know currently. Especially fire release, for jutsu. In addition to ninjutsu, you also need to learn jinjutsu. So in your free time, ask your parents or clan elders to teach you more Sharingan-based jinjutsu. And keep working on your physique. You need to be able to complete the morning workout while enduring 10% pressure from your training seal. Miko nodded and said, yes sensei. I'll work hard. He then looked at Fujin and asked, have you decided on your second element? Fujin nodded and said, yes sensei, I have decided to choose earth as my second element. Rinjiro nodded and asked, any ideas on which jutsus you want to learn? Fujin replied, I've decided to learn rock shield jutsu, earth instantaneous body jutsu and earth holding jutsu. Rinjiro asked, why? Fujin replied, rock shield jutsu will provide me with a very good defense. Earth instantaneous body jutsu is a movement jutsu. And I can use earth holding jutsu to trap the enemies, or keep me and my squad on the ground. Rinjiro thought for a few seconds and said, rock shield jutsu will be good for you. But why do you want to learn earth instantaneous body jutsu? You already have two movement jutsus. Also, earth holding jutsu is very slow to actually trap anyone capable enough. So it isn't very useful. So why do you still want to learn it? Fujin replied, well there's no harm in learning more movement jutsus. Also, escaping through the ground will also provide a good defense as well as stealth. If the enemy isn't a sensor, it can also be used to sneak up on the enemy. As for earth holding jutsu, my main aim is to split the enemy's attention and have him keep an eye on the ground. Especially if I can do it without hand signs. I also wonder if I can suppress its chakra signature to perform it very stealthily. If I can trap the enemy momentarily, it'll be enough for us to incapacitate him. Rinjiro thought, hmm, nice thinking once again. Though learning a third movement jutsu is wasteful even with his explanation. Rinjiro nodded and said, alright then. Rock shield jutsu you can learn by yourself. The remaining two will be learned under my supervision. In addition to these, we'll work on mastering the jutsus you already know. Finally, Rinjiro looked at Hoka and said, Hoka, your current status in ninjutsu is much better than before we began the training. However, it's still not enough. Hoka nodded and paid attention. Rinjiro continued, you will learn four more earth release jutsus. 
they will be boulder throw jutsu, quicksand jutsu, stone spear jutsu and earth instantaneous body jutsu. Boulder throw is a mid-range offensive jutsu. Quicksand is a trapping jutsu. Stone spear is a mid-range jutsu, and earth instantaneous body is a movement jutsu. Hoka sighed and nodded. Rinjiro smiled and said, don't worry. These would be the only rank C jutsus, I'll force you to master. I will advise you to learn more in the future, however the decision is in your hands. Learning rank C water release jutsus will help you. In addition, once you have mastered these earth jutsus, you should learn two rank B earth release jutsus. The first is earth dragon jutsu, which will increase your capabilities in fighting a ranged battle. And earth wall jutsu, which is one of the best defensive jutsus in existence. They will complement your gentle fist style perfectly, and you can then focus entirely on your tojutsu. Hoka showed a look of determination and replied, yes sensei. I'll master these ninjutsu. Rinjiro continued, in addition to your ninjutsu and tojutsu training, we will also focus on your jinjutsu training. He wanted to continue, however, Hoka's expression was a sight to see after hearing that. Rinjiro chuckled and continued, whether you learn jinjutsu or not will be left for later. For now, I will teach you how to counter Jinjutsu. Rinjiro's chuckling and his gaze gained the attention of his students. Both Fujin and Miko looked at Hoka and had a laugh. The training under Rinjiro continued. Over the next six weeks, Fujin and Hoka had got all the Jutsus down and were practicing to master them. Fujin could now do all the newly learned rank C Jutsus with just one single hand seal. Rinjiro's instructions while learning Earth Release Jutsus were much better as compared to Wind Release Jutsus. He also had a more in-depth explanation regarding how chakra should be molded and how to do it faster. Due to this, Fujin's speed of learning Earth Release Rank C Jutsus was almost comparable to when he was learning Wind Release Jutsus. The practice of combination Jutsus too continued and they got much faster at performing them. For Jinjutsu, Rinjiro's clone started by casting rank D Jinjutsu on Hoka and Fujin. Within a couple of days, Fujin was able to break them. Rinjiro's clone then moved on to rank C Jinjutsu for him. He began breaking the rank C Jinjutsu in a couple of weeks and was currently working on breaking rank B Jinjutsu. Hoka needed a month before he could break rank D Jinjutsu. Fujin's swordplay too had come a long way. All the basics of samurai saber techniques were drilled into him by Rinjiro. They were now moving on to the more advanced maneuvers. Rinjiro had informed him that after he got these advanced forms down, he'll teach him the flying slashes. In these weeks, they had done six more rank D missions. It started with bathing the dogs in the Inuzuka kennels. Rinjiro pranked his genins by telling them that they would have to clean all the excrement in the kennels, causing Miko to flicker away, only to be caught by Rinjiro and carried over by the back of her neck. On hearing the real mission, the kid sighed in relief. The next one was finding the dreaded cat, who scratched Miko's face all over and bit Hoka a couple of times. Fujin now understood why everyone struggled so much to catch the cat. It was a freaking ninja cat and was a master in sneaking and using diversions. Even with that, the mission wouldn't have been challenging, however, Rinjiro added a condition. The genins weren't allowed to walk or run on the ground and were only allowed to run on the walls. If there weren't any walls, they had to create rock shields in order to create such a surface. It was followed by cleaning all the emergency shelters. Fujin figured that it was the village's way to make them remember all the shelters around Kanoha. After that, they had to deliver mail all over Kanoha to various clans and nobles. It was followed by babysitting a couple of Yamanaka kids. And lastly, they had to sow seeds in a farm. Observing his teammates, Fujin was sure that they were very close to completely triggering and making a scene. One difference Fujin noted was that after the first mission, the remaining missions weren't handed to them by Hiruzen. They were instead collected from the mission room on the first floor of the Hokage Tower. Fujin thought, didn't Hiruzen assign all the missions personally in Naruto? So why not for us? Or perhaps, why for them? He thought a bit and concluded, either he only assigns the first mission, or he assigned their missions due to their importance. Naruto was a Jinchiriki, Sasuke was the last Ichiha, as well as the Ichiha heir. And Team 8 and 10 were entirely made of heirs of important clans in Konoha. I guess he had to take responsibility in ensuring their safety. One day, after the morning workout, Miko asked Fujin and Hoka, Hey, I saw a few ninjas from other villages earlier. 
So the Chuanin exams will be conducted soon. Do you think that we will participate too? That gained the attention of both her teammates. Oka excitedly said, I hope we do. I would like to fight against the ninjas from other villages. Fujin thought, if I recall right, the squad needs to have completed eight missions before being eligible. I wonder if Rinjiro planned this way so that our team won't be eligible for the exam, and hence no one would pressurize him. Seeing Fujin in thought, Miko asked, what are you thinking about? Fujin replied, I heard that Chuanin exams have a lot of danger. So I really doubt they would allow us to participate so early. Miko angrily replied, hey. We are ready to take the risks. Hoka nodded and said, I agree. We are ninjas, how can we back down from a little risk? Fujin shook his head due to his teammates' naivety. He replied, yeah, but we are still only babysitting and cleaning dust. That statement downed their moods. Soon they went on a mini rant. And looked at Renjiro begrudgingly when he appeared, causing him to raise an eyebrow and ask, what happened? Miko and Hoka merely humped and looked in the other direction. Despite waiting for a few days, Rinjiro didn't inform them about the exam. The next day, Hoka informed his team, I heard that Teru and Yori will be participating in this exam. Fujin asked, oh, didn't they participate earlier? This time, Miko replied, no, Yori didn't participate in the earlier exams. Fujin nodded and said, I see, I guess we won't be participating in the exam until next year too. Right then Rinjiro appeared, and Miko quickly asked him, Sensei, can we participate in the Chuanin exam? Rinjiro shook his head and said, No, you guys aren't ready yet. Miko replied, Why? We are very ready Sensei. Rinjiro denied her again and said, I'll be the judge to decide that. No more questions. The next day, when they visited the mission room, the Chuanin in charge searched for a mission and said, Team Rinjiro, your next mission is to babysit the newborn of Lord. However, he was cut. Miko finally had enough. She yelled, hey you. Why the hell do you always give us such lame missions? Which ninja babysits kids? Get a nanny to do that. The Chuanin replied with authority, brat, you are just a. However, he was again cut, this time by Hoka. He commented with a stoic face, I agree with Miko. This is a mockery of our skills. Fujin observed Rinjiro's reactions and saw that he was chuckling. He thought, I guess we are finally moving on to rank C missions. Oh well, I might as well say something then. The Chuanin was pissed at being cut twice, he angrily began saying, now listen you brats. I'm ah. Poor guy was cut again. Fujin commented, you know mister, in the last mission we were very worried that Miko would burn the whole farm down. Even though Sensei can use water release Jutsus, it would have still caused a lot of damage. I am really worried what will happen if you make us babysit a little kid today. The Chuanin shuddered when he understood what Fujin was implying. Rinjiro was very amused too. He thought, well I was planning on making them do a few more rank D missions. But if they are able to win a debate against a Chuanin official, I won't mind starting to do rank C missions now. If Fujin knew that Rinjiro didn't plan on taking rank C missions just yet, he'd have kicked himself for opening his mouth. As boring as rank D missions were, they took very little time and left a lot more time for training, and didn't have any danger. The Chuanin was left speechless and didn't know how to reply. He opened his mouth a couple of times, but didn't manage to say anything. He looked at Renjiro, who nodded his head. He relented and said, alright, let me search for a rank C mission for you. When he moved to grab the rank C mission file, Rinjiro stated, just pick out a few bandit clearing missions in the vicinity of the village. Would be preferable if the bandit bases are near each other. The Chuanin nodded and searched his file. He soon took out four papers from the file and handed them to Rinjiro. Rinjiro read them. He then looked at his squad and said, we'll do our first rank C mission today. Meet me at the main gate in a couple of hours. Pack up for a week-long journey. The Genins nodded and dispersed. After leaving, Fujin went to his home and sat down in a meditative position. He thought, finally I am going out of this village. So what do I prepare? As per the protocol, the ration bars will be arranged by the squad leader. So food wouldn't be a concern. Though I suppose I should pack up the ration bars I have with me as well. Regarding the weapons, I still have the stock that the academy had provided us with. Though some of them are damaged. I guess I should buy 12 shurikens and 3 kunais. That'll cost me 7 kair io. I probably should buy a couple of explosion tags too. 
That'll be most of the money I earn from missions. Hmm. Yeah money, I need to carry all my money with me preferably. It can go in the spare waste bag. Of course I still carry the stock I had purchased earlier and always carry them with me. As for the swords, I guess they'll be hanging on my waist. Though I do have the wristbands, explaining where I got them will be troublesome. So I let them be in my spare waist bag. He then meditated for half an hour, and then got packed up to leave the house. On his right leg, he had a leg pouch. It had six shurikens and two kunais. In addition, it also had 48 shurikens, six normal kunais and six kunais with explosion tags attached to them in the seals in it. On his waist, he carried his waist bag. He had eight shurikens, three kunais and a small scroll in it. The scroll contained basic items like rope, tape, wire and first aid kit. The bag had seven storage seals on it. In one he had stored his spare waist bag and leg pouch. Another had his stock of ration bars. There was an additional first aid kit in one. The fourth seal stored a few bottles filled with drinking water in it. The remaining seals were left empty for now. He then visited a weapon shop to get the stuff he wanted to buy. After buying them, he visited Ichiraku for an early lunch. He then went to the main gate and sat on a branch of a nearby tree. Oka and Miko arrived around 15 minutes before the couple of hours were up. On arriving, they both spotted and approached Fujin. Fujin thought, wow, talk about being excited. Rinjiro arrived five minutes after them. Rinjiro asked, are you guys prepared? Everyone replied in sync, yes sensei. Rinjiro then grabbed three scrolls from his bag and tossed one to each of his students. They began wondering, what's in the scroll? Rinjiro said, this is a gift from me to you guys. Each scroll contains 100 shurikens, 24 kunais, 6 giant shurikens, 12 explosion tags, and 60 packets of ration bars that will expire after 12 months. Fujin, your scroll has a couple of spare swords too, though they ain't as good as your current swords. I don't know what protocols they taught you, however, this is the least you should always carry with yourself while leaving the village, irrespective of what you expect your team leader to carry. The kids were a bit shocked by this gift. Especially Fujin. His mind went blank for a second as he quickly calculated, 100 300 100 K 24 72 72 K 6 18 54 K 12 36 27 K. That's worth over 250 K Io. And that's without considering the swords and the ration bars. Was I wrong about him being shameless? Everyone quickly thanked Rinjiro for the gift. Rinjiro continued, though I have gifted this to you, from here onwards, you'll be responsible for maintaining this stock. So don't waste them, and refill them after you complete your mission. Of course don't be a miser with them. Your life and the mission is more important. All three kids nodded. They then left the village. Rinjiro said, our mission is to clear a few bandit bases around Shukuba town, which is northwest of Konoha. He then asked, do you have your training seals activated? All the three kids nodded. Rinjiro said, deactivate them. Never keep those training seals active outside Konoha. You never know who is out there to kill you, and those seals could become the reason for your death. Fujin and Miko nodded, but Hoka asked, but sensei, can't you just protect us from any such danger? It seems a waste to not train our body during this journey. Rinjiro shook his head and said, there are many ninjas who are stronger than me in this world. And there are numerous hidden jutsus. Even I can't protect you from every sneak attack. It'll be up to you to dodge or block them. Hoka nodded and deactivated his seal. Rinjiro said, with that out of the way, let's run. We'll move in a kite formation. Dujin, you take the lead, Miko on the right, Hoka on the left, and I'll take the rear. And move fast. Let's get there in a few hours. As soon as they received the instructions, they moved into the formation. Fujin stood ahead. Miko stood two meters to his left and behind. Hoka did the same, but on the right side. Rinjiro stood around six meters behind Fujin. The squad then began moving at a high speed, while maintaining those distances. By 3 p.m., the team reached Shukuba town. On entering the town, Rinjiro said, we'll do the mission tomorrow. For now, let's rest in an inn. The kids nodded and followed him. On the way Fujin noted, hmm, this town feels a bit familiar. But I don't recall where I saw it. Was it shown in Naruto? Sigh, I barely remember any scenery now. Rinjiro led the squad into the town. Fujin, Hoka and Miko noticed that the town had a lot of inns. 
they also noticed a couple of gambling houses and an area that had lots of games with prizes for winners. However, Fujin noted a peculiarity. He observed, every game here is based on luck. No game requires any skills. I guess it makes sense though. Making games like that is just asking to loot themselves in this ninja world. Finally Rinjiro entered an inn. Miko thought, finally. After skipping past 13 inns. When Rinjiro began chatting with the innkeeper, Fujin noticed, oh, he seems very familiar with the innkeeper. Is that why we skipped so many inns? After discussing with the innkeeper, Rinjiro approached the trio. He handed each of them a key and said, these will be your rooms. Stay in the inn. I'll scout out a bit and return in a couple of hours. After Rinjiro left, Miko asked, so, what should we do now? Fujin sighed and commented, I'd have liked to tour this town, sadly he asked us to stay in the inn. Hoka added, yeah, and we can't even train physically. Fujin said, let's just retire to our rooms and meditate. Tomorrow will be our first instance of real combat. Everyone nodded and retired to their rooms to meditate and rest. Rinjiro returned in the evening and took everyone out for dinner. Next day, 8 a.m. in the morning, the squad assembled outside Rinjiro's room and moved out. Their first target was located around 25 kilometers to the west of the town. After reaching there, Fujin sensed something. He said, Sensei, I can send six normal people around 400 meters ahead. Rinjiro nodded and said, there's a village in that direction. So it's probably the villagers. Our target is the bandits that are harassing that village. Rinjiro continued in that direction. Fujin soon noticed those six people he sensed were farming. They continued further and reached the village. On entering the village, Rinjiro asked around and then reached the village chief's house. The house was very old, and the man who opened the door was even older. As soon as the village chief saw the headbands, he respectfully invited everyone in and said, Welcome to our village lord. Rinjiro nodded and said, Just call me Rinjiro. He then handed a paper to the village chief. The village chief read the paper and became very happy. He bowed to Rinjiro and said, Thank you Lord Rinjiro for saving us from the bandits. After you deal with them, we can live peacefully once again. Rinjiro stated, I need more details about the bandits. The village chief nodded and replied, Please ask. I'll help you however I can. Rinjiro asked, Since when did the bandits begin harassing your village? The village chief answered, Around nine months back. Just before our harvest in the previous year. However, they became a lot more aggressive in the past couple of months. Rinjiro continued asking, I see. And what crimes have they committed? The village chief answered in a shaking voice, initially, they just stole our crops and money. But recently, th. Fujin could see the village chief tearing up at this point. He continued, they killed nine villagers and kidnapped six young girls. They eve he began sobbing and said, they even killed my son. And he began crying. Rinjiro was about to calm the old man down, however, the old village chief quickly controlled himself and showed a face of determination. Fujin was very surprised, he thought, admirable. To have this strong determination despite not being a ninja. Seeing the look of determination on the old man's face, even Rinjiro was impressed. He asked, how many bandits are there and from where do they attack you? The village chief replied, in their attack five days ago, there were over 15 bandits and they always approach us from the north. Rinjiro nodded and said, all right, thanks for giving us the information. Don't worry, we will deal with them. The village chief quickly thanked him. Rinjiro and the kids left the house. Miko asked Rinjiro, so what now sensei? Do we begin our search in the north? Rinjiro nodded and answered, yes Fujin then asked, but sensei, why will they attack from the direction their base is in? Won't they attack from a different direction just to confuse us? Rinjiro shook his head and replied, these are just common bandits. I doubt they have enough smarts to think about something like this. If they were smart enough, then they wouldn't have killed the villagers or kidnapped girls. They then moved towards the northern part of the village. They noticed that a few houses were burnt. Rinjiro commanded, Miko, use your Sharingan to see if you can find any tracks they left behind. Miko activated her Sharingan and began investigating. Soon she found a few tracks that were left behind. She said, Sensei, found them. Rinjiro nodded and said, good work. Lead the way. Kite formation, with Miko and the lead and me in the rear. Fujin, Hoka keep an eye on the surroundings and try to find those bandits. 
The squad followed Miko. On the way, Fujin noticed a few trees that had sword cuts on them. After traveling around 3.5 kilometers to the north, Fujin said, Hoka, check 500 meters to the northwest. Hoka activated his biakugan and soon said, Sensei, found them. Rinjiro nodded and the squad traveled in that direction. On reaching there, they saw that there was a small hill with a cave in it. On the entrance, there were two bandits guarding the entrance. Each had a sword with them. They were standing behind trees, so those bandits couldn't see them. Rinjiro sensed everything within the hill, and said, so which one of you wants to handle this? Fujin quickly replied, me sensei. Miko and Hoka, who were just about to reply, glared at Fujin. Rinjiro nodded and said, no clones. And our mission is to eliminate them all. Fujin began sensing once again. In all, he could sense 23 people within the cave, including the two guards. He then looked at Hoka and asked, Hoka, could you take a look to see if there are any traps? Also, what is the layout of the cave? Hoka nodded and activated his biakugan. After observing properly, he replied, in all, I see three traps. Two are behind the first entrance and the second entrance. They are basic arrow traps, which trigger when you step on the wire. The third is a small hole dug in front of the second entrance, and has spikes in it. As for the layout, there is another entrance inside this outer entrance. Then there is a big room, which has three more mini caves in it. Fujin replied, all right, thanks. And is there anyone who has tried to hide his chakra? Hoka shook his head, and Fujin thanked him. Fujin closed his eyes and calmed himself. He thought, finally the time for my first kill. He then took a deep breath and let it out. He made a few hand signs, and disappeared within the ground. On the entrance, the two bandits were very bored of keeping watch. One complained to the other, why do we have to stand guard here? I wish we could just go and attack the village again and capture a few more girls. The second bandit laughed in a lecherous manner and replied, yeah, the girls we captured a few days back were so fun. I can't wait to get my hand. However, his sentence was cut short. While he was talking, a sword appeared out of the ground and moved towards his waist, a sword enhanced by chakra flow. Before either of the bandits could notice, the sword cut through the waist of one bandit and split him in two. He died without even knowing how. The remaining bandit panicked. His arm subconsciously moved towards his sword. However, before he could even grab his sword, his head was separated from his body. After killing the two, Fujin again disappeared within the ground and entered the cave. The next two bandits were on guard in the space between the entrance to the hill and another entrance which was located inside the hill. They were standing with their backs to the wall and facing each other. Fujin moved through the hill and pierced one bandit straight through his heart. The bandit opposite saw a sword coming out of the chest of the bandit in front of him. However, before he could shout for everyone's attention, a shuriken came straight at him and went through his throat, killing him on the spot. Fujin moved through the ground again and avoided the hole the bandits had dug. He had now entered the main hideout of the bandits. He stealthily observed through a wall. He saw the three more mini caves that Hoka had mentioned. The place where he currently was, had 12 bandits there. The remaining 7 were in those 3 mini caves, which made him think, are they leaders or something? He then observed those 12 bandits carefully. 4 were sleeping in a corner. Do seemed to be working on something. One of them was looking at something intensely, whereas the other was sharpening his sword. The remaining 6 were drinking alcohol and playing cards. Fujin moved through the ground towards the bandit who was sharpening his sword. He appeared behind him and chopped his head off. Even before his head could fall on the ground, Fujin moved towards the bandit who was looking at a map. He stabbed a sword straight through his heart and pulled it out quickly. At this moment, the head and the sword of the earlier one dropped on the ground, creating a noise. This attracted the attention of the six who were drinking. Seeing the chopped head of their fellow bandit shocked and scared them. However, before they could make a move, Fujin had already flickered behind them. He quickly chopped two more heads off in one clean swing. He chopped another two beads off before they could even know what was happening. Only the last two bandits saw Fujin, however, they too were killed before they could do anything. Two of the six bandits had alcohol bottles in their hand, which crashed on the ground. The noise woke up two of the four sleeping bandits. One ignored the noise and just changed his sleeping position. The other, however, got up to see what was happening. However, even before he could completely open his eyes, his head was slashed off by Fujin. 
Quickly, Fujin also stabbed his sword in the throat of the guy who turned and followed by stabbing the hearts of the remaining two. He then disappeared in the ground again and entered one of the three mini caves. The first one had two bandits, who were quickly stabbed through their hearts. In the second cave, Fujin could sense three people. Fujin quickly moved in and stabbed the one who was resting along the wall through his heart. He quickly moved in to kill the second one who was laying on the ground. However, his sword stopped a few inches away from her chest. The one who was laying there was a teenage girl, who was nude, bruised and bleeding from a lot of places. He quickly shifted his attention to the other person in the room. The young girl's appearance had disturbed Fujin, causing him to pause for half a second. This gave the bandit an opportunity to grab his sword and charge towards Fujin. Fujin just raised his left sword to block his sword and stabbed his other sword through the bandit's heart. He decided to move in the remaining mini-cave, but he heard a loud shout. The last bandit yelled, bastards. Who is wasting my good wine? It though. However, his words stuck in his mouth when he saw the gore in his hideout. All he saw were chopped heads and the dead bodies of his bandits. He saw all the blood that was flowing on the ground. He was horrified and asked in a shaking voice, WH however, he never completed his question, as a sword pierced through his heart from his back. Fujin pulled his sword out and created a shadow clone. The clone went out to report to Rinjiro and to call him in. Whereas, he began cleaning the blood off his sword. Finally, while cleaning his sword, he looked up at the dead body lying in front of him, as well as the twelve dead bodies in the hideout. The sight and the stench caused him to vomit immediately. He thought, damn, as I thought, the first kill was a big deal. I didn't feel anything while I was in the midst of killing them. But now he vomited more and shivered at what he had done. As soon as he began vomiting, Rinjiro's shadow clone popped out of the ground and asked, are you fine? After Fujin was done vomiting, he nodded his head. He got up and sat in a corner. Rinjiro said, it's alright. The first kill is always difficult. In the future, you'll have to kill a lot more. Fujin nodded. Rinjiro said, close your eyes and calm yourself. Fujin listened to Rinjiro and closed his eyes and began clearing his mind. At that time, the clone reached Rinjiro and reported the success of the mission to him. Rinjiro then brought Hoka and Miko to the cave. When they reached the entrance, Miko and Hoka finally got a very clear view of the dead bodies and smelled the stench. Hoka resisted his urge to vomit, however, Miko couldn't and she vomited on the spot. Rinjiro saw that, however he didn't say anything. Rinjiro used Earth Spear Jutsu to disable all the traps and said, follow me. They followed him to the interior of the cave. Miko and Hoka tried their best to ignore the two dead bodies there. However, after entering the main hideout and seeing the twelve dead bodies and a few heads, they couldn't bear it. Miko vomited again and Hoka too vomited this time. Rinjiro waited for them and said, these are just dead bodies. People who were killed by someone else. How will you become a ninja if you can't even stop yourself from vomiting? How will you become a ninja if merely this sight makes you drop to your knees? Those words forced Miko and Hoka to toughen up and they stood up. Seeing that Rinjiro had calmed Hoka and Miko, his clone dispelled. Rinjiro then brought Miko and Hoka to the mini cave where Fujin was. Sensing them, Fujin got up and looked at them. Rinjiro was impressed with Fujin. He thought, excellent. To gather himself and calm down so quickly after his first kill. He then looked at Miko and Hoka, who looked determined and thought, these two should perform well too. Fujin said, Sensei, there's a girl in the cave besides this one. Rinjiro nodded and led his team there. The gruesome sight made the Genins wince their faces. The girl laid bare without any clothes. She was bleeding from her private parts. She had multiple sword cuts all over her body which were bleeding. On her left hand, two fingers were cut, and on her right leg, three toes were cut. There were even some burns on her. Even Rinjiro sighed at that sight, he thought, I didn't want them to see something like this so early. Rinjiro then said, Fujin, Hoka, wait outside this cave. Miko, apply her first aid. Fujin and Hoka left the cave, while Miko took out her first aid kit and began cleaning her wounds and applying bandages. Outside, Hoka asked Fujin, you alright? Fujin nodded and replied, I didn't think the first kill would be so hard to adjust to. Hoka sighed and said, I was warned repeatedly by my parents. There were a few ninjas who after their first kill, couldn't even continue as ninjas. He then looked at the dead bodies and stated, you are strong Fujin. 
Fujin smiled and said, thanks, but you should prepare yourself. Tomorrow, or the day after, it'll be your turn. Hoka nodded grimly. It took Miko around 25 minutes to fix the girl. Rinjiro then carried her out. He then looked at the girl and said to his students, ensure that you become very strong. So that such a misfortune doesn't befall you. The Genins could hear an uncharacteristic sadness in Rinjiro's voice. They all replied with determination, yes sensei. After leaving the cave, Rinjiro made a clone. The clone grabbed the two dead bodies outside the cave and tossed them inside. He then used earth wall jutsu to seal the entrance to the cave. Fujin asked, Sensei, don't we have to give any proof to the village chief about completing the mission? Rinjiro shook his head and said, not on rank C missions that require elimination of bandits. Proof is required for assassination missions. If the heads of the bandits are given to the village, then more bandits will target the village in the future. Rinjiro then said, let's go back to the village. On the way, Fujin asked, Sensei, have we eliminated all the bandits? What if there are any who weren't in this base? Rinjiro shook his head and said, doubtful. You can sense up to half a kilometer and still didn't find anyone. Even if there are one or two outside, seeing that their fellow bandits are dead, they won't cause any more trouble for the village. Anyways, we were told that there were over 15 bandits, and we killed 22. That's more than enough for completing our mission. However Miko argued back, but Sensei, in that case, won't the criminals roam free? What if they were responsible for torturing this girl? What if they joined some other bandits and continued doing this? Rinjiro replied, our mission was to eliminate the bandit group harassing the village. Anything further isn't our responsibility. However Miko wasn't convinced, and she glared at her sensei. Rinjiro sighed and said, just killing off an entire bandit group doesn't mean that more won't appear. In a couple of years, another group will be formed. This isn't something you or I can change. So searching for any bandit not in the hideout is pointless. If they join some other group, they'll die when we get the mission to eliminate that group. Miko was still unconvinced, but she stopped arguing. Fujin sighed internally thinking, no matter the world, the cruelty of humanity always exists. It's many times worse in this world than in my previous world. To torture and mutilate this girl for nothing but fun and amusement. I can't even imagine what they did to the other girls they kidnapped. He then glanced at Renjiro and thought, Kanoha. It is reputed to be a very peace-loving village. Led by a cage who propagates peace. Of course, anyone with little brains can see that Kanoha is nowhere near as peace-loving as it claims to be. The mere existence of Root throws that claim in the trash. However, there's no denying that it still is more peace-loving than the other four great villages. Still it engages in such a practice. While it's true that finding other bandits will be a pain in the ass, it still won't be very difficult. Now these bandits will form a bandit group in the future and become its leaders. In the future, they'll again target this village, and the village will again send a mission to Kanoha. This cycle will ensure that this village will always need Kanoha's help, and will always feel indebted to Kanoha. Similarly, every village in the Land of Fire will feel indebted to Kanoha. Thus, a pressure will be maintained on the daimyo to keep supporting and perhaps funding Kanoha. Such a simple way to maintain influence. It doesn't cost Kanoha anything, but costs dozens of lives to each of these villages. Sigh, if the most peace-loving village is so brutal and cruel, I wonder what a cruel village will be. He then let a breath of air out and thought, well whatever, it doesn't exactly concern me. They soon reached the village. On entering the village, the girl on Rinjiro's back got a few curious looks. The squad entered the village chief's house again and laid the girl down on a bed in his home. Rinjiro said, she needs immediate medical care. The village chief nodded and went out to send someone to call the village doctor. At that moment, a middle-aged man came running towards the village chief house. On seeing the village chief, he quickly asked while sobbing, Kai chief, M. my daughter. Is she? The village chief quickly calmed him and said, yes, she's safe. Enter my home. He quickly ran to the house and rushed to his daughter. On seeing him running, Rinjiro stopped him and said, she's injured, don't hug her or hold her tightly. The man finally stopped and sat down next to the bed and began sobbing after seeing the bandages on his daughter. Soon a doctor arrived and began attending to her. The father and the village chief thanked Rinjiro and the Genins again and again. 
After a few minutes, the village chief handed Rinjiro a paper, and the squad left the village and moved back to the town. After reaching the town, Rinjiro said, take today off. Explore this town. However, stick together. We'll meet in the same restaurant as yesterday's at 1 p.m. After he left, Hoka said, you know, because so much happened, I didn't notice that we completed the mission and returned back to this town in merely two hours. Miko nodded. Bujin sighed and said, yeah, and the actual fight didn't even last for a couple of minutes. Even though killing was hard to adjust to, the fight itself wasn't a challenge. Hearing that, Miko asked for all the details. Hoka had already seen it all with his Byakugan, so he didn't ask for it. After giving out the details, Miko felt a bit anticlimactic about the Rank C mission. Bujin chuckled and said, next time you snap at that guy, force him to give us a Rank B mission. Hearing that, Miko loudly replied, hey, who snapped? This yell attracted the attention of nearby people and made Miko go red with embarrassment. She thought for a bit and said, but yeah, I guess we should ask for Rank B missions. The kids then toured around the town. They tried some of the local food there and played a few games. At 1 p.m., they met up with Rinjiro in the restaurant. After occupying the seats, Rinjiro looked at Fujin and asked, so, how are you doing? Fujin said, I am doing fine sensei. Rinjiro nodded satisfactorily and said, good. You have handled your first kill very well. I am proud of you. He then looked at Miko and Hoka and said, next, it'll be your turn. Prepare yourselves. The two young ninjas nodded nervously. Lunch came and the team started eating. While they were eating, Miko suddenly asked, Sensei, when can we do rank B missions? Rinjiro squinted his eyes and asked, what brought this on? Miko said, we want to fight against the enemy ninjas. Just fighting bandits is not much fun. Rinjiro scoffed and said, HMPH. You guys ain't ready. However, he saw Miko's determined face. Knowing the trouble she'll cause, he quickly added, if you ask this again, or pester me for rank B missions, I'll make you do rank D missions for an entire year. This threat made Miko quiet down quickly. Team Rinjiro didn't do much for the rest of the day. The next morning, a similar procedure was followed. Team Rinjiro was hiding in a bamboo forest while looking at the bandit hideout. The bandits had cleared out a small area and constructed three small huts and one medium-sized hut to serve as their base. The medium-sized hut was in the center, while the other three were around it. Fujin had sensed 12 people inside those huts. Rinjiro asked, so, who wants this one? Miko beat Hoka by saying, me. Rinjiro nodded and said, all right, we'll leave this hideout to you. Miko began walking forward stealthily. But soon she stopped and returned. She looked at Hoka and asked, Hoka, do they have any hostages? Hoka checked and answered, no, all 12 seem to be bandits. Miko asked, how many are there in each of the huts? Hoka answered, there are nine in the central hut, two in that hut, one in the hut on the right, and the last one is empty. Miko nodded and used earth military movement jutsu to stealthily move forward. She stopped five meters away from the hut which had two bandits and appeared out of the ground. The bigger hut was exactly behind the small hut from where she was standing. She quickly made the hand signs, fireball jutsu. The fireball quickly moved through the smaller hut. As soon as it moved through it, two people screamed loudly. Since the fireball didn't explode, it just burnt them and didn't kill them right away. The fireball moved through the smaller hut to the bigger hut. It exploded right at the center of the bigger hut. The explosion completely demolished the hut. Fujin saw four bodies being thrown out due to the explosion. The explosion killed seven bandits on the spot. Two bandits, who were thrown out, were still alive and were screaming due to being on fire. The status of the two bandits in the smaller hut was the same. Due to the huts being made of bamboo and leaves, they offered no resistance to the fireball. Hearing the screams, the last remaining bandit got out of his hut, only to see two huts on fire. He looked around and saw one of his fellow bandits burning and screaming. The view horrified him. Before he could decide to do anything, Miko flickered behind him and used fire release, for Jutsu to produce a heat ray that stabbed him through the heart and killed him. Now that all the bandits were killed or incapacitated, Miko looked around her. She saw the dead bodies on fire. She could smell the flesh burning and hear the dying screams from three bandits. That scene immediately made her vomit. Rinjiro quickly appeared behind her and consoled her. 
Fujin, having already killed, was able to look at this scene without much struggle. Oka however, struggled due to the smell and the screams. Soon the screams died down and all the bandits were dead. After giving Miko a few minutes to adjust, Team Rinjiro retreated from there. Before leaving, Rinjiro buried the whole place underground using an earth release jutsu. The next day, Team Rinjiro again repeated a similar mission. This time, the mission was to arrest the bandits. Oka completed it by knocking out all the bandits and tying them up. However, Rinjiro made Hoka kill two bandits, so that he could get his first kill too. Rinjiro gave the squad off on the fourth day. On the fifth morning, Rinjiro said, today will be our last mission. You three have done well. Let's move out. On the way he said, today's bandit hideout will be much bigger. So you will have to cooperate with each other. The Genins nodded in agreement. Continuous drills for two and a half months had made their teamwork very good. And being there for each other when they made their first kill, had brought them much closer. So working together wasn't an issue for any of them. On reaching the hideout, the Genins noticed that the entire hideout was actually underground. Fujin scanned the entire base. He said, there are 63 people I can sense. He then looked at Renjiro and said, and five have higher chakra levels. Though they are only Genin level. Rinjiro nodded, whereas Miko exclaimed cheerfully, yes, finally we will fight ninjas. Fujin asked, but sensei, aren't missions that involve ninjas ranked B? Rinjiro nodded his head and replied, yeah, but they are only genin level. There are many cases of people outside the hidden villages unlocking their chakra and reaching genin level by themselves. There are also many cases of genins defecting from the village. Anyways, they are barely ninjas, and many times rank C missions include dealing with them too. So be careful. After all, there are over a hundred thousand ninjas in the world, so who knows where one can be. The Genins nodded. Fujin thought, hmm, this is unexpected. Though it makes sense I guess. If the village begins ranking missions as rank B for only a chance of having to deal with a rogue genin, then rank C missions will probably not exist at all. The team began by first mapping the base. The base was quite big. There was one big room at the center of the hideout. Fujin suggested, let's call it the main room. There were three exits to the main room, all almost equidistant from each other. These exits were connected to one big corridor that surrounded the entire main room. On the other side of the passageway, were many smaller rooms. Oka commented, I guess they use the main room as a common room for planning, celebration, etc., while the smaller rooms are their personal rooms. There were a lot of traps all over the base, which were spotted by Hoka. Of the five ninjas, three were together in the main room, while the other two were in the smaller rooms. Miko said, hmm, both the ninjas in the smaller rooms, have their rooms very close to that exit from the main base. Fujin nodded and said, yeah, we will have to be careful while killing them. If they make a lot of sound, it'll alert everyone in the main room. The bandits too were all over the base. In all, there were four exits from the hideout to above the ground. One was located in the main room, while three were just outside the exits from the main room to the corridor. Fujin thought, this base is very well built. I wonder if it started with something small and was slowly expanded as the bandit group grew larger. Or, if the base is something that naturally existed and was just occupied by these bandits. Also, if we didn't destroy those bandit groups, would they have grown in this manner too? Fujin looked at his teammates and said, so first, we have to decide from where to attack them. Miko replied, let's just attack the main room. Most bandits are present there. Oka nodded and added, yeah, this way we'll deal with the majority of them in one blow, and we can then pick out the scattered bandits one by one. Fujin replied, yeah, good idea. But if we do that, then the scattered bandits can try to escape. Hoka replied, yeah, but we can just chase and kill them. Fujin replied, but it'll be very troublesome to hunt them all down one by one. Especially if all of them run in different directions. Also, by destroying the main room, the bandits and all the other rooms will be alerted, and the ninjas will be alerted too. Hoka thought a bit and nodded in agreement. Miko asked, then, what do you think? Fujin pointed in a direction and said, that room there is at one edge of the hideout. And also has one of the five ninjas there. Let's start with that room. We will sneak up on the ninja and kill him. Then we will clear the nearby rooms and slowly and stealthily head to the main room. This way, this direction will already be cleared when we destroy the main room. So killing them all will be much easier. 
Miko and Hoka thought for a few seconds and agreed with the plan. The Genins then discussed the plan further and decided on the details. Once everything was planned, they checked their weapons and were about to begin their attack. But Miko suddenly asked, wait, who will kill the ninja? Hoka quickly replied, I'll kill him. Miko rebuked him, why you? I will kill the ninja. They then looked at Fujin. He said, my sword provides me with a longer range, I think I'll be more suited to killing him. However neither Hoka nor Miko agreed to that logic. The argument about the kill went on for a minute. Rinjiro observed his genins and sighed. Fujin then said, well, all three of us can kill him. So let's just decide with rock, paper, scissors. On hearing that, both Hoka and Miko looked at Fujin with a deadpan expression. Miko said, that's so childish. We are ninjas. Fujin scoffed and asked, well, do you two have any better ideas? Hoka and Miko looked at each other. Not having any other idea, they reluctantly agreed. They soon got in the posture to play the game and began playing. Rinjiro now looked over with amusement. The first three rounds were tied. Fujin thought, this is fun. I guess that's why Goku and Vegeta did this so often. Miko thought, I am not sure if I'll why. Wait. As the trio began the fourth round, Miko's eyes suddenly turned red. She saw that both Fujin and Hoka were about to do rock, so she went with paper. And said, I win. Hoka quickly protested, hey, no Sharingan. That's cheating. Miko rebuked him, well, there were no rules stating that we couldn't use Sharingans. Fujin, who just wanted to start the mission, chuckled and said, well she got us there. Remember to set the rules properly next time. Seeing that he didn't have Fujin's support, Hoka reluctantly agreed. They then looked at each other and nodded. All three made hand signs and disappeared within the ground. The bandit base, which was properly hidden and even well defended due to being underground, was about to feel the terror of being hunted by a squad, in which every member could freely move underground. In the hideout, Hirotomasa was relaxing. He had joined the bandit group three years ago. He had already unlocked his chakra before joining the bandit group. When the leader of the bandits noticed him, he quickly recruited and trained him. Now he was one of the leaders of this group and even had two subordinates who helped him in everything. As Hirodo Masa was relaxing in a good mood, a hand, with two fingers pointing out, popped from the ground. It headed towards his chest from his back and released a heat ray that penetrated his heart and killed him on the spot. At the same time, Fujin slashed the head off one bandit and Hoka jabbed two fingers in the chest of the remaining bandit. The raid had begun. All three bandits died, without even making a sound. Fujin, Hoka and Miko looked at each other and nodded. They separated and headed towards the other rooms. In less than a minute, the rooms on this side were all cleared. They had assassinated 16 bandits, including a ninja. They gathered together again and looked in the main room. The bandits there were still unaware of the calamity upon them. As decided, Fujin and Miko split off in opposite directions and began clearing the remaining rooms. Hoka, on the other hand, stayed there and rigged the entrance to the main room with traps so that the bandits couldn't escape in this direction. He created quicksand at the entrances and also created a lot of rock spikes around the quicksand trap. The second ninja bandit was closer to Miko's location than Fujin's location. Therefore, she was the first one to reach him after she had killed six more bandits. Even though Miko was as stealthy as she could be, the ninja still noticed that something was amiss and asked his two subordinates to be prepared. As soon as he saw Miko, who was rushing towards him at a very high speed, he threw a few shurikens to disrupt her. Seeing her enemy throwing shurikens at her, Miko thought, damn, they noticed. Miko used her shuringan to skillfully dodge the shurikens and thought, oh well, this makes it more fun. She quickly approached him. To maintain the stealth, she couldn't use any destructive fire release jutsus and had to close the distance to use fire release for jutsu. She soon reached the appropriate distance and used her jutsu. Her right hand was stretched out with her middle and index finger pointing towards the rogue ninja's heart and released the ray. Though the rogue ninja didn't know the jutsu Miko was planning to use, her outstretched fingers warned him and he quickly moved backwards. Miko followed, but the ninja hid behind one of his subordinates. Miko screamed internally, coward. And changed her target. She focused the heat ray on the subordinate and killed him. However, the rogue ninja used this opportunity to throw three shurikens on Miko. Miko had to dodge quickly due to the small distance. She barely managed to dodge at the last moment. 
She recovered, and was about to continue her attack, when a sword pierced through the heart of the ninja from his back. This annoyed Miko as Fujin had stolen her kill. She said angrily, I could have killed him by my eyes, but a loud scream interrupted her. Seeing his boss getting stabbed through his heart shocked the remaining bandit. And he yelled in terror. Realizing her mistake, Miko quickly threw a kunai at the bandit and killed him. Fujin ignored Miko and focused on the main room. The battle had already created enough noise to attract some attention. And the loud scream had got the attention of all the bandits in the hideout. Fujin sighed and said, you weren't stealthy enough. Miko snorted and replied, well, it doesn't matter anymore. She began making hand signs. Fujin flickered next to her and made a hand sign too. At the same time, they released their jutsu fire wind dragon jutsu. In the main room, the bandits were busy with sorting their recent loot. Some of the bandits had heard some noises from the side where Miko was killing the bandits. However it was mostly ignored by them. But soon, a loud scream attracted everyone's attention. The three remaining rogue ninjas too were on alert. One of them directed two bandits to go in and check what was happening. Those two carefully moved towards the exit in that direction. However, right before reaching there, they suddenly felt a lot of heat. But before they could do anything, a dragon head, made of fire, entered the room and engulfed them. They immediately began screaming in pain. The dragon quickly entered the room completely. The sight of a dragon made of fire scared the bandits stiff. The dragon began spitting wind explosion jutsus all over the room. Seeing that, one bandit quickly made hand signs and slammed his hands on the ground, causing a rock shield to be created in front of him. Some of the nearby bandits quickly ran behind that shield. The wind explosion jutsus hit seven bandits head on. The winds created by the explosion slashed the throats of two bandits, killing them on spot. However, they were much luckier than the ones who didn't die. For the remaining five, the winds created small cuts all over their bodies. As it was a combination jutsu, the wind was incredibly hot. So, along with the cuts, it also caused low-level burns on those bandits. And it was incredibly painful when their cuts were exposed to that hot air. One of those five bandits was even more unlucky as he didn't shut his eyes. It resulted in a lot of hot air bombarding his eyes, causing them to burn up. So though the jutsu didn't kill them, they were scarred and in immense pain. Even the bandits nearby were harmed by the hot wind slashes. However, they could still fight or run. The attack caused panic among the bandits. Three bandits quickly tried to escape out of the base. They rushed towards the ladder and began climbing it. Unfortunately for them, Hoka was standing just above the exit. Hoka waited for all three bandits to be on the ladder, and then made a few hand signs, stone spear jutsu. From the walls around the ladder, dozens of spears began appearing. They stabbed all the three bandits on the ladder, killing them on spot. It also blocked the access to the ladder for the remaining bandits. Two bandits ran towards the area which was cleared by Fujin earlier. On sensing the bandits running in that direction, Fujin made a hand sign and waited. As soon as the bandits exited the main room, Fujin exploded the explosion tag he had planted there. That caused the rocks from the ceiling to fall down and crush those bandits. It also sealed that exit. Five bandits ran towards the room where Hiroto Masa was supposed to be. However, as soon as they exited the main room, they fell straight into the quicksand trap. The quicksand Hoka had created had a depth of 4 meters and had covered the entire entrance. All five bandits were trapped there and were slowly sinking in. Eleven bandits were hiding behind the rock shield created by their leader, and eight were still trying to escape in the directions of their fellow bandits. However, they stopped in their tracks after seeing what happened to them. Fujin used this opportunity to make the dragon bombard them with three wind explosion jutsus, injuring all eight of them to a certain degree. The dragon then circled around to get a clear shot at the bandits hiding behind the rock. The leader quickly made another rock shield. Sadly for him, Fujin and Miko had anticipated it. Instead of bombarding, the dragon circled around more and launched two wind explosion jutsus in such a manner that they couldn't escape from there. They were surrounded by the rock shields on two sides, and wind explosion juts us on the remaining two sides. Only the three ninjas managed to jump and move to the other side of the rock shields. The remaining bandits were trapped and took minor injuries. The dragon then moved forward and engulfed all of those bandits. It set all eight of the bandits on fire, but also caused the fire wind dragon to dissipate. 
This assault had incapacitated all the bandits in the hideout, with the exception of the three ninjas. Two among them were novices with no actual experience beyond their banditry. Only the leader had a bit of experience as he was once a genin in the Kusagakur. He had noticed that the Jutsu was about to dissipate and said, hurry and follow me. He led the remaining two to the entrance from where the dragon had come in. However, on entering, he didn't see anyone there. Instead he saw the dead body of his fellow bandits and one of his ninjas. Seeing him dead alarmed him and he became much more cautious. He said, be careful, they might still be around. Let's look for them Toad suddenly he jumped up and looked below. The ground had moved and wanted to trap his feet in it. Even though he dodged, Fujin smirked underground, got them. He had trapped the other two bandits. Miko saw that and appeared at the entrance. She quickly made hand signs, fireball jutsu. The trapped bandits couldn't dodge and were caught in the explosion. Only the leader managed to dodge. He saw his last two bandits burning with disbelief, it's all over I need to escape. He quickly began running away. However, Fujin stealthily launched a shuriken enhanced with chakra flow at his left leg. Distracted by fear and the urgency to escape, the bandit leader didn't notice it. The shuriken hit his left leg from behind and cut through it like a hot knife through butter. Suddenly losing his left leg made him fall down and cry in pain. Fujin then used body flicker jutsu to appear right above him and stab a sword through his heart. The bandit leader died with despair on his face. Fujin looked at Miko and said, looks like this is over. Miko asked, aren't there a few still alive back in the main room? Fujin chuckled and said, not anymore and began walking towards the main room. Miko followed him. In the main room, Hoka had already killed all the bandits who were still alive from the Fire Wind Dragon's assault. At that moment, Rinjiro too appeared within the main room. He thought, not bad, they killed every last one of them. And they have adjusted to killing well. He said, good work. This mission is successfully completed. He then looked at his team and said, it's good to see you guys being able to handle the killing very well. The kids nodded. Even though they were still repulsed by the gore around them, they could handle themselves without vomiting. Rinjiro then led his team out of the hideout. He then made the hand seal for an earth release jutsu. Fujin quickly stopped him by asking, Sensei, isn't it a waste to destroy such a good base? The sudden question stopped Rinjiro from destroying the underground base. He asked, what do you mean? Fujin replied, can't we use this base for our own ninjas? Rinjiro asked, and how will our ninjas use this base? Fujin thought for a few seconds and replied, well, they could use it as a base during war. Or they could use it as a temporary resting place, or perhaps create an underground supply depot. Rinjiro shook his head and said, the closest hidden village from here is Kusa. And they are allied with us. Even if they weren't, they can't penetrate this deep into the fire country. If there is any threat, then it'll be Iowa which is beyond Kusa. However, if they are able to penetrate this deep into the land of fire, then that base will be useless anyways, as the majority of the Iwa ninjas are masters of earth release jutsus. They'll just bury all the troops underground. As for supply depots and resting places, there are already sufficient numbers of them. So it is unnecessary too. Bujin fell in thoughts and realized, yeah, that makes sense. Kanoha has been around for decades. Surely their infrastructure would be top-notch by now and surely they'd have identified all the bases over the land of fire. He then nodded to Rinjiro, who destroyed the entire hideout. On the way back to the town, Miko asked, Sensei, were they really ninjas? Only one of them used any ninjutsu, and even that was only a ranky jutsu. They couldn't put up a fight at all. Rinjiro answered, they were just common bandits who had unlocked chakra by accident or luck. Only their leader was probably a former ninja gone rogue. However, he too barely had any proper training. So it wasn't a surprise that he wasn't a match for you guys, who are being trained by me. Hoka asked in excitement, Sensei, aren't there bounties on rogue ninjas? Rinjiro shook his head and replied, only if they are very famous. Someone who barely qualifies as a genin won't have any bounty at all. That drowned Hoka's excitement. He continued following the squad with his shoulders dropped. Miko, who was still stuck on how weak her enemies were, asked, Sensei, when can we fight real ninjas then? Rinjiro turned his head and stared at her. He thought, nice way of indirectly asking me for rank B missions. On noticing that Rinjiro had noticed her thoughts, Miko was embarrassed. But she didn't allow that embarrassment to appear on her face. 
Fujin noticed that and thought, damn, these ninjas are born shameless. Rinjiro smirked and answered, after you have captured that cat a hundred times. That answer drained the color off Miko's face. Hoka glared at her. Well Fujin chuckled thinking, I guess no one can compete with the older generation in shamelessness. Miko then began apologizing to Rinjiro and began a funny banter. Sadly for her, she was no match for Rinjiro. Team Rinjiro rested in the town for the day. Next morning, they left the town to return to Kanoha. On arriving, they went to the Hokage Tower to turn in the missions. Rinjiro handed the papers to the Chuanin responsible for checking them. After checking, he handed four packets to Rinjiro. The four missions combined paid them 280k. After Rinjiro divided them, each of the three kids got 56k Fujin thought, 280k just for these missions. I'm pretty sure I could have completed them solo and in under a day. It's much faster than Fuinjutsu. Though it has some risks, if a strong ninja is hiding among the bandits. Anyways, I should be able to collect enough for a sword made from chakra metal pretty quickly if I take a lot of missions. Unlike Fujin, Miko and Hoka didn't concern themselves much with the money. Thanks to having rather rich parents, they never had to worry or think about money. After the division of money, Rinjiro dismissed them and said, tomorrow there won't be any training. We begin our training the day after tomorrow at the same time as usual. The kids nodded and dispersed. Since it was lunch time, Fujin decided to head to Ichiraku. On the way, Fujin thought, 7 rank D missions and 4 rank C missions. Isn't the requirement for Chuan an exam just 8 missions? I wonder when Rinjiro will make us take the exam. Will it be the next round, or will it be like Teru's squad? Thinking about Teru created new thoughts in Fujin's mind, yeah, isn't Teru's squad participating in the Chuanin exam? I wonder what has happened with that. Did the Chuanin exams already start, or is there still some time? This question resulted in Fujin realizing something very critical. He thought, now that I think about it, I am really clueless in regards to what is happening around me. Other than what I remember about what will happen in the future, I have no idea about what is exactly happening. I need some means of gathering information. But, how to do it? He thought for a bit and decided, well, the least I should do is start getting newspapers delivered to my home. Though it won't contain any crucial information, it'll still keep me updated. Apart from that, I should probably make my own information gathering network. While I don't think I'd be able to make something as complex as what Jureya has, I don't really need it to be that good either. Just getting unfiltered and timely news would be sufficient. Oh well, I'll leave this for the future too. It'll take a lot of effort, time and money to actually create it. Right now, I barely have any money or free time and knew his thoughts were cut by a loud shout. He heard, old man. Three miso Raymonds for me. Fujin turned right and noticed, A, hey, Naruto. I didn't even notice reaching Ichiraku. But considering that Naruto is here Fujin then focused on sensing his surroundings. After sensing, he thought, as I thought. Two Anbus are hiding nearby. Or perhaps one Anbu and one Root. I doubt Danzo wouldn't keep his eye on the lone Jinchiriki of Kanoha. He then released a sigh and thought, well, as much as I'd like to meet him now, it'll probably create a lot of deviations in the future. Not to mention that it'll also gain the attention of both Hiruzen and Danzo. I leave this meeting for the future. At least until the time I can calculate and control those deviations. And until I'm strong enough to at least face these two Anbus in case they have some stupid ideas. Sigh, this means I'll have to go to a different restaurant. Fujin then moved in the direction of a nearby sushi restaurant. After lunch, he searched for a newspaper stand near his house and bought a subscription. With the rank C missions completed, Team Rinjiro got back to their training. A week's rest suddenly made the morning workout seem much more difficult. When Rinjiro returned after the team's break was over, Miko asked, Sensei, when can we go on the next mission? Hoka looked over with interest. Rinjiro replied casually, Rank C missions take a lot longer time than Rank D missions. So we'll only do one monthly. Rest of the time will be focused on your training. Miko's shoulders slumped on hearing that. It meant that there was no escape from this deadly training. At the same time as Fujin and his teammates were training, two Genin squads faced each other deep within a forest. Both squads consisted of three boys. However, one squad only had 10 to 11 years old Genins. While the other squad had three Genins who were almost 17 years old. 
The younger squad was from Kanoha, while the older squad was from Kusa. Yori looked at his opponents. They were much older than him, but he wasn't worried. After all, they weren't Achihas. Yakota Minoru, one of the Kusa Genins, said arrogantly, looks like we are in luck. Kanoha sent little babies for the exam. Yakota Yashiaki chuckled and added, why don't you little kids hand us your scroll and run to your mommies? The comments riled Yori up. He angrily said, why you? I'll show you the might of A however he was cut short by his teammate. Hadakin said, calm down, they are just trying to rile you. Tamaya Takahiko started laughing and replied, oh, we aren't. We are just stating the truth. Haru sighed and said, they really are arrogant. Keen chuckled and added, especially considering that they are still only genins despite being so old. Takahiko replied, old A. I'll show you. He quickly began making hand signs. However Teru slammed his hands on the ground and shouted, too late. As soon as Teru slammed his hands on the ground, stone spears began appearing from the ground and completely surrounded the Kusa squad. Seeing their predicament, Kusa Nin stopped their hand signs and quickly jumped high towards the nearby trees. Yori, who was already making hand signs, thought, got them. And launched Phoenix Age Fire Jutsu. Seeing the balls of fire heading towards them, Minoru and Yashiaki quickly made hand signs, water shield jutsu. On completing the hand signs, a shield of water began forming between the Kusa Genins and the fire jutsu. The shield was completely formed in the nick of time, and managed to protect them from the fire. However, Terry used this opportunity to launch the stone spears at the airborne Kusa Genins. The stone spears easily penetrated the water shield, forcing the Kusa Genins to use a kunai to block the spears and direct themselves to land properly on the nearby trees. As soon as they landed on the trees, they began making hand signs. However, before they could complete their jutsu, a tanto appeared behind Yashiaki and stabbed through his heart. Keen, who had appeared behind Yashiaki, whispered, game over. He pulled his tanto out, and a lifeless body fell from the tree. Seeing their teammate die was very shocking for the Kusa Genins. Especially for Minoru who was his cousin. He yelled, I'm going to kill you. Seeing Minoru lose his calm alarmed Takahiko. He quickly shouted, Minoru, wait. However the shout fell on deaf ears. Minoru completed his hand signs, water pellet jutsu. He launched the water pellet straight at Keen. However, Keen simply moved behind the trees, completely avoiding the attack. Seeing his attack missing enraged Minoru even further. He jumped towards Keen. Sensing the opening, Teru quickly made hand signs. Seeing Teru preparing a jutsu, Takahiko completed his hand signs and launched a water pellet straight at Teru. But Yori noticed it and thought, not on my watch. He quickly launched fireball jutsu to intercept the water pellet. At the same time, Teru launched a water pellet straight at Minoru. The jutsu hit Minoru on his left rib cage and knocked him off course. Seeing his teammate at a disadvantage, Takahiko wanted to rush towards him. However, he was intercepted by Yori and Teru. They engaged him in a fight and didn't allow him to move towards Minoru. The water pellet hurt Minoru badly, however he gritted his teeth and fought through the pain. He grabbed a kunai and continued moving towards Keen. On closing the distance, he attacked with his kunai. Keen raised his tanto to block the attack. Though Minoru attacked with a lot of force, as soon as the kunai and tanto clashed, an electric current passed through the kunai and hit him. Though not deadly, it was very painful, and Minoru had to take his hand off the kunai. Keen smirked and thought, current transfer jutsu. Always works. He just stepped forward and slashed his tanto at Minoru's neck. Minoru, who was blinded by rage, in immense pain due to the damaged ribs and still feeling the electric current, couldn't dodge, and the slash went straight across his throat. His throat split open, causing blood to sprout out from it. He looked at Keen with unwillingness in his eyes. Sadly, he couldn't even control his body anymore and fell down, dead. At the same time, Takahiko was engaged against Teru and Yori. After exchanging a few blows, Yori closed the distance and launched fireball jutsu. Knowing that Takahiko will dodge, Teru threw shurikens in such a manner that Takahiko couldn't dodge the fireball. Not having any option, Takahiko used water shield jutsu to defend. On seeing the water shield, Teru thought, all three have water affinity. Well sucks to be them. He quickly made a hand sign and slammed his hands on the ground. At that moment, the fireball had engulfed the water shield. 
However, Takahiko was completely safe due to the shield. Sadly for him, at that very moment, a stone spear appeared from the ground. It easily penetrated the water shield and headed towards Takahiko. The spear alarmed him. He grabbed a kunai and attempted to block the spear. But the spear pushed him backwards, throwing him out of his water shield and into the fireball, burning him alive. On seeing him die, Teru sighed in relief. He said, all done. Yori nodded and said, yeah, that was easier than expected. Teru chuckled and said, yeah. Let's just hope that this guy wasn't carrying the scroll. Yori looked at Teru with confusion. But he quickly realized and cursed, damn. That scroll will be ashes if he has it. At that time Keen appeared from behind. He said, no need to worry. The crazy guy had it. He then tossed the scroll slightly in the air and commented, we were very lucky that such a weak team had the scroll we needed. Teru said, cool, got the earth scroll. Let's head towards the tower. Yori objected and said, that'll be boring. Why not just try to eliminate the weaker teams in the forest? That way the competition will be lesser in the next rounds. Dean shook his head and said, it doesn't matter. This forest will eliminate the weak teams anyway. Terra nodded and agreed, yeah. Not to mention, the more time we spend in the forest, the more teams will set up traps near the tower. And if a team is weak enough to be eliminated by us in this round, then we will be able to do the same in the next round too. Seeing that both his teammates opposed his idea, Yori relented and accompanied his team to the tower. After the mission ended, Rinjiro continued the training of his students. One day, when the training was about to end, Rinjiro observed his three students. He smiled seeing them, with a bit of pride. He thought, these three have turned out to be quite good. I'll be surprised if any of them aren't promoted to Jounin before they turn 16. I suppose they do deserve some praise from their sensei. The training was completed soon, and the Jenins were about to leave when Rinjiro stopped them. He said, three months earlier, I accepted to be the Jounin sensei of your squad. Do you recall what I told you then? Fujin, Hoka, and Miko, all shake their heads. Hoka asked, what did you say sensei? Rinjiro sighed and said, you guys are on a probation period, remember? Understanding that Rinjiro just wanted to make it official, Fujin tilted his head and asked, what probation period sensei? Miko, do you remember any? Miko understood him and tilted her head too, nope, don't remember. Any idea Hoka? Hoka too tilted his head and said, nope. No idea what you're talking about sensei. Rinjiro's face goes completely dark, looking at the perfect poker face maintained by his three students. Seeing his reaction, the three genins couldn't help but laugh out loud. Rinjiro finally gives up on the antics of his students. He compassed himself and said, you guys have pa however, Hoka cuts him off and says, we already know sensei. And the three genins flicker away, leaving their sensei completely dumbfounded. Rinjiro smiled bitterly and muttered to himself, I really need to have a word with the one who suggested I put the top squad of the year on probation. It had been four weeks since they had been officially made genins. Fujin, Hoka, and Miko were resting under a tree after the morning workout. Miko started the conversation by saying, the final round of the Chunin exams will be tomorrow. Miko nodded and said, yeah, two of my classmates will be participating in the fight tomorrow. Miko continued, yeah, I wanna see Yori's fight. I wonder if Sensei would allow us to see the fights. Fujin chuckled and said, good luck asking Sensei for a holiday. On hearing that, Miko looked at Fujin with an annoyed expression. Fujin ignored that and thought, that said, it won't be a bad thing to see how much Teru and Yori have progressed. They have been genin for a year longer than me. After the break, Rinjiro appeared and gathered his squad. On seeing him, Miko quickly wanted to ask him permission to watch the next day's fights. However, Rinjiro stopped her and said, we'll be taking another mission. We will leave tomorrow at 9 am. Miko quickly asked, Sensei, can't we take the mission a couple of days later? Rinjiro squinted his eyes and asked, why? She replied, Sensei, we were wondering if we could watch the Chunin exams that will be held tomorrow. Rinjiro, with the same expression, asked the same thing again, why? Miko put up a diligent expression and answered seriously, we want to observe the tactics, strategies and jutsus that ninjas from our neighboring villages use. That way we will be more prepared when we have to fight them. Fujin chuckled internally at the answer. Rinjiro didn't forbid any ideas they had. Just that, he required a solid reason to agree to them. 
That was why Miko prepared such an answer. Rinjiro dismissively waved his hands and said, it's merely Jenin's fighting. You won't learn much. He then looked at his squad and said, let's get back to training. Miko slumped her shoulders in disappointment. Fujin thought, that's a bit surprising. I thought he would agree with that reasoning. Well whatever, it doesn't matter much. The next day, Team Rinjiro accepted the mission to accompany a merchant carvin to the land of rivers. The mission was very uneventful with only one small bandit group trying to assault the carvin. It took nine days to reach the land of rivers, and the return journey took another day. The squad returned to Kanoha around midnight. After completing the formalities, Rinjiro dismissed the squad. Fujin, on returning home, saw a bunch of newspapers lying outside his door. He picked them up and went inside. He made a couple of shadow clones to go through the papers, while he went for a bath. The clones went through the papers briefly and dispelled themselves. On receiving all the information, Fujin thought, I see, both Teru and Yori became Chunin. A bit surprising, but I guess Kanoha is still trying to increase the number of Chunins and Jounins. Well, I suppose my promotion too should happen in my first attempt then. Not having much to do for the remaining day, Fujin decided to brush up on his Fuinjutsu. He made three clones, and all four together created all the seals that they knew. While revising his Fuinjutsu knowledge, Fujin began reviewing his progress over the last few months, he analyzed, it's been four months since I graduated. The progress has honestly been phenomenal. I really underestimated the effect of having a dedicated elite Jown in guiding you. And again, I never expected that we'd be taught this well. My chakra reserves have almost doubled. The amount of pressure I can handle from my training seal is up to 18%. Despite not training, I can now sense up to a kilometer away. Tojutsu 2 has improved a lot due to constant sparring. And undoubtedly, my ninjutsu and kinjutsu have improved the most. I can now use chakra flow on my sword with ease. I really want to get into an all-out fight to test my power. I wonder if I'll get any such chance soon. The next day, at 4.45 am, Fujin arrived at the training ground. Miko and Hoka were already there. Seeing them, Fujin asked, yo, ready for another three to four weeks of hardcore training. Miko's shoulders dropped and she replied, I'd rather go on missions. Fujin and Hoka chuckled looking at her reactions. Four months of training together, and two long missions outside the village, had improved the relationship between the three a lot. Their teamwork was also very good. Though it still needs to be tested against a proper ninja team. At five, Rinjiro flickered in front of his team. Seeing his team is ready to begin their morning workout, he nodded internally. However, knowing what was to come, he couldn't help smirking a bit. Seeing that smirk instantly made his genins very worried. Fujin thought, okay, what now? Rinjiro started by saying, in the last four months, I have drilled all the basic formations into you. You'll use these formations even when you become genins. The team calmed down after hearing this. Fujin thought, finally. No more boring training sessions on team formations. But why is he smirking? He won't become kind all of a sudden. Rinjiro continued, so, from now on, I'll be entirely focusing on increasing your capabilities so the training will go up a few notches. Hearing that all the three genins were stunned. Miko freaked out, a few notches. Fujin was also sweating a bit, doesn't he already make us exert our 100%? Hoka too wondered how intense a few notches would be. Rinjiro just chuckled at their expressions, and said, first, we are going to increase the pressure applied by the training seals. What are the pressures you are using right now? Miko replied, 3% Hoka, 38% Fujin, 18.5%, Rinjiro nodded and said, good. Miko, you'll increase it to 5%. Hoka to 45%. Fujin to 22%. The Genins followed the instructions of their sensei. After increasing the pressure, Rinjiro began the morning workout. In addition to increasing the pressure from the seals, the training itself was made much tougher. And instead of ending at 9, it continued till 10. At the end of the training, all three genins were lying under a tree, in a lifeless manner. Rinjiro laughed looking at this scene and said loudly, How would you guys achieve your dreams if a simple training session defeats you? You have an hour's break. The afternoon training will continue from 11 to 2. On saying that he flickered away. After half an hour, Fujin and Hoka gained some energy. While Miko was still sleeping. 
Hoka asked, any idea why he suddenly doubled the intensity of the training? Fujin replied, who knows? Maybe he plans to enter us in the next Chunin exam. Or maybe he was just letting us take it easy as we just graduated. He took a deep breath before continuing, anyways, it seems like it'll be very helpful for us. Hoka sighed and said, I always thought I was the one who looked forward to training the most. But it seems like you are even more of a maniac than me. Saying that he laughed lightly. Fujin looked back at him, before chuckling a bit and said, oh well. Let's hope that we get out of this alive. He then grabbed his ration bars and devoured them and began stretching. Hoka followed. At 11, Rinjiro appeared again. He created two shadow clones and said, today we will be discussing how to increase your growth rate. Follow one. Miko and Hoka follow a shadow clone each into the forests, while Fujin stays there. Renjiro looked at Fujin and asked, who do you think has grown the fastest among you three? Fujin thought for a bit and answered, probably me. Renjiro nodded and replied, indeed. You've grown much faster than any of your academy teachers predicted. Even faster than I predicted. However, compared to your two teammates, you have a huge disadvantage. Do you know what it is? Fujin fell into thought on hearing the question. After a minute, he answered, Kekei Genkai. Rinjiro nodded, right, but not completely. Along with their Kekei Genkai, they also have their huge clans, which have already developed complementary jutsus to leverage the advantage their Kekei Genkai gives them. Hearing that, Fujin fell into his thoughts. Rinjiro continued, both Hoka and Miko are very talented. Soon, their families will begin heavily investing in them, boosting their growth at a high speed in a systematic way. What do you have to contend with? Or will you be left behind by them? Fujin replied seriously, that is why I invested time into becoming a sensor and learning swordplay. I don't have any Kekei Genkai. So obviously I won't get any sudden boost to my powers. But as long as I keep training my skills to the limit, I'll surpass the ninjas who depend on their Kekei Genkai. Rinjiro maintained a serious face and asked, what makes you think that the ones with Kekei Genkai won't train to their limits? Do you really think that you can surpass them despite all the advantages they have over you? Fujin smiled and put his hand gently on his sword handle. I've heard that the strongest samurai in the land of iron can go head to head against a cage with nothing but his sword. Even in Konoha, despite having so many people with Kekei Genkai, the second, third, and fourth Hokage are all ninjas who didn't have any Kekei Genkai. Similarly, no member of the Sanans has a Kekei Genkai. So as long as I keep training hard, I don't think I'd lose to anyone with a Kekei Genkai. Rinjiro was surprised to hear this answer. More importantly, he was surprised to hear the confidence in Fujin's voice. He smiled wryly and thought, oh well, this one has no need of any encouragement or confidence boost. Though he might need a reality check. At the same time, Fujin was thinking, was he planning to give me a pep talk or something? Anyways, while well Kekei Genkai is good, it's not something that would churn out rank S ninjas. Other than Eternal Manjikyu Sharingan, Rinnegan and maybe Tensigan, others aren't really overbearing. I guess the Senju treat the wood release with the highest respect, but in all honesty, it was Hashirama who made wood style overpowered and not vice versa. Besides, of my two teammates, one is about to die soon, while the other has a cursed seal put on him. Not really something I'd be jealous about. After a short pause, Rinjiro began talking again, that's a good perspective to have. But don't forget that whether it's the second, third, and fourth Hokage, or the three Sanans, all were extremely talented and hardworking. So while it's a good thing to take inspiration from them, don't forget that you'll have to train extremely hard to even dream about reaching that level. Fujin nodded and replied, yes sensei. Renjiro smiled and added, there's one another thing I want to tell you about Kekei Genkai. But you are not ready for it yet. I'll tell you when you complete your first B-rank mission as a Chunin. Fujin wondered what Rinjiro wanted to tell him. He replied, all right sensei. Rinjiro then asked, what is your analysis of your current capability? And how do you plan on continuing your training? Fujin thought for a bit, before answering, to start with, my ability as a sensor nin is developing decently. But that'll be my secondary ability. In terms of fighting, it seems like my mainstay will be wind release and swordplay. Swordplay is my preferred choice of close combat. Well, wind release gives me mid and long range capabilities. Of course, both still have a lot of work that needs to be done. 
I can use some Earth Release Jutsus for defensive purposes. And I have Body Flicker Jutsu for mobility. My physical strength, speed, and chakra are decent too I guess. At least for a genin that is. Rinjiro was impressed by Fujin's analysis. Fujin continued, as for what I'm missing or need to improve, I need some strong jutsu in my arsenal that can create a deadly impact or devastation on the battlefield. And my tajutsu needs to improve. All I have there is the basic academy style. On completing his answer, he looked up at his sensei. Rinjiro replied, on point analysis. You don't need to worry about a strong jutsu though. When you become a jounin, you'll get to look at rank A jutsus that our village has. For now, stick with rank C jutsus. Preferably for the next couple of years, until your chakra grows considerably. You are right about your tajutsu though. While you did rank high in the academy, that basic style won't aid you much in growing stronger. That's why I'll be teaching you the tajutsu I practice. That is the senju tajutsu style. That surprised Fujin. He quickly thanked his sensei, thank you sensei. But can you just teach it to someone who isn't from the Senju clan? Rinjiro raised his eyebrow and asked, what do you mean someone? You are my student. He then laughed and said, don't worry, our techniques are for the whole village. Anyone who can learn it can use them. Of course, the keyword is can. Fujin asked, what do you mean by can sensei? Rinjiro replied, the people from our clan are blessed with high levels of chakra. Surely you'd have sensed that by now. Fujin nodded. Rinjiro continued, so our techniques usually have high chakra requirements. If anyone else were to try and learn, they'll run out of chakra very quickly. You, on the other hand, have a lot of chakra as compared to your counterparts. In fact, it's more than both Hoka and Miki combined. So you'll be perfect to learn Senju Tajutsu style. Fujin quickly understood and nodded, alright. When can we start Sensei? Also, can you explain what exactly is Senju Tajutsu style? I haven't ever read it. Rinjiro replied, we'll begin right away after I explain the basics. Senju Tajutsu style is actually pretty straightforward. Actually, the Academy Tajutsu style was created by referring to our style. What makes Senju style lethal is the use of chakra. Any Tajutsu style basically consists of users fighting with their arms and legs or some other body parts. Of course, there are a few exceptions, like Hayuga Tajutsu which releases small amounts of chakra from their fingers or palm, and a clan in Kiri that uses bones. In Senju Tajutsu style, your every move will be reinforced by chakra. You want to punch. Your fist needs to gather chakra first and release it on impact. You want to kick. You have to do the same. You want to block. Infuse chakra into the body part you want to block with or is about to hit. This ensures that your defense is like a fortress, while your attack is devastating. Of course, such a style means that not only do you need to have a huge amount of chakra, but you also need to have very good chakra control. Else, even a huge chakra reserve will get depleted very quickly. Renjiro's explanation shocked Fujin a bit. He analyzed, isn't this similar to Tsunade's fighting style? In fact, I did already make some attempts of infusing chakra in my punches to think this is the Senju style. Tsunade's fighting style probably represents the Senju Tajutsu style used by someone who's reached the peak of chakra control. Anyways, this is very good. Finally, a Tajutsu style that can allow me to compete or even overpower others. After analyzing, he said, let's start Sensei. Rinjiro nodded and began the training. He said, first, we will start by getting you to completely infuse your chakra in your whole body. Once you can do that, we will begin concentrating on infusing it with individual body parts only. Display your entire chakra first. Fujin obeyed and released his entire chakra. Rinjiro looked at Fujin. He could see a blue chakra completely cloaking Fujin. His first thought was, marvelous. Fujin too was in thought, actually, I do have some basic understanding of this. Well I never exposed it for obvious reasons. Now will be a good time to use it to just show it as natural talent, he. Following Fujin's expectations, Rinjiro gave his next command, now try to contain the chakra inside your body, such that it flows through your entire body. Think of it as similar to you doing chakra flow on your body, rather than just your sword. Fujin followed his guidance. He slowly began containing that chakra in his body. In around two minutes, the blue aura cloaking him slowly disappeared. 
but if someone were to observe closely, they'd notice blue chakra flares being expelled occasionally from his body. Rinjiro, who was standing right in front of him, was shocked. He thought, so fast. This he swallowed his saliva before exclaiming to himself, this is unbelievable. Though the control isn't perfect by any means, he managed to contain the chakra in just a couple of minutes. It's as if this technique was made for him. Fujin looked up at Rinjiro, before asking, is this proper sensei? Rinjiro nodded and replied, yes, very good. But you are losing a lot of chakra while trying to maintain this form. The next phase of your training will be to perfect this form. You'll activate it and meditate until you can properly contain your chakra with zero loss. Until then, no ninjutsu or kinjutsu practice for you. In fact, even when doing your morning workout, you'll start doing it by maintaining this form. Hearing that he won't get to practice ninjutsu or kinjutsu disappointed Fujin a bit, but seeing the importance Renjiro stressed on this, he could vaguely guess that this will become something that might define him for a long time to come. It might even be what breaks him apart from the normal ninjas and pave his way into becoming an elite. Rinjiro's thoughts too were along the same lines, now that I've seen your potential in this, no way I'd allow you to not raise this aspect to the peak. Apart from a short lunch break, Fujin ended up training alongside Rinjiro till 8 p.m. Finally, at 8, the training ended and Fujin was allowed to leave. Before leaving, however, Rinjiro said something that left Fujin tongue-tied. He said, tomorrow, increase the pressure on your seal to 30% during the morning workout. Fujin looked at his teacher skeptically, but seeing the serious look on his face, he just nodded helplessly. On reaching home, Fujin ate a few ration bars and straightaway dived into his bed thinking, damn, my entire body is sore. It's as if each and every cell in my body is screaming in pain. This is nuts. No wonder Rinjiro asked me to double my ration bar intake. Still though. The progress that I made just today is crazy. If I manage to keep up with this training for months, I have no idea how strong I'd become. Not having the energy to do anything, he fell asleep. The next morning, when he woke up, something left Fujin completely shocked. His body had no pain whatsoever. He speculated, does this training also heal the body in some way? Or is it something else? More importantly, is this safe? I need to consult him ASAP. Rinjiro appeared at the training ground at 5 a.m. as usual, and asked the genins to begin their workout. However, today, Fujin said, Sensei, I have some queries. Understanding what query he'd have, he replied, all right. Hoka, Miko, you two begin your workout. Fujin will join you too soon. Hoka left wondering what query Fujin had, while Miko left begrudgingly as Fujin got to skip out on the workout a bit. Rinjiro then looked at Fujin and asked, is it about the quick healing? Fujin nodded. Rinjiro answered, it's a side effect of this training. Since you infuse chakra in your body, it ends up activating each and every cell of your body. This will increase your passive healing, and also reduce the amount of time you need to recover from fatigue or exhaustion. He then smiled a bit and continued, there's actually a few more advantages of this training. It'll increase your stamina, and more importantly, your chakra reserves. Fujin's eyes widened on hearing that. He quickly asked, isn't it too much of a hax? Renjiro smirked and said, not really. The passive healing, well good, isn't really groundbreaking. As for chakra increase, it is only visible when you start this training, and if your chakra reserve isn't already very high. So while you may see a huge boost to your chakra and stamina in the next few weeks, later on, the effect won't really be that obvious. That killed Fujin's excitement a bit as he sank into his thoughts, oh, then it's not that big of a hax. But still pretty good though. After all, the very requirement to learn this style is having high chakra. And if the effect of learning this style was a boost to your chakra reserve, then it just doubles down on that advantage. He looked back at Renjiro and asked, is there any harmful side effect to using this technique? Renjiro was a bit surprised by that question. After all, any other 10-year-old genin would just be too happy with such a huge buff. He remembered that he himself had been lost in delight when he had learned this technique. He answered, don't worry, this is a very old senju technique. There are no harmful effects. In fact, considering the long lifespans of my clan members, it might even be having a good effect on your health. Hearing the answer, Fujin let out a sigh of relief. Rinjiro looked at him and said, if you have no more questions, begin your workout. Your teammates have left you behind considerably. 
Fujin thanked him and started the workout. While he had increased the pressure from the seal a lot, infusing chakra meant that exercises were actually easier for him. Of course, that wasn't foolproof. After all, the moment his chakra ran out, was the moment help began feeling real to Fujin. Later that day, Fujin talked with Rinjiro about the issue of chakra running out during the morning workout. But Rinjiro just smiled innocently and said, you have enough chakra to be able to go through the whole morning workout without running out. It's just your control that is lacking. So if you don't want to run out of chakra during your workout, train and improve your control. Fujin gave a deadpan look to his teacher's innocent smile. He could bet all his money that he was laughing at his misery. The training continued in a similar manner for Fujin. After three days, he finally managed to last the entire morning workout without running out of chakra. On day seven, he finally managed to contain all chakra in his body properly. He still didn't reach zero wastage, but the amount of chakra leaking out now was very negligible. These seven days, however, had blown Fujin's mind. The result of this training was phenomenal. He muttered to himself in disbelief, just one week of this training has increased my chakra reserves by 50%. In addition to the chakra increase, Rinjiro made Fujin increase the pressure on the training seal from day 3 onwards. Right now it was up to 40%. The next month was spent on properly mastering chakra control for the Senju Tejutsu style. At the end of the training, Fujin could finally freely control his chakra and employ it in a spar against Rinjiro. This training increased his chakra by another 35 to 40 percent. In just over five months since he graduated, Fujin's chakra reserves had a fourfold increase. His thoughts were, incredible. I now have more chakra than even Genki. And he was an elite Chunin for four years at least. Damn, I really want to test out my ninjutsu right now. Unfortunately, he was still denied permission to train ninjutsu. With all three students training intensely, Rinjiro didn't take any missions for a couple of months. Rinjiro spent a few more weeks drilling all the basics of Senju Tejutsu style in Fujin. The process of increasing pressure from the training seal continued during this time. At that moment, it was at 55%. Fujin always had to keep infusing his body with chakra while doing rigorous training or sparring. Otherwise, this pressure would slow him down a lot. And if he was doing some normal activities, like walking or running or resting, then the pressure shouldn't really bother him much. By this logic, Rinjiro had Fujin maintain that pressure all the time. Finally, one fine evening, Rinjiro watched a tired Fujin panting on the ground. They had just finished another one of their spars. He smiled and said, great work kiddo. You have finally got all the basics down properly. Fujin just nodded. Clearly, he was too tired to answer back. Rinjiro smiled and said, let's end here. Take a rest and take tomorrow off. Hearing that, Fujin suddenly looked up. There were almost tears in his eyes. He thought, finally Rinjiro chuckled at his reaction and then flickered away. Fujin rested a bit and then dragged himself across Kanoha to his house while thinking, finally. Two months, and not a single day's break. Oka and Miko got off days saying that they needed to master their clan jutsus. But for me, I didn't get even a single session off. He went to sleep while complaining about the unfairness in his heart. The next day, Fujin, for the first time in years, slept like a log till noon. On waking up, there was no soreness from the earlier day. He thought, got to admit, I really love this aspect of this training. I always wake up in full health and stamina. Anyways, no more ration bars today. After freshening up, he left home. While talking he thought, I really miss the advanced technology. In my previous life, I could never imagine myself being without a smartphone for years. Heck, I would have most likely spent today on the net, while lazing on my sofa and ordering all the food home, haha. <laughs> Soon, he arrived at Ichiraku. He sat there and said, old man, give me one of each bowl you have. Tucci was surprised at the order. After all, it's not daily when someone would overeat ramen. He smiled and said, you've come here after a long time Fujin. Fujin sighed, yeah. Another old man made me train all the time. So I had no free time at all. Tucci smiled and encouraged him, hang in there young man. And he began making the ramen. Ever since he graduated, Fujin's trips to Ichiraku and Yakiniku had increased. His food was usually just ration bars, and when he got an opportunity, he would visit these two restaurants. So his relationship with Tucci was good. 
Soon two bowls were served in front of Fujin. Tucci wore his trademark smile and said, eat up. You'll need all the energy you can get. Fujin wasted no time in digging in. Soon, he ended up eating all seven types of ramen in a chiraku. Once done, he said, they were delicious, old man. Give me two more maizo and tonkatsu ramen. Tucci smiled and yelled, coming right up. After lunch, Fujin went into the forest he used to train earlier in. He smirked while thinking, finally a break. Now let me test my jutsu. On reaching the deepest part of the forest, he stood in front of a tree. Well, here goes nothing. And he uses his great breakthrough jutsu. The jutsu uproots the tree, as well as a few more trees behind and adjacent to that tree. In addition, the winds created by the jutsu created deep slashes in many nearby trees and stripped them of all their leaves and most of their branches. Watching the scene, Fujin grinned, excellent. This is almost 40 to 50 percent stronger than it was two months ago. And now Fujin's grin grew wider. He suddenly exerted his chakra, causing a blue aura to form around him. He began preparing another great breakthrough jutsu. Only this time, instead of releasing it, he began pouring a lot more chakra into this jutsu. In 30 seconds, he managed to pour 10% of his chakra into the jutsu. In another 30 seconds, it reached 15%. Great breakthrough jutsu he exhaled the jutsu. Only this time, instead of normal jutsu, it was supercharged with chakra. The jutsu hit the tree in front of him, completely obliterating it. In a fraction of a second, hundreds of trees in the vicinity were uprooted or cut into pieces. Thousands were stripped of all their branches and left with deep scars. Fujin was shocked on seeing the destruction. However soon, the shock on his face was changed to a grin that seemed to be plastered on his face. Excellent. Marvelous. Now, this is what a jutsu is. But that said, the amount of time needed to supercharge the jutsu is too long. Any capable ninja will kill me a dozen times if I stay in one spot for a minute. I'll have to increase the speed of pouring my chakra into the jutsu. Preferably reduce it to under two seconds. And have to do it while moving around, or even better while flickering around. I guess this is why Rinjiro asked us to focus on rank C jutsus. Now, let me test the other jutsus. Fujin quickly made a hand sign. Soon winds gathered around him. He infused chakra into his jutsu for 30 seconds. The winds then spun around him in a dome shape at a very rapid speed. The wind kept spinning around Fujin for a couple of minutes. Even before the wind dome dispersed, Fujin made a hand sign. The winds turn into two wolves. They are three meters in height and almost seven meters long, looking incredibly ferocious. They ran towards the nearby trees and shredded a few of them with their claws and teeth before disappearing. Next, Fujin once again gathered his chakra and poured it into Wind Dragon Jutsu. He managed to pour a little over 20% of his max chakra into it. It resulted in a 50-meter long dragon forming in the forest. The dragon opened its mouth, forming a huge wind explosion jutsu, and launched it toward the trees. The sphere traveled in a straight line and exploded on hitting a tree, snapping it into two. It then traveled in a zigzag way through the forest, slashing many trees with the winds in its large body. It managed to travel 200 meters through the thick forest cover before dispersing. Soon after, two spheres of wind appeared in Fujin's hands. Their size quickly increased to around 50 centimeters in radius. Fujin launched it at the same time on a boulder. They exploded on the boulders and created a few scars all over them. Fujin analyzed them, hmm, the damage increase is kinda unnecessary. After all, it's just slashes of wind. Any random slash can give a fatal blow to a normal ninja anyways. And if someone does create a strong defense, then it'll end up blocking the enhanced wind explosion jutsu with ease too. Yeah, it's unnecessary. Let's just increase the speed of launching. At the very next moment, Fujin began spamming the wind explosion jutsu. In just a minute, he ended up launching 84 wind explosion jutsus. Fujin grinned, excellent. And it cost me around 7% of my chakra. This will be a very annoying tactic at mid-range, haha <laughs> next, Fujin looked around himself to look for an appropriate stone. He finally found one, a few dozen meters from him, which he guessed would weigh around 15 kilograms. He concentrated on the stone. Immediately, strong winds begin blowing around the stone, trying to get underneath the stone. After a few seconds, the stone started getting lifted into the sky. 
After around half a minute, Fujin was able to raise the stone to a height of 1.2 meters. He then raised his arms towards the stone. Wind retrieval jutsu the stone slowly began moving towards himself. He brought the stone to him and caught it in his hands. The amount of power I can exert with these two jutsus has increased too. I wonder if I'll be able to fly with the help of these two jutsus. Though I guess I'll need much more chakra and much better control. And probably, even then it might not be useful for long distance travel. Tossing the stone away, Fujin put his hand in his bag and tossed 12 shurikens one after another in the air. Projectile control jutsu Fujin used the jutsu to control the shurikens and had them move through the forest while avoiding all the trees. The shuriken moved continuously through the forest and all of them hit the same tree around 500 meters away from Fujin. At the next moment, Fujin appeared next to that tree using wind instantaneous body jutsu. He retrieved the shurikens while concluding, wow, I didn't think the two months of senju to jutsu training would end up boosting my ninjutsu so much. In the great breakthrough jutsu, I could pour up to 15% of my chakra. While it took a minute, the result was very good. The spinning shield of wind could only take up to 2.5% of my chakra. I just couldn't add more to it. It was similar to the wind gale wolf jutsu. I could just pour 2% of my chakra into each of the wolves. The wind dragon jutsu on the other hand could take 20% of my jutsu. And using wind instantaneous body jutsu to my current limit of 500 meters requires 1.5% of my chakra. Wind projectile jutsu requires a negligible amount of my chakra now. While each wind explosion jutsu needs less than 0.1% of my chakra. Wind levitation jutsu doesn't have much battle use for now. Wind retrieval jutsu can be used to create some chaos though. Anyways, just this short show of my jutsus cost me almost 50% of my chakra. I wonder if Rinjiro has more means to increase my chakra levels. Though it shouldn't be an issue for now as I can't really supercharge any jutsu in combat. Fujin began gathering chakra again and slammed his hands on the ground. A rock shield appeared in front of him. Seeing the shield, Fujin sighed, no wonder it is just a ranky jutsu. It has already long reached the limit for me. There's no scope to improve it anymore. The size of the rock shield was no bigger than what Fujin could do two months ago. That said, I need to discuss with Rinjiro and see if he could have any method to release the jutsu by stepping on the ground, rather than slamming hands down. Oh well, I'll ask when he restarts ninjutsu training. After concluding, Fujin made a hand sign and disappeared underground. While underground, he sighed, I've been so busy with everything that I never really practiced this jutsu after graduation. He kept moving underground for a bit before suppressing his chakra signal and making another couple of hand signs. In an instant, he disappeared and reappeared around 150 meters in the direction he was facing. Hum, earth instantaneous body jutsu and wind instantaneous body jutsu are perfect for escaping without leaving any trail. Earth instantaneous body jutsu would actually be perfect for infiltrating enemy territory. I wonder what counter has been developed against this jutsu. He then rose up from the ground, made another hand sign, and placed his hand on the ground. The ground ahead of him transformed into a moat of mud. The size of the moat was 6 meters in radius and 10 meters in depth. He moved to a different spot, made a few hand signs, and slammed his hands again on the ground. This time, the ground rose slowly, as if trying to trap someone. Fujin analyzed, earth holding jutsu is just too slow. Kinda a similar situation with mud moat jutsu. Then again, these two are the only jutsus that I can use to trap enemies. Should be sufficient for now. Having tried and analyzed the current status of most of his jutsus, Fujin decided to return home to rest. While leaving, he muttered to himself while looking at the ground, my jutsus should be good enough for now but I do need the earth well jutsu. That'll improve my ability to defend further. And my current chakra should be plenty for it. Though I guess Rinjiro won't allow it. Anyways, I hope that we get to participate in the next Chunin exam. I really want to test myself in combat. It should be fun. He grinned and looked up. What he saw made him feel a bit awkward. A good chunk of the forest was utterly destroyed by Fujin testing his jutsus. He wondered, if someone were to come here and see this, I wonder what they'll think. Luckily, this area is kinda remote and people shouldn't be coming here. But in any case, I should hide my tracks in case someone did come here. 
Also, it would probably be best if I don't return here in the near future. Fujin jumped onto a branch of one of the trees that still had branches. Gale Jutsu a gentle breeze blew through the forest, covering up every footprint in it, and also dispersing the scent slightly. Once this task was done, Fujin made a hand sign and disappeared from his spot, and appeared on another branch around 500 meters away. He used Wind Instantaneous Body Jutsu a few more times before getting out of the forest. After leaving the forest he flickered away toward his house, while wondering if anyone would ever see the havoc there. A couple of months later, two special Jounins from the Hyuga clan happened to pass through this forest, when they unwittingly entered the area where Fujin had caused the devastation. Seeing the number of uprooted and sliced off trees left them dumbfounded. Coincidentally, a squad of Anbu too happened to cross through the same area at that time. Seeing the two Hyuga present, they instantly began asking them for the reason why they destroyed the forest, and inquired whether there was any battle there. The Hyugas denied the charge, and said that the forest was already wrecked. The Anbus looked around carefully and realized that it had been a long time since the destruction had happened. They investigated around and asked the Hyugas to help them, but found no clue. They wondered if someone was training here, but couldn't understand why anyone would train here, when there are so many training grounds available around Kanoha. The unusual nature of this destruction made them report the situation to the Hokage. Hirazin too was confused similarly. He sent out an Anbu squad specializing in investigation and tracking to check. Unfortunately, Gale Jutsu, two months of time, and a few showers of rain, had removed anything that could have been used to find a clue. The Anbus would return empty-handed, and Hirazin dropped the case as there were no clues, and it wasn't worth allocating more resources to. Of course, Fujin would forever remain ignorant about such an incident happening. After testing his jutsus, Fujin returned home and took another short nap. Later he revised his Fuin jutsu skills before having dinner at Yakiniku. The next day once again started with an intense morning workout. In the afternoon, the team again broke up to train with Rinjiro and his clones. Rinjiro looked at Fujin and said, I have taught everything I know about senju to jutsu style. How much you manage to master depends on you now. Fujin bowed a bit and said, Thank you sensei. Seeing his humility, Rinjiro's face softened. He said, you had once said that the Sanans too don't have any Kekei Genkai. One of the Sanan, Lady Tsunade, uses an advanced form of Senju to Jutsu. She modified the style to complement her perfect chakra control, making it much more deadly. Your own talent with this style too is very high. So work hard on it. Fujin nodded and said, yes sensei. I'll keep improving it. Rinjiro continued, regardless, it's time to focus back on ninjutsu and kinjutsu. We will practice all your jutsus once. And then we will begin working on supercharging your jutsus. Fujin instantly got excited upon hearing that. Rinjiro noticed and squinted his eyes. He asked, you have already tried it, haven't you? Fujin laughed nervously before confirming it. Rinjiro sighed and said, I hope you didn't end up destroying anything. To which Fujin obediently shook his head, saying, don't worry sensei. I shot everything straight up in the air. Rinjiro asked, all right. So what were your observations? Fujin replied, it takes a lot of time to supercharge Jutsus. So it just won't be usable in battles unless I can bring the time down a lot. Rinjiro nodded. Fujin continued, apart from that, I couldn't supercharge all my Jutsus. Especially Rock Shield Jutsu, which didn't improve at all. Great Breakthrough and Wind Dragon Jutsu had the best effect on supercharging. Rinjiro said, yes, that's how supercharging works. While you can try to pour a lot of chakra into any jutsu, not all jutsus can be supercharged. The amount of chakra you can pour in also depends on your chakra reserves, chakra control, mastery of the element, mastery of that jutsu, and the jutsu itself. Though Kanoha lacks wind jutsus, you are lucky to have wind affinity. As almost all of the rank C wind jutsus can be supercharged. As for the rock shield jutsu, its capacity is very low. So don't concern yourself with it. In the next few months, I'll be teaching all three of you how to supercharge your jutsus quickly in battle situations. Since your chakra reserve is the highest, you'll need to work the hardest here. Before we begin, do you have any queries? Fujin nodded and replied, yes sensei. I have a few. The first one is related to Rock Shield Jutsu. I can now perform the Jutsu without any hand signs, but I still need to slam my hands on the ground. 
Do you know any way to perform the jutsu by slamming the feet down instead? Rinjiro raised his left eyebrow and asked, why do you want to do that? Fujin answered, it'll improve the efficiency of the jutsu a lot. I carry swords in my hands, so to slam my hands on the ground, I'll have to discard my swords temporarily, which doesn't seem to be a good idea. If I can perform the jutsu with just my feet, I can just use it while I'm fighting with my sword. And if the enemy makes a huge attack on me, then I can just retreat back while slamming my feet on the ground and creating multiple rock shields. Rinjiro was surprised by Fujin's tactical thinking. He replied, good thinking. I never thought about rock shield jutsu along those lines. I guess your intention is to eventually use this for all earth style jutsu, right? Fujin nodded, indeed, that will be very convenient. Rinjiro continued, unfortunately, it won't be possible. Or at the very least, it won't be easy. The hand signs for that jutsu result in earth nature chakra gathering in your palms. Though you perform the jutsu without any hand signs, you do it by merely replicating the way chakra is molded when you perform the hand signs. Doing what you said will be no different from creating a whole different jutsu. Fujin quickly replied, in that case sensei, can't we create new earth style jutsus that work in this manner? Rinjiro shook his head and answered, it's too difficult. While small jutsus are always created, what you are saying will completely revolutionize the jutsus of earth element. At the very least, I can't do it. Also, while your idea is very innovative, it's highly unlikely that you were the only one who came up with it. And considering that no such jutsu exists to my knowledge, it's safe to say that no one ever managed to create it. Dujin was dejected a bit upon hearing this, oh well, there goes one of my ideas to annoy the enemy infinitely. Seeing the dejected look, Rinjiro chuckled. Fujin looked back at Rinjiro and said, So since I can't improve my rock shield jutsu anymore, can I get earth well jutsu? Rinjiro shook his head again and answered, No, that's a rank B jutsu. Though your chakra reserve is good, you shouldn't be dependent on rank B or higher jutsus till you are promoted to Chunin. The answer was as Fujin expected. So he just asked his last query, Sensei, while practicing with supercharged jutsus, I ran out of chakra very quickly. Do you know any more means of increasing my chakra quickly? After all, the training of infusing chakra into the body is barely giving any gains in that regard. Rinjiro had a slight disbelief on his face that Fujin actually asked this question. He replied, Brad, do you think they sell chakra in grocery stores? Your chakra is already four times larger as compared to your teammates. Be happy with that and don't get greedy. Also, don't bother searching for more means of increasing your chakra reserves. Other than hard work and natural growth, almost every method has some form of drawback that'll highly restrict you. As for the battle, you can always eat soldier pills to improve your stamina. So don't bother with it. Fujin was a bit shocked at how dismissive Rinjiro was. He thought, really, no other means. So I, I guess I was expecting way too much. After all, the current boost is already very high. Oh well, I'll leave this issue to the future. If I really desperately need chakra, I can try to steal a tailed beast. Thinking about tailed beasts, Fujin sighed internally, how good it'd have been if I could just draw some pokeballs and capture them? Rinjiro asked, any more queries? Fujin shook his head and replied, let's begin sensei. Rinjiro trained the trio for another month. This month, Fujin practiced supercharging his jutsus a lot. He could now infuse 20% of his chakra into the great breakthrough jutsu in under 15 seconds. More importantly, he could infuse 5% of chakra into the jutsu in just over 2 seconds. This was usable in battle as long as he maintained some distance. He also mastered Wind Gale Wolf and Wind Dragon Jutsus, and could now perform them without any hand signs. The ease with which he became capable of using these Jutsus without any hand seals shocked Rinjiro. Fujin's Kenjutsu also improved a lot. All the basics regarding Samurai Saber techniques were taught to him. He could freely control chakra flow through his Samurai Swords. He even managed to properly infuse his wind chakra through the normal chakra flow. Rinjiro couldn't help him much in this regard, as he himself never added a nature chakra to chakra flow. He specialized in earth and water elements, and neither were suitable to be added to chakra flow. Nonetheless, it was learned with rather ease by Fujin. In fact, while learning it, he also learned a technique that he had dreamed about performing for over a decade. The team was given a day's break once again, which all three used to rest well. 
The next day, in the morning, the team met up once again. Hoka saw Fujin coming to the ground and asked, Hey, how's the training progressing? Fujin replied, It's progressing rather smoothly, what about you guys? Hoka smirked and replied, It's going very well. I want to spar with you once again. Fujin smirked back and replied, Well let's hope that you can touch me this time. That annoyed Hoka, who begrudgingly replied, Due to you, Sensei drilled me with ninjutsu training for three months straight. Hearing that, Fujin laughed. Miko, annoyed at being left out of the conversation, butted in by snorting, HMPH, I'll beat both of you at the same time in a spar. Hoka and Fujin turned to her. Fujin replied, well, let's hope that you have some energy to spar after the morning workout then. Hearing that, her shoulders immediately dropped, while Fujin and Hoka laughed at her expense. The poor girl complained about the unfairness to herself, it's not as if I'm slacking on those workout sessions. It's just that every time I am about to reach Sensei's target, Sensei just makes it even more difficult. While Miko was depressed, Rinjiro appeared. He announced, we have trained continuously for the past three months. Next, we will be taking continuous rank C missions. That instantly perked up Miko. After all, missions would mean no more rigorous training. Hoka and Fujin also sighed in relief, as their bodies needed a break badly. Unlike Miko who drop out early rather regularly, Hoka and Fujin gritted through the entire workout daily. Rinjiro continued, today we won't do any workout or training. Instead, you guys will spar. This immediately gained the attention of the three genins. Rinjiro continued, you three will fight out against each other in a three-way battle. You are not allowed to team up with each other unless the circumstances force you to. But I can disqualify you if you purposefully cooperate to defeat the third. The battlefield will be this entire training field. You guys have time from now till 6 p.m. to decide on a winner. You can defeat others by knocking them unconscious or making them give up. Obviously, I can interfere and declare someone to have been lost. And of course, you guys aren't allowed to seriously injure anyone. No soldier pills. And Fujin, no swords. Miko suddenly asked, why no swords for Fujin? Isn't that his goto weapon? Oka also nodded, as he had the same query. Neither of them wanted to win against someone who was handicapped. Rinjiro shook his head and said, Fujin's way of using his swords is solely to kill. If he were to win by using his swords, you guys would be injured badly. Regardless, he is forbidden to use his swords in any spar with his colleagues. They understood the reasoning but were still a bit unconvinced. Fujin butted in, aren't you two looking down on me too much? Sword or no sword, neither of you will even be able to touch me. And he smirked on saying that. Hoka and Miko looked at him irritatingly. Among the three of them, Fujin had the highest speed and excelled in fighting at long range. In the few spars that they had, they never managed to actually reach him. Rinjiro interrupted before they entered into an argument, no more questions. My rules are final. Anyways, you guys didn't hear the exciting part. The winner will get a reward. That once again attracted the attention of all three. Miko asked, what reward? Rinjiro replied, the winner will be awarded a rank A jutsu by me. That shocked the trio. They all had the same thought, will he really allow us to learn a jutsu higher than rank C? Rinjiro understood what his students were thinking. He smiled innocently and said, of course, I'll only give it to you when you are promoted to Chunin. Hearing that, all three genins gave him a deadpan look. Not wanting to hear any complaints from them, he shouted, begin even before he completed the word, all three genins flickered away in different directions without making any hand seals. Now, at more than 100 meters away from each other, they observed the other two, while wondering how they should approach this. The best way would have been to team up with one of the other two, eliminate the third, and then decide the winner. Unfortunately, that option was not available. Suddenly, Hoka and Miko noticed Fujin smirking. At the very next moment, he disappeared. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.